and is currently the head of the nano biosensors and bioanalytical applications group at the ICN2 here uh, next to us, as well as the, as the cyber DBN. The principal focus of her research is the development of novel biosensors devices based on nanoplasmonics and silicon-based photonics principles for point-of-care diagnostics. And she, she has published over 260 articles and remarkably, she's also very active in technology transfer. She has eight families of patents. She has co-founded two spin-off companies, if I'm not wrong, Sensia and Bioptical Detection. So this is already uh, very impressive here in Spain. Uh, her work has been recognized with several awards. So the list of awards is quite long. Let me highlight the last two in 2020. She got, uh, she got the Spanish National Research Prize in Tech Transfer, as well as the King Jaume Prime Prize in New Technologies. And to finish, so in 2020, Professor Laura Lechuga, uh, during the COVID-19, she has been included in the expert scientific panel advising the Ministry of Science and Innovation. And with that, so I give the word to, to Laura and the title of uh, her presentation will be Biosensor Devices for Point of Care Health Diagnosis. So please, Laura. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nuria, for the introduction and also Laura for the invitation to be here in this in this school. As so I am going to, to share my presentation. Um, since we are okay. Okay, let me know. Yeah, you can see the the presentation. It's fine. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we can start. Uh, so, as Nuria said, the presentation of my of today is going to be about biosensor devices for point of care health diagnostics. So, what I want to show you to explain in more detail is uh, what is a biosensor device and what I mean with this of point of care health diagnostic and also how we can apply. I mean, it's not only to design, to fabricate, and then to test the biosensor at the laboratory level, but also how we can apply all these technologies also for real diagnostics, how it's possible to make a device or a platform and then you can go to a hospital, for example, and to do all the testing on site using this uh, technology. Uh, so before starting, I want to make also a um, just uh, to explain the motivation. I mean, why we want to develop biosensor devices. It's not only that this is a research line and it's not only for publishing or for making patents, but also uh, we have a, a motivation behind that. And the main motivation is because how the diagnostic, I mean, the clinical diagnostic is done today. So normally if you don't feel well, if you go to see your family doctor, normally he's asking you some questions and finally, depending on the, your health status, so you really need to go for some specialized tests and techniques. For example, imagine that you need to take, they have to take milliliters of your blood of your urine to make this uh, clinical um, analytical clinics. But also for, for example, you can go, the, you can need a colonoscopy, you can need even a resonance imaging, whatever. Okay, what happened is that um, we are lucky that here in Europe, we have all these laboratory techniques and they are very sophisticated, but they are also of high quality. But at the same time, the problem is that they are time consuming, that normally you need these milliliters or even you need to go, for example, for a biopsy to get the tissue of the patients. Mm -hmm. And you need training personnel. And also you need, of course, to have all the installations and some of these instrumentation are very bulky or very expensive. So what we think is that in the future, the main goal that we have to achieve in diagnostics is how it's possible to make this diagnostic much more simple in such a way that you can take a drop of, um, for example, a drop of blood, a drop of urine, a tear, even a drop of saliva, and you can deploy in a very small machine, what we call a point of care biosensor, where the medical doctor or even yourself at home, you can have an instant diagnostic of the health status of the person. Uh, for example, there is, uh, perhaps you have seen some people wearing and this new glucose biosensor had been released by the company, by Abbott company a few years ago. And this is an implantable biosensor. So perhaps you have seen the people in the, on the, 
on the beach or in the swimming pool were in this uh, uh, white cycle. And then uh, this is a continuous um, monitoring of the glucose and then just the, the diabetic person just pass the reader and they can have an instant um, diagnosis of the, which one is the concentration of the glucose. Of course, you can connect all these small machines to a central station, to even with your medical doctor, even with a dedicated application. So you can get an instant diagnostic and also even an answer which is the right treatment. So we think that in the future, and we are very close to achieve that, we need all these point of care biosensors that allow you to have a very easy diagnosis with a very high sensitivity, very fast. This is important also to have multiplexing capabilities, meaning that even using only one drug, you can analyze many different, analyze so many different biomarkers. And also this can be user friendly. So you don't need a specialized technician, you can do yourself or even, even your family doctor with a special training can do that. So this is why we are so interested in developing biosensor because biosensor is the only technology that is able to provide how to create these miniaturized these point of care devices because then you can contain inside the device all the functionalities of an, a complete analytical laboratory. Uh, so to make clear what is a biosensor, because I know most of the people think, okay, a biosensor is a sensor that is detecting biological molecules, and this is not the correct definition of a biosensor. In a biosensor, we have a transducer, a sensor, just in contact with a biological receptor layer. Uh, so this biological receptor layer is completely selective to the molecule, to the substance that you want to analyze in a complex sample. So it means that uh, this biological receptor layer have to be to choose to be, select, to be selective to the substance and to the analyze that you want to detect. The biological receptor has to be integrated with the transducer. So the name of biosensor is coming because you have a bioreceptor layer in contact with a sensor. Biosensor means a complete device together. Um, when this biomolecular recognition takes place here on the sensor surface, there is a physical chemical chain that can be detected by the sensors in real time, can be processed by additional data processing, and then you can display a signal or a response in a computer, in a tablet, or even in a uh, mobile phone. As transducer, we can use many different principles and as biological receptor. We can use, um, for example, proteins like antibody, enzyme, we can use aptamer, we can use oligonucleotide. But for definition, biosensor can detect any system with a very high sensitivity and also in a very specific, a selective way because you, have, you are using this complete selective biological receptor. What is more important for a biosensor is they are detecting in real time. Many of the techniques that we are using in the laboratories today, uh, they are not in real time. So you need just a secondary amplification. You can use fluorescent, whatever, but they are not real time. And also because we have this intimate contact between the biological receptor and the sensor, they are very fast. Uh, so in principle, you can detect with biosensor any type of substances. You can detect protein, you can detect pathogens, virus, bacteria, toxic uh, pollutants, whatever, providing that you have the selective biological receptor available. That is not always the case. So probably the most famous biosensor is the glucose biosensor. Millions of diabetic people are using this device every day in the world, around the world. If you know this glucose biosensor is using just electrochemical transducer in contact with an enzyme, glucose oxidase, that is specific to glucose, are in catalyzing the redox decomposition of, of the glucose. So remember, this is a very tiny device, it's very well known. But remember that the, the key in this device is that you're using a specific bioreceptor, a specific enzyme, and then even if you're using only a drop of sample, then you can detect only glucose because in, in, in the blood we have many other analyzed, many other substances, but the device is prepared only to see in a very smart way the presence of glucose. As I mentioned that there is now a new one that is an implantable one, we can also consider more or less like a biosensor, a pregnancy test, even the antigen test or the serological test that we're using for the COVID-19 and many other that, um, that are being used uh, for many other different applications. Okay, 
But uh, I would like to also that you uh, think a little more about what is a biosensor. I say, okay, biosensor is a sensor with a biological receptor. But of course, you have to think that beside the, bi the biosensor, you have to integrate in a complete um, platform, in a complete instrument that have to be portable. And this is what we call point of care biosensor because you have to think how to deploy your sample. Normally this is a liquid sample. So mean that you need some specialized microfluidics. Sometimes even you need not only to introduce the liquid sample to do some kind of cleaning or pre-processing. And also, for example, if you are using optical biosensors, you are going to need some light sources. You are going to need some photodetector. You are going to need some electronics and also some battery. I mean, this is a very uh, complex development because you need to know not only about the techno, I mean the physics and the biology to make the biosensor, but also a complete engineering development. And that's the reason why this is a very multidisciplinary area where you need the confluence of many different expertise in order to be able to, uh, to make at the end or to offer at the end a complete device. Okay, uh, of course, I mean, there are many different point of care biosensor. I mean, if you just go to Google and you just allocate the name point of care biosensor, probably you are going to have thousands of different entries that are different pages that you, you can see. So many different approaches. Uh, probably the most popular one just in the last is just how to connect your uh, point of care biosensor with your mobile phone and then having this specific application in your mobile phone. And I would like also, I like also to remember that um, that this is something that we saw already on the science fiction movie. I like to remember the one from the 97. This is a famous scientific uh, science uh, fiction movie called Gataka. If you remember in this movie Gataka, the name of the, and the title of the movie is coming for the initials of the base of the DNA. Guanin, Ademin, Timin, if you remember in this movie, the people was, uh, I mean, the society was so, so, um, so, um, elevated that they were able to differentiate between, I mean, to select the genes for the people before uh, before um, Bern. And then to, they was possible to have people genetically perfect and then the one that have already the, the same genome with all the mutation that we have. So they only went to see in the movie who was genetically perfect and to differentiate from the ones that are the regular ones. So it was, if you remember in the movie, they were in a queue and they, they were asking to deploy some drops of urine in a very small point of care biosensor. And then they have an instant uh, identification of the genetic profile of the person. Even in the movie, if you remember, also the police can stop you on the street, take a, a hair, put on the point of care biosensor and to identify immediately the person. So uh, even something that is still, well, it's, um, it was science fiction in the 97, uh, is uh, very close now of a reality with the technology that uh, is, uh, has been developed as a point of care biosensor. Okay, so we normally uh, think about biosensor uh, using in the, in the health area. But of course, uh, we can use also uh, this technology, for example, for the food control, I mean, to control the, any contamination, any kind of pathogens. We can control also, for example, in the farming area. We can, especially, we can use also in the environmental control to know the quality of the water that we are drinking or any, any other, uh, for example, the quality also of the beach, of the ocean. So mean that the biosensor have a huge um, um, area of application. And the global market on biosensor is growing every year. And for example, Frost and Sullivan make a prediction that this, um, this market is going to, to, to give a revenue by 2023 of more than 31 million of dollars. But it was uh, this prediction was done before the pandemic. So my prediction is that the, after the pandemic, after the, in the post COVID era, the diagnostic will be in a large extension decentralized because we have learned the lesson that now the pandemic has been controlled by PCR, a centralized technique, and, and has been clear that the, the only way to control a pandemic is with a decentralized, with a very easy point of care. Uh, diagnostics. So my prediction is that even this area is going to grow much more than uh, predicted uh, before the pandemic. Okay, 
Uh, so how can we do a biosensor device? As you remember for the definition, we have many different technologies that we can use a transducer. So we can use electrochemical sensing, we can use uh, optical sensing, we can use magnetic sensing. So there are many, many different uh, technologies. I don't have time to explain all of them, but probably the most well-developed uh, biosensor are the electrochemical ones. The main reason is because the glucose biosensor is based on electrochemical sensing. And as I said at the beginning, uh, well, this is a, a biosensor that is used by millions and millions of people few times per day around the world. Uh, so there are also the good news is you want to, to, to work in electrochemical or to do some electrochemical biosensor. All the electrodes can be, can, be, can be bought very easily for many different companies, so you don't have to fabricate yourself. Um, there is also now new tendency, for example, including graphene, carbon nanotubes, and so on, in order to boost the sensitivity of this uh, technology. There is also many other biosensors based on nanoparticles, based on nanomaterial, probably you also, I think, in the, the presentation of yesterday, probably you saw uh, some of these biosensors. There is biosensor using MEMS and NEMS technology, using magnetic. There is also a very new and very competitive technology coming out in the area of biosensors that are using paper using your cellulose, and they are a very simple um, uh, technology where you can embed it on your nanoparticle with the right functional biofunctionalization inside the cellulose, and then just by a color change, you can see, I mean, if a person is infected or not. So this is uh, a, a technology that is especially designed to be used, for example, in Africa, in a very low um, income resources um, countries. But in our case, um, we decided to use uh, uh, light, using light in a special way, using optical wet guide uh, for the following reason. I mean, when we're using light, probably we're using, uh, we can um, achieve the highest sensitivity that you can achieve in any technology. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, you can also see that the, your sensor is completely immune to any electromagnetic interference. This is something that is happening with electrochemical biosensor, but also with this optical or this photonic technology, you can use a high bandwidth miniaturization, and of course, uh, this capacity to make a full instrument where you can integrate all the different functionalities in one single device. Uh, so, oh, Something's happening. I don't know what happened. Where is my? Oh, I think they closed my my PowerPoint. Can you see now the screen? It's okay. No, I think you stopped sharing the screen. Oh. Okay. Um, Let's see now. Uh, I don't know what happened. Can you see me? Okay. Yes, I can see you, but okay. I'm not sharing your screen. Okay, now. Let's see. Now, now yes, now yes. Perfect. I'm not having problems today with my computer. <laughs> I was telling you this morning. Okay, so as I said before, um, I said we're trying to use this photonic. I mean, and we we propose to use this photonic biosensor using optical wet guide, and then the the idea with this technology is the following. So we are using the, in the special uh, way that the light is transmitted in um, dielectric material. So imagine that you have an optical fiber. You know that, that in an optical fiber, all the light is confined in the interior of the optical fiber because the material of the optical fiber have, uh, in the core of the, of the optical fiber has a refractive index superior to the, to the surroundings. So, but if we look how the light is traveling in this optical fiber or even in a wet guy, we can see that not all the light is strictly confined in the interior of the optical wet guide. There is always a part of the light of the electromagnetic field that is going out. And we call this evanescent wave principle. This is happening always in any medium where you have 
um, the traveling of the light, like in an optical fiber, like in an optical network. So this is an ethane wave we can use for biosensing in the following way. So we can incorporate here inside this ethane field our biological receptor, and then when there is a biomolecular interaction, we recognize that the molecule that we want to detect, there is a local chain on the refractive index. And this local chain on the refractive index means that when the light is traveling there and they see that there is a different amount of mass, a different kind of molecules, a different refractive index, there is any chain in the optical parameters. So the light that is traveling there change the velocity, and then we can look here at the end, how is any chain of the optical parameter, for example, in the intensity, the phase, the polarization. And, and this chain of the light is completely correlative to the number of molecules that have been detected on the sensor surface. So this Ivanethen wave principle, Ivanethen wave um, uh, electromagnetic field is extending between 100 to 900 nanometer, depending on the wavelength depending on the material that you are using. But it's a very elegant way to see that in real time, label free with no amplification, what the molecules are, have, are doing or are interacting on the sensor surface. So with this idea and the state of the art that you can find at international level, what people have been developing in this area are mainly two types of biosensor. The, the one of the main branches is the nanoplasmonic biosensor using gold. So I think you probably yesterday that you have for some explanation what is the plasmonic uh, uh, biosensor. And then the second type of, uh, bio, of uh, technology are the one based on silicon photonics, the one that we can fabricate wave guide with different different shapes, with different uh, range uh, in such a way that you can use microelectronics technology for the fabrication. Uh, so for example, in this technology, the most regular one are using this kind of micro ring resonator when the light can be traveling, photonic crystal, we can use interferometers. Uh, so there are many different ones, but all this is called silicon photonics, uh, based on silicon technology, based on microelectronics, and then the good thing is that we can have a bar with this technology, a really ultra sensitive um, uh, response, and they have a high level of multiplexing. You can see, for example, one of these sensors that we're using in the lab. You can see this very small square. And then inside this square, we have six biosensors in parallel here, six uh, Macfender interferometer. So, really, with this technology, you can go for a uh, real uh, miniaturization and also how to make these portable devices. Okay, uh, in my in my group, um, oh my God, this is not working. Okay. In my group, we are working with two main technologies. We are working with nanoplasmonic uh, um, biosensor, and we are working at the same time with nanophotonics interferometric biosensor. I will just try to give just a brief summary about what we are doing in the in the plasmonic and in the interferometric biosensor. Just to mention that in our case, we make not only the design, we make the fabrication, we make the characterization, um, and we make we also develop all the applications and we do all the engineering how to develop this portable platform. Okay, in the case of the nanoplasmonic biosensor, I guess you know for yesterday what is a plasmonic uh, behavior, and you know that it's just the the free the oscillation of the free electrons in the metal. So when you have just a, a monochromatic light in a, in a polarization, you are able to excite this plasmonic behavior of the free electrons in the gold, and then we generate this plasmonic wave where we have this evanescing wave component. So we can use, I mean, you can make uh, this very easy um, uh, surface plasma resonant biosensor just by immobilizing your bioreceptor inside this evanescent wave and then just looking at the resonant chain when you have a biointeraction with this bioreceptor. This is probably one of the most well-known uh, optical biosensor in the world. There are more than 25 companies selling this biosensor around the world. And this is a very versatile one, a very simple one, because you only need a chip of 45 nanometer in order to be able to excitate its plasmonic behavior. 
you are using just a laser in the visible range, just a standard photodetector, you can fabricate just the microfluidics. So this is something that you can do very easily, you can try to do in, in your lab. Uh, so with the plasmatic sensor, probably this is one of the most versatile um, biosensors, the most robust and very simple. So I really recommend it that if you want to go in this area, you want to work on optical biosensors, to just start using uh, but uh, learning how to use a surface plasma plasma. In my group, as I say, we've made a complete in-house design, so we don't buy any commercial um, uh, platform. So we just build, this is the, the our last model where we have two channels uh, um, device. We have even a tablet contour, electronics, we produce all the sensor chip, and then we have a really a fantastic biosensor. Of course, this is also possible how to use not only because in the in the standard surface, surface plasma resonance we are using a thin layer of only 45 nanometer of gold but uh, of course it's also possible to to miniaturize and to do to use nanoparticles or nanostructure and then to excitate around each nano nanostructure also uh, this plasmonic behavior just by shining light and then to, you can excitate also this uh, plasmonic behavior of having this emanation wave component and then we can track just the peak of the resonance, how is the displacement of this peak of the resonance when you have a volume molecular interaction inside uh, the, the plasmonic wave. Uh, of course, I mean, the, the plasmonic behavior, you can modulate just by the size, the shape, the very medium. So in our case, we are not using nanoparticles. What we are doing is a nano structure of the gold. So normally we use nano holes, we are using nano, nano disc, we are using nano dimmers, um, and we fabricate this also in our laboratories. As you see, for example, the reason why we use nanostructuring and not nanoparticle is because this is much more reproducible. So I always recommend that you want to go to work for this localized surface so plasma resonance biosensor. Um, it's much better to go for this nanostructuring of the goal and not using uh, nanoparticle because it's uh, more reproducible, more controllable, and also because you can fabricate by colloidal lithography. It's a very easy technique that you can employ almost in any, in any lab. So as I say, we have developed this one nano disc. A few years ago also, we realized that if you buy this blue disc, uh, that almost nobody's using anymore, but if you buy this blue disc and we just clean the blue disc, we discovered that they have a nano corrugation on the already imprinted. So what we have to do is just deposit a gold layer and then you have a very nice and a very high performance nano grating localized SPR biosensor. Um, and of course, beside the, the sensor inside, then we make the device construction. So we have to think how to make the microfluidics for one channel, for several channels. And of course, you have to do the instrumentation, how to do the light, the ready, the, and the readout, and also analysis, I mean, the, the electronics, and also the data processing and the software and so on. If you are interested in more detail, uh, you can read in any of our publications or, or any of our thesis from my group, and then we, you can find all the, the details there. Okay, this is in the second technology that um, that we developed is the nanophotonic interferometric biosensor. We developed at the, as I said, this is silicon photonics technology. We fabricate in the clean room. We fabricate in the clean room located here, at, very close to us, here at the CNM IMB um, from the SIC. And so we, we have a very well established technology and we fabricate nanometric uh, waveguide in silicon technology. So the waveguide that we're using have only a height of only three, nan three nanometer. Uh, where, why we're using this special wet guide is because we have a very good control of the light that is transmitted in the interior of this uh, wet guide. And also we have also a very strong magnesium field to interact with the biomolecules. So at this moment, this is our uh, device that we call B-model wet guide interferometer. We have patent at the worldwide level. So this is a, a unique device that was invented in my lab several so years ago. And we have the exclusivity in this device. So here uh, we make an interferometric detection and just by using two modes of the light that is traveling in the device. And the two modes of the light, the fundamental mode and the first mode, they are making an interference. And because they have this very strong emanation field, they are interacting with the biomolecules. And as a result, the interferometric detection is a result of the molecule that has been recognized by the biological receptor. As I say, our main characteristics 
that we're working with nanomet nanometric uh, weight guide for the thickness, but also for the height that is below always three nanometers. So this is a very well established uh, fabrication uh, at the clean room facilities. We divide it in this, we call this a chip, and in the chip we have 20 of these sensors in parallel. Uh, so for each wafer, we are able to fabricate more than 240 sensors. You can see in more detail here, how is the sensing area where we are located biological receptor, and you see how each sensor is separating each other by 250 micron. Okay, so we have done some uh, and some testing of these devices, as we know, they are really, really very sensitive. I mean, they can detect a minimum change in the repetitive index of only 10 minus 7. So in theory, means that uh, this will be a device so sensitive that we will be able to detect at the picomolar, femtomolar range. Uh, so means also that we can detect at the level of one single bacteria using this device. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to extend too much, but uh, just to say that, of course, as I said at the beginning, you have the sensor, but now you have to do also, you need to integrate that microfluidics, especially when you are working at the nanometer level. It's very, I mean, you cannot deploy the sample just by hand, so you really need to make microfluidics. Normally we do by PDMS technology, just polymer technology. We have to figure out also how to make, when you have a multiplex uh, biosensor, how to, you can divide it for the different sensors that they are very close to each other. Sometimes we have also mm, tried to develop that not only this is a standard flow cell where you flow the liquids, but also even the flow cell is integrated, some pumps, valves, and so on. So just a mass complex uh, microfluidics. So means that uh, if you want to make a portable platform, we have to think in a holistic way. It's not only to make the sensor, it's not only to make the microfluidics, not so, it's not only to make the surface bio functionalization is also that we have to develop a complete a complete instrument we have to think the how to incorporate the light how to read up the light how to make the electronics and who made a complete uh, platform so this is also something that you have to take in mind that uh, when you develop a biosensor it's not only the physics i mean it's only the sensor itself the biosensor itself is the all the whole uh, process of engineering Okay, uh, just moving on, uh, I want also to, uh, to mention that probably if you think that to make the sensor, to make the instrument, to make the electronics engineering is complicated, in my opinion, the key point and the most important step and the most difficult one is the, what we call the surface biofunctionalization. So how you incorporate your biological receptor. This is the key of, uh, any, of any biosensor device and it's really, probably, as I said, a complex uh, step. Why? Because first, uh, the biological receptors are biomolecules. Some of them are macromolecules, as for example, an antibody or proteins. And also they have to maintain the conformation, the orientation. Sometimes, I mean, they have also some active site where they are able to detect the complement, I mean, the, the molecule that you want to detect. So you have to do an orientation when you mobilize. So mean that you, have, you need to have to to take into account too many factors. So you have to, uh, to I mean, to make a chemical activation of the surface, you have to make a stable linkage of the molecule with the surface. You have also to, to control the orientation. You have to also to be able that your, your bioreceptor is really accessible to the sample. So mean that the density, you have to control the density. Sometimes we have to allocate vertical spacer, lateral spacer, uh, so this is really a complex procedure. And even more to make even more complex the story, when you have allocated your biological receptor, you have to give also what we call anti-folding properties because you are going to use real sample. Sometimes we are using real sample, urine, uh, plasma, serum, whatever, and we don't clean and we just uh, throw the, the, this real sample so you can contaminate your biological receptor or the surface and that's the reason we are you have to make these anti-folding properties to prevent no specific absorptions. So this is something that, uh, okay, that would take hours to explain everything, but just to give you a glimpse how we can do it. So you have first to activate chemically your surface, you have to include your biological receptor. There are many different techniques and you have many different steps to accomplish, but there are also too many parameters to control the surface, the pH, the ionic strength, 
the concentration and accumulation and so on. Um, one, you have controlled this, you have also to make some anti-falling or to avoid non-specific absorption. So you have to modify sometimes the composition of the medium, the surfactant, the additive. We have to incorporate uh, hydrophilic blocking agents, mainly like polyethylene glycol. I mean, there are many, many steps to do uh, before you have um, a, a complete biosensor able to operate in real sample. Just to go to the applications, just to show, I will show you a few applications, how, how you can use uh, this uh, biosensor. Imagine you have already your sensor, you have already your biocanalization. And then the, this is one that I really like very much that is that we work also uh, strongly in this area is how to make an early detection of cancer. Um, this is an example how to make an early detection of colorectal cancer. As you know, this is a cancer that uh, the only way to detect is by colonoscopy. That is not a very nice technique and also very expensive. Uh, so what we, in this work, what we try is to, to know if we can develop a biosensor able to provide a rapid test of uh, who is starting a colorectal cancer. And we know that the colorectal cancer is giving an immunological reaction. So it means that the first cancer cell start to segregate some tumor, uh, some tumor associated antigens to the blood. As a response to that, the, our immunological system start to fabricate antibodies to annihilate these antigens. So we know that if a person is having these an antibodies in, the, in their blood, means that you are starting a colorectal cancer. Looks like this process started even three, four years, the colorectal cancer can be detected by a chromoscopy. So we just um, focusing in three uh, identified antigens that are, that are delivering by these first colorectal cancer cells. And then we were detecting the presence of these autoantibodies in the plasma, in the serum of the patient. So with our biosensor, after, I mean, we have this very excellent biofinalization protocol in place. So we are able to detect the presence of these autoantibodies and also with a very low limit of detection. Remember that in this case, if you have this autoantibody, it means that you are having a colorectal cancer. So we have already uh, demonstrated how it's possible to make this label free and this direct detection of the antibody with a variable sensitivity, selectivity, and also we have correlated with some clinical results with people having this colorectal cancer. So in the future, I think that could be an example of how we can develop a point of care biosensor test that is able uh, to detect the colorectal cancer in the early stage, and then you don't need to go for a colonoscopy. Another example is the point of care biosensor that we have developed for a company in Seville that, that uh, we like to commercialize. Uh, this is a point of care biosensor that the people, that celiac uh, people can use at home for the celiac disease follow up. As you know, the celiac people are intolerant to, to the gluten, and the gliadin is the main component of the gluten. And you know, this is a immunological disease, they are not therapy. So the only way is to not eat um, uh, gluten at all. And we know that in the digestion of this gliadin, there is a main component that um, there is a, a, a component, a very small peptide that appear in the urine. So this is detectable in urine or even feces. Uh, this is resistant to the digestion process. So if you are eating gluten, you are going to have this peptide in the urine. So we can know if a celiac person has been eating gluten because the peptide has to be in their urine. So we have developed a biosensor using a monoclonal antibody against this peptide, monoclonal antibody developed by the company. And then we have developed this uh, biosensor where we can monitor in the, in the urine 100%. I mean, we don't filter, we don't clean the, the, the urine, we just take some drops and then we are including our biosensor and then we can detect the presence of this small peptide even with a very low limit of detection. As I said, we normally uh, use a real sample, we go to hospital and we have checked that our biosensor is really working well when comparing with the standard techniques and we have also done follow, I mean follow for example the diet of some celiac people to see when they have the presence of this small peptide. So, uh, we think that uh, we're now negotiating with the company how it's possible to commercialize this biosensor. Imagine you can have at home, it will be very similar like a pregnancy test. So you're a celiac person and then you can go home, put some drops of urine and then this, the biosensor can 
uh, say to you if you have been eating gluten or not, but also even the concentration and the amount of gluten that you have been eating. This is especially important for children because the small children go to the school or go with friends and you, they don't know, they don't control what they are eating, so they don't feel well. Uh, when they arrive at home, you can use this test at home very easily. Um, another example, how it's possible to make also detection of another type of cancer, the fake blood cancer, using macro RNA detection, this is genomics detection, and these are very short RNAs that they are involved in many diseases, mainly cancer, but also other, and they are present in biofluids. So to have this micro RNA circulating in your blood, but also in your urine, in your saliva, the problem is they are very small molecules and they are very, have a very low concentration. Uh, so they are very difficult to detect. Uh, so we develop also a biosensor uh, where uh, we develop all this biofinalization that you can see here. So we can detect this specific micro RNA, this one, one A, one A. Uh, as a biomarker for blood cancer. We know this is a biomarker for this type of cancer. And uh, with our interferometric technology, we have been able to detect the presence of this very small molecule, microRNA, until a limit of detection of only 20 atomolar. This is real time detection, label free, with non amplified signal. So you can see here what I said, I said also at the beginning, highlight the extreme sensitivity that all these silicon photonics technology has. But also we take samples from patrial amidazurine, 100%, and we were able to stratify and to know who was a healthy donor and who was a person having plate cancer because they contain this micro RNA in their urine sample. Yes, uh, go faster, yes, we can do the same with infections. So we are able to, to use our point of care biosensor for detecting bacteria. For example, this an example how we took um, acidic fluid from patient from Valdebrom and then the cirrhotic patients, and then we detect the presence of an infection by E. coli bacteria. And with our biosensor using just a monoclonal antibody, once antigens in the membrane of the bacteria, we can detect until a limit of detection of only four CPU per milliliter, so four bacteria per milliliter. Because we are using a volume of only 250 microliter, mean that we can detect even at the level of one single bacteria. And we have been using this technology also to go to Valdebron and to use the technology to detect, uh, for example, people that are entering sepsis, just using only 10 microliter of their plasma. And uh, this is important to, to know who is a person, especially for the intensive care units when people start to have all these infections to differentiate who is healthy and who are entering in sex as soon as possible, because normally they have to transport the sample to a centralized laboratory, it takes several days, even several days to have to get the result. And we have shown why in, 20, in 40 minutes we are able to, to know uh, who, who is the pattern entering in sepsis. Okay, I go faster because I don't have time. Just to say that, um, well, my, in my group, we have developed so many applications so that you are interested, you can visit our website and we have that. And just a few words to finalize about the diagnosis of COVID-19, because of course, this technology is very suitable for that. Um, so, as you know, in the case of the diagnosis of COVID-19, mainly the diagnosis have been done by PCR. Um, but the problem with PCR is an excellent technique, but it's time consuming and as you need lab installation, they need personal. Uh, since uh, several months ago, we have all these rapid tests, antigen and antibody serological tests. But remember, they are a very, they give you only yes or no. It's like the pregnancy test. There is no quantification. There is no quantification of the viral load, for example. And they have a very limited sensitivity. So we propose to you a biosensor that can solve all these problems. So it's a very easy diagnosis, the point of need with a very high sensitivity, but even you a quantification, so how many values you have, and also in a very fast diagnostic. Uh, so we have, um, so we are coordinating the combat projects in March 2020. Um, the idea is to make this biosensor in this way, so we just immobilize a specific antibody against the spike protein of the virus, and when the virus is recognized, you can see this change in the interferometric pattern. Okay, so this is what we are doing in the, in the running out of time, so I should go faster. So this is the main 
activity we are doing in the prey, how to capture the whole virus. So we are not um, breaking the virus, we are detecting the whole virus. We are making a, also a second bio sensor where one detect the genomic, the specific sequences of the SARS-CoV-2 without PCR. Um, I mean, it wouldn't need any cycle of amplification like PCR. And also we have doing also a serological biosensor able to detect the number of immunoglobulins that the people has developed as are people have been infected with COVID-19, uh, how the, the immunoglobulins that they have developed until a, as a response. So uh, just to say that uh, this is the result from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, detection. Of, you can imagine we're going to use the SARS-CoV-2 in our labs. We have um, here I seen too. We have um, laboratory level, security level two, uh, but then we have to disactivate the SARS-CoV-2. So we are using ultraviolet disactivation, and we check with electron microscopy that the virus is maintaining the, the I mean, it's the whole virus. And it's well preserved, but with this disactivation, you just um, damage the RNA and it's not infective anymore. Um, with this, uh, with some special antibody that has been prepared on purpose, not commercial ones, so we are able to detect with our biosensor until a limit of detection of only five virus, virus per milliliter. So we have a really excellent sensitivity because normally people are infected with COVID is starting with 10 to 3 a virus per milliliter. This is completely selective, so we are very proud of this uh, biosensor and we are now at this moment doing a clinical validation. We have developed also a serological biosensor finishing um, where we can use all this uh, bioreceptor as the viral antigens and we have already checked how it's possible to detect all the monoglobulins and we went also for a very extensive clinical validation and you can see here from the difference with our biosensor for a, serologic, a rapid serological test that we can quantify. So we can see the control people having not COVID and the people having COVID positive and all the immunoglobulins that they have developed. But more important, we always quantify so we can know how many immunoglobulins a person uh, has been developed as a, um, as a response to the, to the infection. So we are uh, really having a very excellent sensitivity and selectivity. And just to finalize, uh, so we have finished completely this nanobio sensor for the serological test. 100% uh, uh, selectivity, 99% sensitivity, 15 minutes quantitative. We have done uh, hundreds of samples from Clinique and Valdebron Hospital here in Barcelona. And we are now um, just in the tech transfer of this device. And in the case of the biosense for the virus detection, we have been able to achieve 100% sensitivity and selectivity. Uh, we have uh, also a high dynamic range for the detection of the, of the virus. And we are now finalizing the clinical validation. Okay, just a reflection to finalize. Uh, so I, I think that the, the point of care biosensor is going to be the future for the diagnostic, but especially this technology when we're using photonics and biosensor, we can have a very high sensitivity. So this is going to be one, one of the most competitive technology, in my opinion, to be able to produce all this point of care biosensor that we're going to need in the future. So it's going to work something like that with a small machine where you deploy your cartridge with your sensor and then you are going to have your, the reading of your DCC in a few seconds or a few minutes in your mobile phone. Um, remember one thing is the technology, but uh, in my opinion, one of the main uh, uh, difficulties in this technology is the surface chemistry biofunctionalization. How to do that is the key point uh, to give the specificity and the functioning of your biosensor. Okay, and I invite you to see this documentary. It's, uh, I think it's in HBO. Uh, the story of Teranos, a multi-billion dollar tech company, and its founder, Elizabeth Holmes. They, she promised, many years ago, she promised to do this point of care biosensor for everything. And everything that she did was a fake, completely fake. So I invite you to see this documentary to see what you cannot do and you cannot promise in this area. So it's uh, really interesting to see. Okay, I uh, just want to thank all of you for the attention and also I want to thank uh, for my, my group. Just to say that the way to do this, um, I mean, this kind of technology, this biosensing technology, 
the only way to, to, to follow a multidisciplinary approach where so in my group we have biologists, engineering, chemists, physics, telecommunication, mathematics, everybody working in, in the same group. And I am very proud also to say that uh, more than 80 85% of my group are women. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura, for this really interesting and inspiring talk. So we have um, time, 10 minutes more or less for questions. I'm sure there are in the audience. So please, if you have some questions, raise your hand. Or any comment or? <laughs> yeah, or general comment, question, curiosity. So I'm sure Laura will reply. So I don't see any for the moment. So maybe I can start with uh, some, some, some curiosities, I would say. So you, you presented, let's say, two main uh, technologies that you are using in, in your lab. Mm -hmm. So how you choose which one? So when you face a, a problem or a... Uh, well, this is a good question because, I mean, I think not, I mean, most of the people working on biosensors use only one technology. So the case of using two technologies is not usual. Uh, so, are you, I mean, we choose um, depending on the application because the interferometric technology, silicon photonics technology is much more sensitive. So depending if you need a much more sensitivity, it's better if you use this technology. But if you don't need so much sensitivity, so it's better the plasmonic one because plasmonic are using gold. Um, for the uh, chemistry point of view, it's much more easy to do all the surface value fertilization in gold. This is a very uh, one of the most excellent surface, or excellent material to do chemistry and to do functionalization. So depending on that, we're using a technology or the another. But of course, so first plasma resonance and plasmonic technology is much more simple to understand and to manage and then the, the other one that is much more sophisticated. But depends on the application, on the level of sensitivity that uh, your application is required. Okay, so they are telling me that there are some hands that are raised, but I don't know why I don't see them. Me neither, also, no. I don't see them. So maybe okay, I... We have, we have Fabiao, Fabiao, you can ask the okay, question. So... Uh, sure. Uh, hello, good morning. Good morning, everyone, and good morning. Thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoy. Hope you are hearing me well. Uh, yes. Perfect. I think also one of the main issues, of course, beyond the surface biofunctionalization that, that you mentioned, if we think about a more general comment, which is what I have to share, is I think the ability to produce in large scale these disposable sensors or at least partially disposable uh, devices at a low cost while maintaining the good accuracy and the producibility because sometimes and also with covid we heard about the false positives or the false negatives so i really think this is quite challenging uh and i would like to know your comment about yes. how to keep the good quality while maintaining a reduced cost yeah well of course this is very important this quality uh, of all the process and this is complex because you have as i said the sensor itself and then you have the biofinalization then you have the microfluid you have to package everything and to make a cartridge and then you have you need the instrument so you have many areas to control but i always uh, come back to the sample of the glucose biosensor i mean text the for example glucose biosensor the first idea was in the year uh, 1962 and it took more than 20 years to go to the market just for this reason, because it was very difficult how to make something reproducible because you are going to measure the, the glucose in a person and, um, and depending on the, on, the, I mean, on the reading, I mean, the person can die if it is not correct and, and they have a different concentration of insulin. Uh, so this is a, a, a huge problem, in, not a huge problem, but I think this is something that we have to, to take into account. But after the success of the glucose biosensor, I think we can do with any other application. So it's possible to do that. Of course, you need to do a, a, a strong investment um, and then to, to make all the quality control of all the different steps. Um, but it's possible to, to do that, in my, in my opinion. And I think we need really to do that because as I say, it's not anymore the time to have everything centralized. 
in a, in a hospital, in a laboratory. Imagine that you go to a small town or you go even in countries that they don't have any, any, any central laboratory. So I think we really need to, to, I mean, to push forward all this technology. And I think it's possible to do that. It's possible uh, to make this uh, very good uh, quality control with different steps and then to do in a large scale. Uh, because it's also that the, the, all the, most of the people that we work in this area, we have always taken into account that we need to have low cost technology. So we are never, I mean, we are not using uh, very expensive technology. I mean, all these gold chips, all this silicon sensor, everything is very standard technology. We have make always the calculation of what is the price, but uh, imagine that your machine could, could cost like 1,000, 2,000 or 5,000 euros. But the cartridge, I mean, that is the, the bio sensor that you use one, one time or two times or three times can cost less than 10 euros in total. So this is really, we are always thinking, okay, we have to develop something low cost because it's to be for mass use or so massive use. Uh, so this is something that is already um, taking into account. But of course, I agree with you that it's a difficult, I mean, that we have to make this a, a selling quality control uh, for the for each uh, step, and um, what you commented about the rapid test, about the false negative, false positive. If you remember all these rapid tests, based on lateral flow, they were done very quickly because we really need to to answer to the pandemic. But remember, this lateral flow, uh, they are not one hundred percent reliable, and the sensitivity is always an issue. Uh, for example, the pregnancy test that women are using, you make your test and normally it's right that you see the, the chain color, but normally then the woman go to a hospital to do um, a further testing to, to check that is, uh, uh, so the, this, I mean, this is a technology that have very limited sensitivity and that's the reason why they have this false negative and false positive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, there are two questions. Uh, Naurin Naman, I think you wanted to ask something to Laura. Yeah, uh, hi Laura. I have a curiosity, but um, I think you stopped sharing the screen. But uh, it was in the slide of the bimodal uh, waveguide interferometer. Like you said, in one chip, there are, you can uh, put 20 of the like uh, this waveguide uh, interferometer. And why you are like, is this only for having a more precise um, uh, result or like why only 20, not six or 10 or more or something like why these are in this kind of areas? Because you are using the, uh, is it for, and also is it for only one surface material, biofunctional no, material I mean, or for different? I won't try to share my screen again, but uh, no, I mean, we choose 20, of course, I mean, sometimes we are doing eight or even four, uh, so it depends. I mean, we choose 20 in order to, um, I mean, uh, to fabricate as much as possible sensor in the same chip in order to, to decrease the cost, okay, that's the main reason. Um, of course, I mean, we have to take into account that we need to encapsulate with the microfluidics. So that's a reason, with the, I mean, we separate 250 microns. So the reason to make 20 is just because we want to have as much as possible sensor on the same uh, chip in, in order, I mean, just to, to decrease the, the cost. Sometimes we fabricate four, we, sometimes we use only one. Uh, so, but uh, I mean, the, the question of doing this is because, I mean, if you have 20 independent sensor, you can or to analyze the same and the same substances in 20 samples at the same time, or using the same sample, you can analyze 20 different um, analytes of different biomarkers. So it's just to do for doing multiplexing. The only thing is when you have many biosensors in parallel, you have to solve also the problem of the engineering. So how to incorporate the light in 20 sensors, how to read out in 20 sensors and so on. But it's, I mean, the number is only for multiplexing uh, capabilities. Okay. And you can module, I mean, you can we have design in this way, but you can design in the, in the way that you want. So it's not a problem. Okay. Thank you so much. So we have a couple of minutes before the next talk. So I think Juan Forero had also a question. Juan? Uh, yeah, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Laura. It was a very, very interesting presentation. I was amazed by the by the very low uh, detection limits, like being able to detect four copies of a virus in one milliliter is like 
truly amazing. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's very encouraging. But then I was thinking on what about the upper limit? Because you said that a sick person can get up to 1,000 or 10,000 mm -hmm. copies. So I guess like the surface gets saturated at certain points. Yes. Yes, so, okay, so, see, thank you for the question. So we have this very low limit of detection because we are using this uh, even FN wave detection at the nanometer scale, and also we are using an interferometric detection. Remember, interferometric is the technique in physics give it the highest sensitivity. So that's the main reason why we are able to have this extreme sensitivity without amplification in the signal, without nothing. Um, and you were asking me about the, I forgot the, about the, I forgot yeah, the question. Well, about the upper limit, because maybe, oh, maybe you have Sorry, some, yeah, some yeah, separation. So, okay, so no, normally we always speak about the limit of detection because we want to highlight, oh, how sensitive is my device. But if you remember in one of my last slides, I was saying that we have a dynamic range. This is how we define in a biosensor the limit of the, I mean, the lower number and the number until you go to saturation. And for a biosensor, the most important is this dynamic range, not get saturated immediately. So this is the most important to define if your biosensor can be applied for an application or not. In the case of the virus, we can go, if I remember well, from this very low limit of detection until 10 to 7 virus per milliliter. So we are covering until it got saturated. So we can cover completely all the dynamic range that most of the people infected by, by SARS-CoV-2 are having, the number of viruses that they're having. And dynamic range, this is the most, one of the most important parameters. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think we have to stop here. So it's already one. Thank you very much, Laura. It was uh, really, really interesting to see all the development and all the devices you are doing in, in your lab. So okay. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you and enjoy the, the rest of the school. Thank you. Bye-bye, Laura. So I guess now Laura or Anna. Sorry, Nuria, that I was, I, I was speaking with Martí. I don't know, Juan, did, did you already ask your question? Juan Forero? Yeah, 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 yes. Okay. So I don't know if there are more questions. If not, we can uh, follow with the next speaker that is already here. And Ricardo will be the chair of the session. And Laura, thank you for, for your talk. And I'm just, ah, is she already there? Sí. Ah, vale. Sorry that I was speaking with Martí. No, with, no, with Martí Giver, no. With other Martí. Eh, Martí Gic. So, eh, Ricardo. Yes, I'm here. Okay, so I leave you again. Okay, so I, I take control. Uh, okay, so, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Ricardo Rally, and I have the, the duty and the pleasure to introduce the next speaker who is uh, Professor Luca Gamaitoni from the University of Perugia. Uh, it's a bit difficult to introduce Luca because uh, you never know, he is a researcher, he's a professor, he started the spin-off, he has uh, patents in different uh, fields related to energy harvesting. Uh, recently, he's been even involved in the detection of uh, gravitational waves, so he's really polyphasetic character. Um, I think it's good to have him here uh, for this, uh, especially for this audience, because uh, I was, you know, striking his uh, his uh, biography, and I, I suddenly realized there and remember because I knew it that uh, uh, he has a strong background. Actually, perhaps he started the research in uh, uh, stochastic resonance, which is a very, you know, how can I say, uh, uh, abstract field. But uh, nevertheless, is now, uh, as I is, was saying before, patenting uh, new ideas for energy harvesting as he started a spin-off co spin company in Perugia. So really, I think uh, he's a good example for a young PhD student that you, you, you can really do whatever you like with your career, as long as you have uh, initiative and, and good ideas. So with uh, no further ado, I would leave the, the floor to, to Luca, who is tell us something um, related perhaps to his recent work in uh, on energy harvesting. So, uh, Luca, thanks again for accepting the invitation and uh, the, the flow. Of course, as you know, I have the, the nasty watchdog uh, role, so I will 
be telling you when your time is over and things like that. But you, you, you have plenty of time to speak. Excellent. So okay. thank you, Ricardo. I really enjoyed your presentation. So I might hire you for my next uh, public appearances. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me uh, say that I'm really glad to be here. And I'm sorry not to be in Barcelona in person, because that's a place that I really like very much. And, um, but nevertheless, we, we have the opportunity at least to exchange ideas. And I'm looking forward to the next uh, 60 minutes as an uh, opportunity to exchange ideas. So I went through uh, the program of your school and I was kind of impressed by how vast and diversified it is. And in my opinion, this is a very good thing. While most people uh, prefer a very focused and narrow uh, focused uh, uh, program, I enjoy very much to have a broad program because I think one of the main quality that it will be useful to transmit to future generation is this capability of addressing uh, different topics. This flexibility in mind, this ability to look at different problems and uh, uh, try to bring in contribution, it's a very useful skill. You will see it in, uh, in your future career. I try to do it myself. And instead, as Ricardo mentioned, my career is actually plagued with this kind of diversity. I've been working on different fields and trying to, to give my contribution there. So the best part of it is that you're really enjoying doing it. That's fun. And we should have fun when we do science. Certainly, we do not do science for money, right? We, we could make way more money doing other things, um, especially the more bright uh, among us, uh, which, which I'm not one of them. Uh, and, but nevertheless, we enjoy uh, doing science. So th that's our reward. Uh, there are also drawbacks in this opportunity, of course, and it's that uh, you will be um, looked with some sort of uh, uh, suspect from your colleagues most of the time, because they do not understand which box you feel in, you fit in. And th this is a problem still, at least in some universities, there are still very rigid sectors, scientific sectors, but the situation uh, is going to change. So the good news is that in the future will not be like this. So if you get prepared right now, you will take advantage of this flexibility. Okay, uh, now let me uh, uh, share with you my screen. Let me see if I can manage this without making too many mistakes. Okay, and this should be it. Um, Okay, now you should probably be able to see it, okay? Well, <clears throat> I prepared, of course, a number of slides as it's customary in this case, but you are um, very welcome, invited to, to stop me and to ask questions, okay? So the topic is microscale energy harvesting. Uh, Ricardo mentioned that I have been working on many different topics and that's true, but there is some sort of a common uh, uh, field rouge that actually connect all these different topics. And this connection is the role of fluctuations or noise as we usually call it. So fluctuation is really my passion. And I've been working for many years trying to understand what are fluctuations, where do they come from? How can we use fluctuation, take advantage when it's possible or avoid fluctuations? Uh, for example, um, Ricardo mentioned that I worked for many years on gravitational wave detection. At that time, we were looking for uh, efficient techniques to reduce fluctuation because in uh, gravitational wave detection, fluctuation is noise and that's a disturbance is something that uh, um, obscure the presence uh, of the gravitational wave signal. 
So we have been trying to, to take down the noise as much as possible. And that was very interesting because we learned a lot of things doing that. And eventually we succeeded. So now that the sensitivity of this gravitational wave detector is large enough that that can actually see gravitational waves. Uh, that's certainly something that uh, it's important by scientific point of view. And in doing that, uh, honestly, I was not interested at all in gravitational waves. I barely knew and still know what they are, but I was interested in fluctuations. I was trying to, to decrease the amount of noise in order to free spectral range for um, providing a good room for detection. Uh, another application of this is actually uh, uh, energy harvesting. And I'm going to talk about any ar energy harvesting in this, uh, uh, in this talk. And the first things that I want to, to show you is where I am from. And this is a map of Italy and Perugia is a very old town right at the center of Italy. It part of um, a region, which is an administrative unit called Umbria. And you see it's more or less uh, same distance from between Florence and Rome. And there is a very old university there, uh, dates back to 1308. That's the University of Perugia. It's one of the oldest in Italy indeed, and so also in Europe. And um, there, there is a, um, a, a research laboratory that I uh, founded and I am also directing. Uh, it's called NIPS, Noise and Physical Systems Laboratory. And presently there are uh, eight or nine persons belonging to it. And this number uh, of course changes with time. And the, the lab existed now for almost uh, 20 years. And we have been uh, in this 20 years, we have been doing many things, uh, but most of the time we have, are interested in noise and fluctuations, which in this, um, by this point of view, it means also energy transformation processes at micro and nanoscale. Uh, during this, uh, okay, let me see if I get, okay, laser point. During this year, we have also uh, participated to a number of European Commission funded projects. And you see that, that started about 15 years ago and they are still going. Uh, specifically, this uh, project is still going called Enables. And what are the, the, the main uh, features of our interest? Well, we are interested in energy transformation processes. That means uh, the way in which energy can be used, transformed, or stored, uh, but very small scale. What does it mean? In power, means that we are interested in uh, power, which is below 10 milliwatt. So very tiny energies. It's not the kind of energy that you can use to, to heat your apartment or to, to use to drive your car. But these are energies that are involved nevertheless in many uh, physical processes uh, right now, also at the biological level, and also are interesting by technology point of view because many applications now are about microelectronics or micro devices. And in this case, micro energies come into place. That means that also the physical volumes of the, the, the devices that we are interested in are uh, quite small. I would say significantly below one cubic centimeter and most of the time it's below one cubic millimeter. Um, I mentioned that uh, there is still one of the, this European project going on. It's called Enables, and it's uh, a research uh, uh, infrastructure, distributed research infrastructure all over Europe, uh, aimed at promoting research on energy harvesting. So if you want to know more, you can uh, connect to the website. Uh, you see here there is the website address and uh, you can look uh, into that. There is also um, another website that I might recommend you, and it was mentioned before, which is this one, it's nipslab.org. There you can find materials and also videos or um, uh, documents uh, that 
actually tells you more and better of what we are doing there. Okay, back to, to our business. Um, let me give you some motivation. Why are we talking about the topic of today and why this topic is important for you? Why, what can you get actually by this uh, lecture? Uh, um, well, as you know, computers are uh, presently very important in our society and their impact in our everyday life can be hardly overestimated. And uh, if you have lived long enough, you also can recognize that this important has been growing and growing uh, uh, continuously since where you were born, basically. Uh, just to convince you, if, if you need to be convinced, let me show you this picture. This is a picture taken on April 4th, 2005. This is Rome. Um, this is what we call the Piazza San Pietro, it means that the Vatican City. And you see the, the San Pietro Church on the, uh, the bottom. And this is a, a, a picture taken during the funeral of John Paul II, the Pope. And so you can see that the, 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 the square and also the, the, uh, the street in front of the square was crowded with people. And this is another, oh sorry, this is another picture and was taken on March 13, 2013. The, the perspective is slightly uh, more short in the second picture, but nevertheless, you can see that there is a, a, a striking difference between the two pictures. The picture for, from March 13, uh, 2013 was the election of a new Pope, in this case was uh, Pope Francis. So you see that the main difference is that the number of uh, uh, mobile phone, tablets, devices that actually are on uh, in the second picture is uh, uh, much, much larger than the number of devices in the first picture. And only uh, barely less than 10 years uh, have passed. So there is a transformation and we are facing this transformation. And to some extent, we are lucky to, to be part of it. Uh, nevertheless, we should be aware of what this transformation uh, uh, implies and means. Um, so one of the things that I'm doing among others is also try to, to, to think of this transformation. Somebody called this uh, a digital revolution or a digital culture. Um, I'm sure you have heard about big data, artificial intelligence. Okay, we are part of this transformation. And actually some of us, uh, and probably some of you also are uh, actually uh, uh, actors in this transformation. I think we should also um, develop some sort of uh, uh, meaningful critical view uh, because this transformation is not automatically good as it's not automatically bad but certainly it needs uh, uh, to be steered, uh, possibly toward the good. Um, okay, so it's a fact. Mobile computing is actually growing uh, very fast. It's growing exponentially fast. There is one uh, possible scenario that is called the Internet of Things, a uh, situation in which uh, a very large number of mobile devices are connected together through the network, uh, typically internet. And in fact, if you look at the, the figures in this slide, you can see that the, the, the number of connected devices is growing much faster than the, the world population. So we are going to see uh, a, a situation in which we will have uh, probably thousand or of uh, hundred thousand of million connected device per inhabitant in our planet. And we should understand what it, this is going to, to mean. How do we rule this situation? How can we take advantage of this technology? And uh, uh, one of the, the problem that we are facing with this scenario is that uh, um, most, if not all, of these devices are not capable of producing their own power, like the humans. Humans uh, produce their own powers uh, basically by eating. 
Uh, these devices need to be um, provided with power in order to functioning, and they are becoming more and more uh, hungry of power. If you look at the, the graph on the right slide, this is part of the work that we did uh, a few years ago with one of the European project, uh, it was called uh, uh, ICT Energy. So information and communication technology energy. And you can see that the, the, the line here uh, show you what is the trend in growth of power need per um, CPUs, basically central processing units. So the heart of these uh, electronic devices. Well, as you can see, uh, there is a, a, an exponential growth and not only it's exponential, but the, the exponent is different for different uh, uh, categories of computing machine. The red one is high performance computing. That means that the, the very big computers that are extremely power hungry, as you see, we are in the megawatt uh, power. Then there are the, the PCs and the portable uh, portable devices are the green lines, and the green lines are the steepest, uh, the steepest. And so that means that they are growing faster. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, if, if you look at the, the smartphone, or last generation smartphone are not even comparable with the smartphone that we had 10 years ago. Um, I, I can easily remember 20 years ago what were the portable devices at that time. And uh, that means that the, the grow in capability brings together a very uh, steep growth in power uh, needs. And this is something important because uh, right now the, the energy dissipation, the energy consumption, the power needed by these devices is the major roadblock to improving uh, uh, these devices themselves. And you know, it's a common experience if you do not uh, uh, charge, if you do not attach your mobile phone uh, when you go to sleep and you forget to do that, the day after you are in big trouble. So you need an entire night or almost part of it to recharge it and to be able to use it through the day. And most of the time I do not even get to midday with the, the charge of the night. So the energy dissipation by mobile devices is really a serious problem. And this is way more important if you think of much smaller devices, not just your mobile phone, but you think of, uh, you can think of uh, um, wireless sensors. These small sensors that might be uh, distributed in the environment used for to monitor things. And I will show you later on uh, some application in this direction. Okay, um, so why the Internet of Things scenario has not been realized yet? Well, the reason is that we, we, we do not have enough power. Uh, we do not have uh, enough uh, cheap, long-lasting power to power these uh, uh, mobile devices. And um, what do we need to do is actually to, to act on both sides of this uh, double arrow situation. So in a sense, we need to decrease the energy required to operate electronic devices. That means that present generation of devices is too energy hungry. So we need to, to, to find a smarter way to use the energy. And the second is that we need to improve our capability of uh, providing energy to mobile devices, meaning uh, uh, disposable batteries is not a great idea. We need to find something smarter than that. Because disposable batteries uh, have a problem that they last only for a limited amount of time, and then they need to be disposed, which uh, add to pollution. Uh, this is certainly not good for, for environment, it's not good for us. Uh, so new and smarter ideas are required also in this side of the arrow. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, so we need to bridge still the gap uh, between these two arrows. And in order to bridge the gap, we need to add some knowledge. Okay, this is, uh, this is where we come in, okay? Uh, we are not uh, the main actors when uh, it's about steering the society, certainly because we are not in politics. We are not the main actors when uh, uh, 
it's about uh, to inventing uh, uh, a new smartphone because we are not necessarily te technologician or, or people in the uh, in the industry, but certainly we are the actors when new knowledge must be invented, by new knowledge must be created. So the role of scientists, the role of universities, the role of research centers is to create new knowledge. And this is one of the field, the most exciting field in which new knowledge is really necessary. And this new knowledge is about uh, the way in which we uh, use and manage uh, micro energies or energy at very, very small scales. Uh, what do we do? Okay, how do, can, you, can we add this knowledge? How can we create this knowledge? Well, I'm a physicist um, uh, and what physicists do, usually they do some modeling. So they invent models and try to, to understand how things work. Understanding is the best uh, uh, activity that you can do. And you understand when you are able to make a model, usually a mathematical model, of your phenomena. And you can use this model to predict the phenomena or to adjust uh, the evolution of this uh, uh, phenomena. So we need to do some modeling. And this is what I'm going to do with you in the next uh, few minutes. Hopefully, it will be interesting for you. For, for you. But uh, once again, you can always uh, stop me and ask questions if not. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a, a device, an electronic device, which is small, and uh, we want to power this device, means we want to provide electrical energy in order to make it work. So first, it's important to understand how much energy is needed to power a device. Uh, and this is something that depends on the device itself uh, and uh, how the device is built. And there are a number of questions which are interesting here. For example, what is the minimum energy required? How can we decrease this energy? Can this energy decrease down to zero? Can we have a device operating without spending any energy? Apparently, this is a very naive question, but it's not. It's not. There are devices that can actually be operated without spending any energy, at least in principle. So the fundamental law of physics do not forbid to do that. There are some technological issues that might uh, um, came in, in place, but still we can manage that if we understand how the things work. And also materials in this case are very important because you change materials and change the way in which energy is uh, uh, used by the device itself. So we are going to, to consider small devices, as I mentioned before, and these devices are uh, at MEMS scale and below. So micro, that means uh, um, below one cubic millimeter, if you, if you want to, to, to have a number about that. And also we will uh, focus not on any device, but ICT devices, meaning uh, devices which are uh, mainly devoted to computing and communication, because this is, this is the kind of devices that are nowadays most uh, uh, required uh, by <coughs> technology and by marketing also. So this, this uh, green uh, box is our device. And usually a device of this kind gets some information in and provides some information out. So it's an ICD device. So it manages information and information in the technical sense, information in the sense of uh, information theory. Not only information, but also energy. So you need to put in some energy. And by the moment, the energy is conserved. Uh, this is the first principle of thermodynamics. The same energy, the same amount of energy that you put in, usually it gets out. So the device, the ICT energy device does not change its configuration. So the amount of energy that heat has inside at the beginning of the process is more or less the same amount of energy that it has at the end of the process. What is really different is the, the form of energy. So energy is usually input in the form of work. Uh, or potential energy, you can think of electrical energy, batteries, for example, they, they provide potential electrical energy, and it mainly output in the form of heat. 
So the device is usually warmer and it tends to, to warm, uh, to communicate heat to the environment. Okay, so same amount of energy as an absolute value, different form of energy, uh, potential energy, which is very precious form of energy in the input and heat, which is very poor form of energy at the output. We, are, we have, do not have time to go into this, but it's very interesting to see what does it mean, rich form of energy and poor form of energy. This is something that is associated with the entropy of the system itself. So the entropy, uh, it's different uh, in, in between the input and the output of the device itself. So by this point of view, our ICT device is a, 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 what I called an infothermal machine. So it's something that inputs energy and information and output energy and information, um, the same amount of energy, it's at input and output, not necessarily the same amount of information. And entropy is different uh, between the, the input condition and output condition. So then we have another question, where does the device get the needed energy? How do we provide this precious potential energy to our device? Well, usually it provided by another device, which is called the transducers. And this transducer take energy from the ambient. This is, uh, um, can be done in different ways. Well, for example, a transducer can, can, can be the, the, the plug of your uh, um, electric uh, um, voltage source in your apartment. You plug your telephone, your mobile phone to the, to the electric uh, energy source. And the, the electric energy there comes from the ambient, uh, maybe sometimes far, far away. And when it's transformed, it could be solar energy, for example, through solar powers or wind energy from wind, but it can also be chemical energy when we burn something or we um, could be nuclear energy when we go through a nuclear reaction to, to produce heat and from heat to produce electrical energy through work. So the situation might be quite complicated if you, if you see, but this is still a model. It's, it's not a mathematical model, but it's a description of the situation. Of course, uh, you have also feedback actions. The, the ICT device uh, uh, plays some feedback on the transducer and the transducer plays some feedback on the ambient energy. Sometimes these feedback are um, useful and positive. Most of the time they are not so useful and they, they include, of course, also pollution, uh, which is certainly not good. Okay, we can ask uh, some interesting question as I uh, anticipated before. Um, for example, why all the energy ends up in heat? Uh, can this be avoided? Why there is uh, energy dissipation? What does it mean, dissipation itself? Can this be avoided? Can we have a, a mobile phone whose battery lasts forever? Or can we charge it uh, once per week instead of uh, once per day? So these are questions that can be, of course, uh, um, asked. And also, what is the role of information? Uh, how does the information interfere with this energy consumption? Is there any role of information or not? This is also a topic that has uh, uh, taken up the, the interest of scientists for many, many years now. In order to, uh, to address these questions, we need to make one step uh, um, uh, forward and uh, we need to make a mathematical model. So that, that's what the, the, the real scientists should do. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you are in the economy sector or sociology sector. Now we go into the very scientific sector. So we have these two devices. Devices are physical things and they should obey the law of physics. Both devices, a transform energy. So you need to know something about thermodynamics because the thermodynamics is the body of uh, a science that deals with energy. But they have also another, another feature. They are usually extended system. That means that they are made by many degrees of freedom. They're not just a simple uh, material point, okay? The ICT device is a device made by many, many atoms, and same is the transducer. That means that they are also subjected to fluctuation. This is something that I do not have time to go into, but you should know this. 
if your system is made by many degrees of freedom, there will be fluctuation. This is unavoidable. It's a law of physics. It's a law of nature. This is the way in which things are. Every time you have an extended system, fluctuations are unavoidable. Fluctuations may be um, useful, may be uh, dangerous, but they are there and there is no way to avoid. Fluctuation means that if, for example, just to give you an example, if I measure uh, the voltage at the input of my ICT device, I will see that these measures are not a steady quantity, which is always the same, but they tend to fluctuate. So fluctuation means that this quantity that is the result of my measurement will change in time and will change in a random manner. That's what fluctuation is about. And this casualty, this randomness comes from the very fact that the system is not just made by one degree of freedom, but is made by many microscopic bodies. And these many microscopic bodies generate this fluctuation, this randomness. It's intrinsic to this uh, multitude of degrees of freedom. So <clears throat> what is the, the, the body of science that we should use when uh, you have this fluctuation, well, which is called usually statistical mechanics. So statistical mechanics is the kind of uh, microscopic theory that it's useful when you have a system made by many degrees of freedom. Then there is another feature. Uh, these devices are not isolated from the outside. They actually are operated in a changing environment. That means that they keep exchanging uh, heat and work mostly with the environment. And um, so you need a, a very specific uh, body of knowledge, which is called non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, which is subset of statistical mechanics. And it's, it's, it's a part of the theory that you need to learn if you want to deal with this kind of devices. Okay, this is the body of knowledge that you need to, to, to get if you want to deal with devices. And uh, once you get this, you can try to apply uh, this body of knowledge to, the, to make a model for these uh, two devices. And this is the model that I am proposing you. I will not go into mathematical details because I know that you come from very different uh, uh, backgrounds and some of you are probably most skilled in uh, mathematics and some less, but this is the kind of mathematical model that I'm going to uh, present you. And this is what I want to to tell you that you need to do uh, when you want to deal with this micro, very small devices, which are uh, in contact with the, the rest of the environment. Uh, what you usually do, you pick up just one degree of freedom. It could be a position of something. It could be the value of the voltage or the value of the electric current, or it could be also the mass of a device or the temperature. And you call this uh, degree of freedom X. And then you study the evolution, the time evolution of this degree of freedom, usually with a dynamical equation like this one. Okay, this method is not new. It was invented actually by Newton uh, who built this idea based on some uh, insight provided by Galileo Galilei. So it's certainly not a new idea to, to, to have this kind of mathematical modeling. And uh, Newton um, proposed it for the first time using, using also some discussion with Leibniz. Just to give you an idea, Newton and Leibniz uh, fought for many years uh, in also in a very uh, uh, clear and open way for those who nowadays are um, surprised by the fact that the, the scientists fight in public, for example, you see in, for the COVID-19 uh, in TV, you see this uh, scientists that fight each other. Okay, the scientists have been fighting each other for many, many years, since the time of Newton and Leibniz. Uh, and these kind of fights were very common since then. Okay, nevertheless, this is the equation of motion. So we will focus our attention on one degree of freedom. And you will see that this is the equation of motion by Newton when you have some external forces acting on your system. And then you have some internal dynamics. 
um, and typically you have these two terms. One term, which is the dissipative force, which is called friction, usually. And these other terms is the fluctuation. So friction and fluctuation come together in this uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanical approach together with the external forces. And of course, M is the inertial mass or the impedance sometimes of your um, degree of freedom. And uh, this is the two dots means that the second deri derivative with time and the first dot is the, the first derivative of time. Of course, if this is a position, if X uh, is the degree of freedom that refers to position, uh, this is the velocity speed and this is the acceleration. So second derivative or the displacement with time. And the external forces usually they come from uh, a potential or not, or they are also, they can, they can come from uh, uh, random forces. And this depends on how your system is made, but I want to give you now a, a, an example in which you can see this more clearly. So let me go uh, slightly um, ahead. I want to focus a little bit on this part. Uh, so I will forget for the moment uh, the device itself. I want to, to focus a little bit on the transducers. So how can we get ambient energy and transform this ambient energy in order to power the device? So I will focus uh, um, for a few minutes more on this part. Okay, the first thing that we know is that energy is conserved. I mentioned this before. And so the idea is that uh, uh, can we make all this heat produced by the, the transducer go away? Can we make C, the amount of energy transforming to heat uh, to go away? Well, in principle, yes, you can do that. It's not forbidden by the law of physics, and this is a good news, but it's not easy to do that because usually you have energy dissipated. You see, this is the, the guy who is responsible for dissipation that we call friction. Uh, it's usually proportional to the velocity. So the, the, you can actually uh, make all the dissipation go away. And there is a good news. This is possible. It's not forbidden by the law of physics. But the bad news is that uh, you need to reduce this contribution to the equation of motion. By the moment that gamma is a constant, you need to act on uh, uh, x dot, which is the velocity of the transformation. So you need to act very, very slowly. So the bad news, the good news is that in principle, there is no physical law that forbids to, to reduce the dissipation to zero. The bad news is that this is going to affect actually uh, the power that you can use because the power, I remind you, is just the energy divided by the time. So uh, you save the energy, but you decrease the power. And this can be a limitation if you want to, to power your device, of course. Uh, okay, so let me show you some, this is the final part of the talk, some uh, uh, development on this. So we have talked a little bit about the models just to give you a hint of what the physicists do when we want to deal with current system. And now we are going to application. So where do the energy come from? How can we get energy to these devices? First of all, thermal gradients. Thermal gradients in a, is in a situation in which you have uh, 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 in, in a narrow or, or in a small space, two very different temperature. If you have thermal gradients, then you can get out energy of that. If you do not have thermal gradients, forget about energy. That's uh, an expression of the second principle of thermodynamics, okay? No thermal, granite, thermal gradients, no energy available. Another possibility, you go to get kinetic energy. So energy associated with the motion. When you go at micro scale, this basically means uh, vibration or uh, acoustic noise, seismic noise, ambient noise, that means wind, uh, pressure fluctuations, man-made vibrations, okay? In my group, we made a device capable of uh, getting energy out of the vibration of, uh, um, of the, the, the uh, say, out of, uh, for example, the body of a car. If you have a car which is moving, everything in a car vibrates. 
can we get part of this vibration and transform it into uh, electrical energy? We did it. And that's interesting because in this way, you can actually make uh, uh, sensors inside the car that do not need the, uh, to be powered by the central battery. They can get energy out of vibrations. And this is something that is uh, in principle possible, not easy to do. It depends on what kind of vibration do you have, but still this is possible. And then another possibility is electromagnetic radiation like uh, light, but also radio frequency radiation. So every radiation that is in the electromagnetic spectrum. And then there is also chemical and biological energy. And I will show you in a minute, just one example of that. Okay, kinetic energy is the most uh, uh, distributed, and uh, but in order to exploit kinetic energy, you have to know it. So what we did with my group, we built a, a, a large database with all the vibration that we could find. And this, this uh, uh, database for vibration is available freely. You can go and check. Uh, you should find it at realvibration.nipslab.org or you go into the nipslab.org website and you will see the, the link to that. And uh, as Ricardo mentioned at the beginning, we also made uh, a, a spin-off company. We founded a spin-off company, which is called Wise Power. And you can find the, sorry, something went wrong with the Microsoft PowerPoint, which is now rebuilding. Um, I can keep talking. So we built, we, we funded this um, uh, spin-off company. Okay, let me see. And the spin-off company is uh, um, uh, working, still uh, in business. And it's called Wise Power. And they actually produce um, energy harvester, mainly for vibration, but not only. And they, uh, believe it or not, can also sell them. Okay. Um, if you are uh, curious about this vibration, you can go there and check. Uh, you will find uh, all kinds of uh, vibration acquired from systems. For example, a bridge. A bridge is always vibrating, even if nobody is actually walking uh, uh, over it, but it's vibrating because it's there is wind, there is air, uh, or simply because it's uh, uh, based uh, on ground. And as you know, ground shakes uh, continuously. So for every uh, uh, real-time series that you find inside the database, you will have the features in uh, spectral density, intensity, et cetera, et cetera. OK, just let me jump to. Uh, another possibility, which is this one. How do you harvest energy out of vibration? Well, you need a device that transforms this kinetic energy into electric energy. And uh, one of the most interesting uh, devices is uh, an oscillator. Oscillator that should be made by uh, piezoelectric materials, for example. Piezoelectric materials are very interesting because they change a, a strain into an electrical voltage. So let's suppose that you attach this oscillator into to your vibrating things. The oscillator will produce uh, um, at the certain points a, a voltage difference. And you can use this voltage difference actually to power your electric devices. So uh, uh, energy vibration, vibration harvester, energy vibration harvester are based mostly on uh, piezoelectric materials, because those are the most efficient way to transfer vibration or kinetic energy into electrical energy. There are some uh, drawback due to the fact that uh, uh, usually they are uh, expensive materials. Then there are also some subtleties. Uh, if you want to um, improve the performance of this oscillator, you need to go to nonlinear mechanical oscillator, which is a class of oscillators, uh, very peculiar class, but we demonstrated a few years ago that if you do that, you can actually get an improvement 
inefficiency of energy transformation up to 600%. And that's uh, when we decided to, to found uh, the spin-off company because we want to exploit uh, this advantage in transforming vibration into electrical energy. Okay, I'm not going into the, these details here. I just want to give you a, a, an idea of what uh, uh, you can do with a completely different kind of uh, source of energy. I mentioned before chemical or biological energy. One thing that we are working right now is to get energy out of a single biological cell. A single biological, I mean, living cell, it's a, it's a, a system which lives inside, uh, um, for example, it's our, inside our body or animal bodies. And uh, every cell is just like a, a, a ball. And there is a membrane that enclose the cell inside the membrane. Across the membrane, there is a potential energy difference. So there is the, a voltage difference indeed, electric voltage difference indeed. What we wanted to do, wanted to put a small probe inside uh, uh, one cell and try to get this electrical energy out. And we did it, actually. We also published uh, this in a paper. Um, OK, that is here. If you, if you are curious about this form of electrical energy, we did it with a small cell, but not, not extremely small. We used um, eggs, uh, actually frog eggs, uh, which are a small cell of few two or three millimeters in diameter. And uh, you can put a very small probe inside and try to use this energy. We actually probe energy out of one cell and use it to send a, a, a radio signal to a certain distance, not, not much uh, far, a few centimeters. But it was interesting because it was a proof of concept that actually you can use a, a biological cell to power an electronic device. And this is a quite recent work done uh, a couple of years ago with these colleagues uh, at the University of Perugia. Okay, conclusion. Um, take home message. Uh, you do not need to focus only on energy harvesting, but the focus should be on energy transformation. So energy harvesting, uh, most of the time, is just a buzzword. You should look into the, the details of how energy is used and transformed, how energy gets dissipated into it. And if you understand those mechanisms, then it's where you can actually make the difference. And then if you are interested in making devices, both ends of the gap should be addressed. Meaning we should also decrease the amount of energy that you dissipate when you operate the device. And you should improve the, the way in which you collect energy from the outside. And this is a, a list of materials that are of interest in this field, which are, as I mentioned, piezoelectric materials like uh, zinc oxide, for example. Um, or also um, piezo piezomagnetic materials, uh, uh, which are also uh, useful in the MEM scale. And not to mention, not to forget, uh, finally, the energy of biological systems. Uh, if you want to, to uh, look to the future in which we will have micro robots uh, uh, taking care of our health, hopefully. Uh, if Ricardo let me advertise, this is another summer school, which is coming up in September. If you are interested in uh, learning more about this uh, energy harvesting thing, uh, there is this summer school organized by us. It's called Powering the Internet of Things. This is something that we do on a regular basis, and it's uh, about 12 years that we organize them, 12 summer schools in a row. This time it will be uh, between uh, uh, September 15 and September 18. Um, it, uh, it's in presence in theory, but so you can decide if you want to participate in presence, you can come to Peru job fully uh, situation by then will be okay with the COVID. Uh, right now we are in a good position right now, hopefully we'll stay like that uh, also in September. We don't know of course. And, or you can also participate remotely. So yeah your chances, you can take your chances. Uh, now I'm open to questions if there are 
Annie. Okay, thanks, uh, Luca, for the presentation. Um, I'm not sure if I um, have everything I need to manage the question session or if uh, Laura or Anna are supposed to help me. Maybe yes. I'm here. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand or straight away you can unmute. Yeah, I have, I have a question here, Manama. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, when you were talking about um, how can we uh, avoid um, dissipation, and you talked about the constant that uh, gamma gamma constant. Uh, my question is: uh, you said that uh, we can reduce uh, well, the velocity, well, the speed of our body ball, but uh, and you this and you said this because uh, well. We can do this, but uh, but um, the power that the power is in, is um, diminished, right? right? And but I, and my question is: um, to what extent? To what extent um, uh, the power is well? How uh, well or how far uh, we can use this power to power devices, or if this power which is produced. Uh, at least can be used. No, you, you are, you're, uh, this is a question. Uh, it's also actually the main content of my, my talk is the following. Um, these are two, there are two points here. You see in this uh, slide, there are two arrows. Um, let me see if I can. Laser point. Okay, this arrow here mm. tells you how much energy do you need to power your device, and this is not something which is fixed by nature. It's a matter of technology, but it's interesting to know what is the minimum theoretical uh, limit for energy. And then there is this other arrow is that how good you are to transform energy available from the ambient, okay? okay. Now you need to, to bridge this gap and you can improve this uh, side, but you can also improve this side. Now, uh, it's quite surprising, but there are uh, tasks which actually can be performed with uh, arbitrarily low energy. For example, computing is one of these. If you want to do computation, in principle, you could uh, design a computing device that can be operated by spending arbitrarily small amount of energy. That means even zero in principle. So computation does not require uh, a certain minimum amount of energy. The same is true also for communication. This is also quite surprising. If you want to send a message from one point to another, you need to use some energy. And there is a minimum energy required, which by the way was uh, uh, found by uh, Shannon and von Neumann in the 50s. <clears throat> but this minimum energy required is not lost. So it's not dissipated. You need some energy to transfer your message, but then that energy that you invest in sending the message can actually be recovered when the message arrives. So computing and communicating in principle can be done without spending any energy. But if you look at nowadays present devices, you see that actually we are spending huge amount of energies to do computing and communication. So there is still a huge room for improvement, but we need to design a new kind of computers. Okay. All right, thank you so much and thank you for the talk. Thank you. Uh, hi, Duca. Yes. I, have a, uh, I have a curiosity actually. When you started, I, I searched for the term nano, uh, nano energy harvesting because I was not sure if there is micro energy, of course, there can be nano energy. My, my curiosity is, uh, you say like if there are too many um, degree of freedom, there will be too much, uh, much more fluctuation. So is there any uh, such kind of a way that you 
uh, you decrease the degree of freedom for each part and then integrate all together and you have much more like at that time you have the less fluctuation and you can use this um, use this uh, energy or anything as a as a in a bigger amount like I'm not sure if I, I could convey the message it's just my I'm not sure if I understood. Try, yeah, okay. try to, to explain a little bit. Okay. Uh, suppose uh, like you have this micro micro energy harvesting from multiple sources, and uh, okay. you want to integrate them together. Is there any kind of field already there that is doing this, or is there any field that, for from the nanoscale harvesting, you integrate them and use for a further larger scale? No, you, you, okay, you are, um, okay, that's a good question, actually. Um, most of the, the application right now work exactly like this. For example, if you go on the website of our company, the Wise Power, you will see that they are actually commercializing a sensor that is used to monitor uh, buildings, bridges, so they have this sensor that it's a box actually that can be attached to a bridge and this box measure the vibration of the bridge and then they transform, tra uh, transmit this signal to a, a receiver. So you can monitor if the bridge is performing okay, if there is something wrong, especially if, uh, the, the vibration spectrum changes with time, right? <coughs> okay, this kind of device is actually powered not just by one, but at least by two different uh, uh, energy sources. One is light, okay? There is a, 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 a very small solar panel that use photovoltaic effect in order to produce electrical energy. And then it's powered by vibration, okay? So the shaking of the bridge itself. So, this is the very common approach. You have more than one source in which you do energy harvesting, and then you combine these sources in order to use this energy. This is a very uh, delicate aspect. When you combine different energy sources, uh, first of all, you have to transform the energy from solar to electrical, uh, the energy from kinetic vibration to electrical. Then you need some electronics passive electronics in order to combine the signals. Uh, you want the signals to have the same impedance, for example. And then you, you want uh, this uh, signal to have the same impedance with the, the, the storage system. So you feed the electrical energy coming from the solar, electrical energy com coming from the vibration into a capacitor, for example, or, or super capacitor. Nowadays, you can, you can make a small capacitor with pretty high capacitance. And so you can temporarily store energy into the capacitor. And then you need a system that takes this energy from the capacitor and feed it to the, to the device. And all this, of course, has timing involved because these are not synchronous uh, sources. For example, you do not have uh, uh, light in the night. So you need to rely on vibration or on the energy that you store in the day. So this, this is a very common approach. And these aspects are all interesting, a bit technical. Uh, there is really no mystery about that. So you need to know some electronics, uh, uh, but you really, there is not much mystery on, on the combination of these sources. But this is the, the, the usual approach, right? It is. Thank you so much. We have Carolina also. There's a question from Carolina. Uh, yes. Um, so first, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. I just have a quick question about um, kind of the trade-off, as you mentioned, for micro sensors. We, one of the ways to decrease the fluctuations is to decrease the degrees of freedom. So I was thinking, for example, of nanowires, um, thermoelectric nanowires, that you have a lot of thermal fluctuations and that decreases their, their power. Uh, but then uh, also, when you talked about the dissipations, this depends on this constant and or the vibration. So when we decrease the degrees of freedoms, we also uh, increase 
the velocity of the vibrations, don't we? And then there has to be kind of a trade-off or, or this doesn't happen? No, actually, actually you cannot have a trade-off because the number of degrees of freedom uh, is provided by uh, nature, by your system. Yeah. That's not it's something consistent. that you can decrease. What you can do when you make a model, for example, you look at the, the nanowire, okay? A nanowire, even if it's uh, pretty small, so a short nanowire, say, uh, which is uh, say five nanometers uh, in diameter and 500 nanometers in length, okay? Even if it's very small, it has a huge number of degrees of freedom. And even if it's not attached to something else, let's suppose that it's isolated by everything. Even in this case, it has a very large number, a uh, few thousand, 10,000 uh, more uh, degree of freedom, okay? Now, let's suppose that I look at just one of these degree of freedom, for example, the position of the center of mass or uh, the position of the tip of the, the nanowire. Due to the existence of all the nano, of all the, the degree of freedom, if I look at the tip, I will see the tip. If I am at thermal equilibrium, I will see the tip shaking continuously. Okay, mm -hmm. it will shake continuously, and this shaking come from all the other degrees of freedom that I neglected in my in my uh, interest. So if I focus the interest on one degree of freedom, I cannot forget all the other. And how do, can I do without forgetting them? I invent a fluctuating force. That's the idea. Okay. So all the, the idea behind uh, uh, this non-equilibrium statistical mechanics is this one. We invented fluctuating forces in order to uh, take care of the fact that we forgot all the other freedom just by focusing on one of them. And this approach was invented uh, at the beginning of last century by uh, a French physicist called Langevin. He was the first guy who proposed this kind of approach. And uh, uh, it was invented just to explain the, the Brownian motion. And the Brownian motion was properly explained by Albert Einstein in 1905 with a paper on Brownian motion. But the better explanation it came just one year after from Langevin. So Einstein is credited for finding the right equation, and that's true. But the better explanation is due to Langevin, which came actually one year after Einstein. OK. OK. OK, thank you very much. A very nice talk. Okay, so given the time, maybe we can take one last question from uh, Artur Romanov. Okay, okay. Um, so first, um, I really enjoyed how you used the reduced slides um, to convey your message. Uh, I could, I, I was really focused on your words. It was super nice. So a compliment to this. And um, yeah, you were focusing on the energy transformation. Um, I, I found it also interesting when you showed that you got some electrical energy from a bio cell. And uh, this got me thinking and inspired me a little bit. Uh, you also said that <clears throat> we humans are powered by food. Do you see or envision uh, a more efficient way to power us humans? maybe with electrical uh, energy in the future, which is more efficient than just food? Do you know if there, are, <laughs> there is something in development? Well, actually, uh, I, I, would, I would say the, the other way around. I think that the powering us with food is extremely efficient, extremely efficient. It actually, uh, nature took billions of years to develop such an efficient way of powering. And I would like to power electronic devices with food. That would be way more efficient than, uh, than uh, the, the present way of powering electronic devices. And the idea why we, uh, the reason why we were looking at this uh, uh, biological cell as a source of uh, electrical energy is exactly this one. In, in our uh, naive futuristic view, you will have microscale robots which will uh, um, move around uh, um, biological systems like uh, human bodies or animal bodies. 
and uh, we they will get a replacement of that that, that will uh, replenish their energy uh, storage by um, by probing uh, uh, biological cells. So they get electrical energy from biological cells, they move around, they do what they need to do, like uh, medicine or small operation or kill uh, uh, cancer cells, for example. And when they, they, they need more energy, they go back to some other biological cell, they plug in, recharge and do that again. Okay, this is very naive, of course. And there was a movie in the in the sixties. Uh, I'm not sure that you have seen the movie because, um, but I saw the movie few years after it came out. And this is a picture from the movie. It was called the Fantastic Voyage. Okay, I think it came out in sixty-eight or something. Oh, 66, 66. And it was a beautiful movie. It actually. Uh, affected my, uh, say, scientific inclination. I, I, I probably saw it in 68 or 69, something like that. I was, I was very young at the time, but uh, it's the idea of this microscopic thing that goes inside the human body. At the, same, at the certain point, this micro uh, submarine uh, ended uh, the, the um, reservoir of uh, hair. So what they did, they went uh, to a, a, a to the, the uh, I'm missing the, the English word for that. It's okay, the cell where you can find uh, uh, actually a reservoir of hair and they plugged in and they got the hair uh, um, and then uh, so they, they could keep on their mission. Uh, so the idea is, is the following. There is plenty of energy inside the human body. And if you know how to, to probe it, you can actually make micro robots going around. You cannot count on batteries because um, small scale batteries do not last. And uh, moreover, they are, uh, um, they are not compatible with biological tissues. They are very polluting. And uh, so the idea is to use the energy. Uh, this is the very basic idea of energy harvesting, to try to get the energy where it is not to carry the, the energy around with you. Okay, so your <laughs> message is basically- into So I, I, would, I would say the other way around compared to your- Moving the nature, you should learn from it. <laughs> right. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, thanks for all the questions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Luke again for accepting our invitation. Uh, it was a really uh, nice talk, I enjoyed it. Uh, so I think that now another thing that you all will enjoy is your lunch break. Uh, so yeah. also, unless I you're think, gonna... Uh, sorry, I want to ask Luca if he can send us the information about uh, his school. So I can send to all the students. So if you can send, can send us the link, you can yeah. send me an email with the link and I will forward it to the, to the students. Thank you, Luca. <laughs> thank you, Laura. I will do it. And thank you, Ricardo. Okay, thanks, Guy. The session, I guess, is closed unless uh, Laura says otherwise. Yes, I, I will see you after lunch at three thirty. We continue with more technical technical talks this time. So, see you at three thirty. I don't know if you have questions. Now is the time. Questions for me, or if not, if you're in Micmac, you will see me around. <laughs> So see you at 3.30. In chemical science at the Universitat Autònoma de Barcelona in 2001 and obtaining her PhD in 2006 at the Institute of Material Science of Barcelona. In July 2006, he started his postdoctoral work at the University of Oxford, where she worked on electron microscopy imaging and analysis of nanomaterial, such as carbon nanotubes, inorganic nanotubes, and other related materials. She currently led the electron microscopy unit at the ESNR since April 2009. The topic of this talk is about electron microscopy and is entitled Advancing Electron Microscopy for the Study of Functional Materials. When you want, you can start. You have around 20 and 25 minutes. Okay, thank you, Judith. Okay, uh, good afternoon to all. I'm very happy to be here in, uh, in this DOC Farm uh, school. 
And uh, as uh, Judith just mentioned, I'm going to uh, tell you about advanced electron microscopy for the study of functional uh, materials. So uh, the, uh, from what I heard, the audience is quite broad. And I'm sure some of you already know many of the things I'm going to tell. But uh, I try to uh, make a lecture with many examples so that uh, you can have a, a kind of overview of the type of experiments you can do with uh, electron microscopy to study your samples. So uh, very briefly, the outline of the talk, I will uh, give a bit of historia, historical background to put uh, everything a bit on, in context. Then I will uh, talk about electron sample interaction and the types of electron microscopes we have. And I will jump to uh, show you some examples of results. Uh, to finish, uh, mentioning some of the main limitations of the techniques and key factors that you have to take into account uh, when you are uh, using electron microscopy. So electron micros microscopes were developed to overcome the limitations of light microscopes. So here you can see this is the, the uh, expression of the diffraction limit of uh, resolution given by Abe, where you have uh, the relation of the resolution with the wavelength of the incident beam. So uh, if you use uh, light uh, as an incident beam, like in optical microscopy, the wavelength of, of light is approximately around uh, 500 nanometers. And there, therefore, the resolution of light is going to be around uh, 300 nanometers. This allows you to study uh, specimens like cells, bacteria, but you, don't, you cannot uh, get to see viruses or molecules or smaller stuff like nanoparticles. Therefore, uh, if you check uh, which is the, oh, oh, sorry, the, the uh, wavelength of the electron is uh, in the order of a few picometers. And therefore, theoretically, the resolution of an electron microscope is gonna be in the order of uh, the picometer. I say theoretically because uh, then in practice, there are many other things that are limiting the resolution of the microscopes not, is not only given by the wavelength of the electrons, but uh, you can see at least, which is the comparison with, between the, com the theoretical resolution of an op optical microscope and uh, an ele ele electronic microscope. So uh, uh, with this in mind, uh, Ruska and Noll uh, in 1931 developed the first TM. Here you can see a, a picture where they were, they were uh, building it, and this is, uh, these are some lab, lab notes uh, that they took. And for this development, uh, Ruska got the Nobel Prize in 1986, uh, like 50 years later, together with Binning and, and Roger that uh, developed the STM. Uh, here I, can show, I want to show you this graph that relates the resolution of the microscopes and time. And you can see, as I said, in, in the, this is the blue curve is the resolution that uh, light microscopy was having. And then with the introduction of electron microscopes, we got a jump in the resolution, uh, exponential jump that reached kind of a plateau around uh, four angstrom's resolution. This was achieved uh, using um, very high voltage microscopes. Uh, they, they could have even uh, 3 million volts. Uh, accelerating, accelerating voltage. And now we are in a new area, era in electron microscopy. And this uh, is uh, because, the, the, because of the uh, development of aberration correction of the lenses of the microscope. And this uh, has led to a jump in the resolution again. And now we are achieving sub angstrom resolution in the, in the most modern uh, microscope. Uh, just uh, a graph uh, to exemplify again uh, the comparison between light microscopy and electron microscopy. Um, uh, with light microscopy, you're gonna be able to see things like uh, well, the thickness of a human hair, the blood cell or a bacteria. But if you want to see something below that, below the nanometer range, then you really need electron microscopes like uh, to see like viruses or uh, DNA molecules glucose molecules, or even atoms. So um, I was uh, comparing briefly, uh, or discussing about uh, optical microscopy and, and uh, electron microscopy. And there are uh, many 
important differences. And uh, one of the main difference is that in an electron microscope, we are using electrons. And therefore, the source of the beam is going to be an electron gun. This is the part of the microscope where the electrons are produced and they are accelerated uh, to a high potential. And uh, the gun will provide us with a large stable current in a very small electron beam. Uh, there are different types of guns, uh, like the tungsten filament or the LAB6. These are thermionic guns. And also uh, we have uh, field emission guns, we have, which have a uh, higher brightness, but they, have, they are more stringent in terms of vacuum. Uh, in, in, in the microscope. Uh, another important difference is uh, concerning vacuum, in, in, in fact. Uh, so in, in uh, optical microscopy, you can work in normal atmosphere, whereas in an electron microscope, in conventional electron microscopy at least, you will work under vacuum, under uh, high vacuum conditions. So why you need that? You need the electrons to behave as light. You, you don't want them to be reaching Go, coming from the gun and reaching your sample, and uh, you want them to go straight there and not uh, getting scattered in the way because they are uh, meeting with other particles that are in the in the in the atmosphere. Also, uh, vacuum is needed for some of the detectors and lenses, and also helps reduce contamination buildup that you can get uh, during the your experiment. And another very important difference is uh, concerning the lenses. So in, uh, in electron microscopy, you are using, instead of glass lenses that you use in, in optical microscopy, you will use um, electromagnetic lenses. So these lenses will manipulate the trajectory of the beam. They will compress it and, and uh, will focus it. And, uh, and then so that it, this beam cross, crosses the electron optical column. So uh, the electromagnetic lenses have aberrations and, and they are not perfect. And uh, the aberrations, uh, some of the aberrations are the stigmatism, spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. So stigmatism is, is quite straightforward to, to correct and you can do it in the microscope itself, but uh, spherical aberration and, and chromatic aberration are more difficult. And in fact, the uh, development of the correctors of these aberrations is what uh, is making uh, the, the resolution of the microscope jump uh, at the moment. So we are uh, just uh, below the, the angstrom. Um, I'm talking about the special resolution and I want to, to make a comment on it. So uh, as I said before, the resolution of the microscope is gonna be related to the wavelength of the electron beam. And the wavelength of the electron beam is inversely proportional to the uh, voltage that the electrons are accelerated at. Therefore, if we increase the voltage of acceleration, it's going to decrease the wavelength. And if we decrease the wavelength, it's going to decrease the resolution, which, in fact, if you decrease the number of resolution, in fact, you are getting a better resolution. Therefore, uh, if, we, if we need to get a better resolution in our experiments, one thing we have to take into account is that if, if we can increase the operating voltage if the equipment allows, this, allows it, and, uh, and it will improve the resolution. So the operating voltage is one of the parameters you can play when you are uh, working in the microscope. So let me tell you about what happens when the electrons interact with the sample. So we have an incident beam that reaches to the sample and there are a number of signals that are coming out simultaneously from the sample that are coming from different um, tra transference uh, of, of the electrons. So we'll have uh, secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, X-rays, visible light if, if the sample is luminescent and also OGA electrons. If the sample is thin enough, the incident beam will be able to cross, uh, to go across it, and uh, we'll have some signal coming also below the sample. So we'll have the direct beam that didn't have any change, but we will also have some elastically scattered electrons um, and some inelastically scattered electrons that have lost some energy. So uh, we have all these signals coming out from our sample, and, and, and happening at once. And, uh, and then we can collect them. And we have several detectors to, to do that uh, now. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, we can uh, use a secondary electron detector or backscatter electron detector. And these are detectors that we normally will have in, a, in an SEM, in a scanning and electron microscope. And this will give us information of on the topography of the sample, on the morphology of the sample, and uh, with the backscattered electrons, also we will have images with chemical contrast. Uh, on the other hand, if the, the, we, we collect the signal that goes through the sample, we will, we will do that in a, in a transmission electron microscope or a scanning transmission electron microscope. And we will have information such as the, the internal structure of the sample, its crystalline structure, elemental composition, uh, and also of oxidation states. And uh, last but not least, we can also correct, collect the X-rays that are coming from the sample or the cathode luminescence, and um, we will get information on the composition or the optical properties. These uh, um, signals can be collected either in an SEM or in a TM. So uh, what, to, what it's clear then is that with uh, electron microscopy, we will be able to understand the relationship between the structure of our sample and its properties. So I just mentioned there are different types of electron microscopes. We have the scanning electron microscope, the transmission electron microscope, where the, we are collecting the, sound, the, the signal transmitted through the sample. And there are also dedicated uh, scanning transmission electron microscopes. These are more scars, but uh, the dedicated ones, but this technique, scanning transmission electron microscopy, is also available in STMs and in TMs. So you need some uh, special detectors, uh, but, but you can do it in both type of microscopes as well. So let me tell you a bit about the differences between TM and STM. So we know they both work with electrons, they both work under vacuum, and, and uh, they, they, they have electromagnetic lenses. These are things that they have in common, but they have some differences as well. So the first of all is the electron beam. In, in the case of TM, the, the electron beam is uh, directed to the sample as a broad static beam that is illuminating a large area. Whereas in the SEM, the beam will be focused in a very fine point, And this point is going to be scanned along the sample line by line. So for you to understand more or less uh, what does it mean, you can think of as it, uh, if you were getting into a room which is dark and you can switch on the light and then you will have like TM, so you illuminate a large area or you can get a torch and you can illuminate the walls no? line by line, the whole room. And at the end, if you record all these lines, at the end you will have the image of the of the, of the room as well. So this is the difference uh, between uh, how the beam is in TM and STM is a comparison. Um, what else? The operating voltages. So I, I told you the operating voltage is one of the important parameters in electron microscopy. And in TM, the voltages that you are going to use are much higher. They range normally, they, they, there are always exceptions, but normally, uh, from 60 to 300 kilovolts, whereas in SCM, the voltage is much, much lower. It goes from around 100 volts to 30 kilovolts, more or less. What does it mean? I already uh, told you that uh, the, the, the resolution is going to be related to the electron, uh, to the operating voltage. So in principle, or in general, PMs have a better resolution than SCM. Concerning the sample, so in, in transmission electron microscopy, we need the, the beam to cross, uh, to go through the sample. Therefore, the specimen must be very thin. Very thin means uh, 100, 200 nanometers, not, not much thinner. Otherwise, uh, the electrons don't go through. Okay, and normally they are mounted in this type of grids. This is a copper grid that has like a carbon layer, very thin carbon layer on top. And therefore, you deposit your sample, your nanoparticles or your, uh, your particles or whatever you, you have. And, uh, and in solution, you can deposit it in this grid. Uh, keep in mind that the diameter of this grid is three millimeters in diameter. So they are really tiny. 
and in fact they are they they are very easy to bend. So uh, they are uh, the samples are very very small. In contrast, in SCL, uh, you don't really have much limitations on the size of the sample. The, the wide range of specimens is allowed. Uh, it's uh, as long as it fits into the chamber. Normally, uh, you can you can work with them. So the, the the size of the sample can be in the centimeter range. Okay, and the only limitation is that normally you will you need them to be conductive. So if they are not conductive, uh, one a strategy to visualize them is, is uh, coating them with uh, platinum or carbon or gold, for instance. Uh, concerning the images, uh, the imaging uh, in TM, uh, you already mentioned the electrons must go through the sample and trans be transmitted uh, through the specimen. Whereas in STM, the information will be collected near the surface of the specimen. So we're going want to get information of the outside, more um, the outside of the specimen, whereas in TM, we're going to get information of the internal part of the specimen. And uh, yeah, concerning the rendering of the images, uh, in TM, uh, these uh, transmitted electrons are focused uh, collectively uh, by the objective lens, and then they are magnified to create an image, whereas in SCM, you are building the image line by line. So um, let me show you some examples because a uh, picture is worth a thousand words. And I think it will be much easier to, to understand uh, what I'm explaining if, if I show you examples. Okay, so uh, some examples by STM. As I said before, with uh, secondary electrons, we're gonna uh, study topography of the sample and morphology. So uh, here, for instance, you have uh, uh, the, the image of a, in, uh, of an inclined or tilted uh, sample of uh, that has been nanostructured. Uh, in, the, in the middle, we have some uh, mops, and you can see the shape, the size, the homogene, if they are homogeneous or not uh, in the sample. And here, for instance, you have a, a, an image um, of graphene, graphene flakes. And um, when you want to work with very thin samples, you need to think about the voltage, as I, I said before. And it's, uh, in, it's interesting to work at low voltages, around 2 kV or 1 kV. Uh, why? Because then the electrons are not penetrating so much into the sample, and you get more surface information, less radiation damage, and then uh, less charging artifacts. So working at low voltages also is, is convenient for samples that charge a lot. Uh, what else can you do in an SCM? So you can do compositional imaging. So if you collect the signal uh, by with a backscatter the electron de detector, you can get images where the intensity is, is related to the composition. So this in, on the left, we have the secondary electron image of this sample of silica, which is uh, coated with platinum. And on the right image, we can see areas of the particle which are much brighter. Uh, than others, here is, is not bright. And this is due to the platinum. So we can, just with the image, we can uh, uh, relate where we have the platinum in our sample. Other things you can do, you can do dynamic experiments in, in an STM. So uh, this is not for any STM. So you need to have an environmental STM where you can change the pressure inside the, the chamber. And uh, for instance, I will show you an example of ice formation inside the microscope, if I manage. Let me change the pointer thing. Uh, I know I don't, I cannot do it. Uh, ah, no, no. Okay, so for instance, here uh, you can change the humidity inside the chamber and, uh, with, uh, and then with a Peltier cell that cools the sample, we can see uh, in situ, the growth of ice on, on the surface of our sample. Uh, another example, we can also do heating uh, if we have a furnace, no? A small furnace. In our case, we have a furnace that reaches uh, 1,000 degrees. And, uh, and here there are some capsules. You can see the image at 25 degrees. And when increasing the temperature, you can see that uh, the, some of the capsules have uh, exploded. And this helps uh, understand the behavior of these samples uh, with temperature. 
So this is with regards to STM. Now let me show you some examples on TM. So as I said before, TM, you are crossing through the samples, so you will see the internal structure. So for instance, here there are some uh, cortial particles of uh, an iron oxide and, and silica around it. You see the size, but uh, you see the size of the external part, but also of the, of the internal part. This is an image of the ultrastructure of, uh, of a cell. But if you magnify and, and in the team, you, you have um, higher capacity of magnification, uh, you can even reach crystallographic information on your sample. So for instance, here we have, I, let me put the pointer again, um, pointer. So here we have a, a sample of uh, titanium, um, strontium titanate with uh, niobium on top of uh, lanthanum oxide. And we can see a studied interface and we can see the crystal structure and see if there are defects on the sample. So this is one of the most important application of, of TM. You can also study the crystallography of your sample by electron diffraction. And this is an example of an electron diffraction pattern of, of silicon. And uh, I talk about STM, TM. Now let me uh, show you some examples of scanning transmission electron microscopy. Why would you use that? So uh, there is a special detector in, in this technique, uh, which is the high angle angular dark field detector, which will provide us with a Z contrast images. Okay, so let me show you an example. Here we have, for instance, as an image, a TM image of a polymer that has a five nanometer uh, quantum dots. And we can see like there are some dark spots, but it's, well, it's a bit tricky to, to know exactly if, if there are our sample or not. But if we go to HADAP STEM, we can see very clearly where the, the quantum dots uh, are because they are much brighter uh, with, re with regards of, uh, to the polymer, which is basically carbon in its, its zinc ray. Another example is this is a sample of uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles uh, that have, uh, it's a matrix that has uh, some uh, gold nanoparticles. And if we look at the TM image, it's almost impossible to see where the gold is uh, because uh, there are many different uh, contrasts involved. Whereas in the HADAP STEM image, we can see some much brighter particles in the matrix, which I will magnify so that you see better. And here you can see uh, these brighter particles have to be, um, have to have uh, a different composition, uh, um, be denser, and therefore they appear uh, brighter. So we can, we can know that these are the gold uh, just uh, with the image. So other things you can do in, in electron microscopes. So you can, of course, do a spectroscopy. There are two different techniques to do that. You have uh, EDX um, and EELS. So EDX, uh, I show an example here, will tell us the composition. Uh, you can do like a point analysis in your sample and it will tell us the composition of the sample. Uh, every um, element has a, a specific position in the EDX uh, spectrum. And this is something you can do either in the TM or in the STM, whereas EELS, uh, where I'm show, uh, here I'm showing a graph, this is an iron oxide, and we can see the, the core, um, the, the, the graph for uh, iron. Uh, so this is something you can only do in, in uh, a TM. Belen, also, you have one minute. Okay, okay. I'm <laughs> running. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, also other things you can uh, check depending on the composition. You can also even uh, study oxidation states and, and coordination. And you can also do uh, compositional maps and profiles. So for instance, this is a meteorite where they wanted to study where the sulfur and the nickel was. And you can see it very clear with the map. And also this is a core uh, shell um, iron oxide and manganese oxide particle, nanoparticle. The, we don't have the scale bar, but it was around 30 nanometers. And you can see it in, in atomic resolution. So I will jump this, just saying that all these type of experiments, they, we can uh, we have the, the, the option to do them in campus. We have uh, this equipment in, at the ICN2, but there are several other equipment uh, in, in, in ICMAP, CNM, in the Autonoma uh, that can do this type of experiments. And I just wanted to mention that in, in the next uh, few months, 
we will have a new uh, microscope, an aberration corrected microscope uh, that will have a resolution below uh, one angstrom, even at low voltages. We'll have a monochromator, so we'll have a very, very good energy resolution and will allow us to do experiments such as uh, the ones I show here. So, so fun, strong resolution imaging, like in this uh, graphene um, flake that they can see the, the, where the every carbon is and the defects in the carbon or atomic scale spectroscopy, atom by atom, you can see the composition. And just very briefly, let's see if I, I will uh, still one minute, but uh, just as I want to say some limitations because I show you what you can do, but I want you to have in mind what are the limitations of the techniques? First of all, the most, probably the most important one is sampling. So you are studying a very small portion of the sample. So in order to jump into conclusions, check different areas of the sample and also try to correlate it to other bulk techniques. Uh, also interpretation of the images. Uh, there are different processes that can contribute to the contrast. And also in transmission, you are seeing the projection uh, of the sample in honor to the image. Therefore, you have to take into account that seeing something is not believing it. It can, it can have different interpretations. Uh, concerning specimen preparation, I told you it's, it's very important, especially for TM, but it can induce artifacts. So uh, when, whenever possible, limit it as much as you can. And if you cannot, uh, if you have to prepare the sample for the microscope, taking, keep in mind which, which processes you have done and if they can have altered uh, your your sample and uh, last but not least um, beam damage so the electron beam can interact with your sample and will interact with it and it can change uh, its structure and the chemistry so when you are observing a sample in fact you are changing it so uh, just to finish when you want to face uh, a characterization first thing what information you need in, in depending on the information you need, you can choose one technique of the, or, or another one. Also think about the size of your sample, if it needs to be prepared for the, for the, for the analysis, if you, and, and then you can think of the techniques that there are available, that there are many. And also if your sample is gonna be beam sensitive. And, uh, and with this, I, want to, I will finish. And uh, if you have any question, I will be happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Very nice talk, Belen. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, maybe have time for one or two questions. There are some questions. That is, uh, we have, Judy, you, you can see the hands. The... Okay, yes. Vale. Uh, uy, multas hands. Mona Lisa. <laughs> Mona Lisa, you can, you can ask if you want. Okay. Uh, are you getting me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. It's a lot of uh, knowledge we gathered. Uh, so you, quest, uh, you mentioned about the TEM, the specimens uh, have to be very thin. Yes. And also at the very last slide, you mentioned it has to be from microns to the Armstrong. Uh, could you comment uh, like value a number? The, um, Sorry, uh, uh, the, you... the size of the thickness of the sample. Exactly, exactly. So, in fact, the thinner it is, the better, but it's in the order, the thickness, it should be in the order, it, it will depend on the material because it's not the same to work with um, carbon carbon materials uh, that uh, that are not very dense, that with gold, no, you cannot have the same thickness for, for the material, but normally uh, it's, it's said that in between a few hundred nanometers, so below 100 nanometer, if you want to get high resolution TM images, so to see like crystalline structure, and uh, if you don't need that, it can be thicker, but uh, just, yeah, 100, 200 nanometers thickness. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, Razia, Batul, please. Can you ask? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Velen, for a very informative talk. I have only one question. Um, I think it's very basic, but I don't know about it. Um, I wanted to know which samples need to be coated before um, putting in a SAM for analyzing. Is it necessary to coat all the samples or there is a specific reason, there is a specific uh, criteria to coat, coat them? Okay, so to coat the samples, if the, if the sample uh, is not conductive, you will need to coat them in principle. So, so the general strategy is to coat it to, to make it conductive. 
Uh, but um, there are strategies if you cannot code your sample for any reason, there are strategies to avoid coding it. Uh, and then uh, you can either work uh, in, in uh, low vacuum conditions, or you can also work at very low voltages. And sometimes there are samples that uh, in, in conventional conditions uh, would charge under, under, the, under the beam, but uh, with these special conditions will not charge. But in principle, in general, if the sample is not conductive, the best, the easiest, is to coat it, and then you you analyze it at high vacuum conditions. Thank you. Okay, the next questions, please. Wait. Yes, you can ask. So I, I have I'm interesting I'm interested about the the ions, no the oxidation states of the samples that you can tell by I think TM right. Same. Okay. Yes, my yields. Like if we, so if, if I have an iron oxide partic particles, which like uh, there are two phases, either macimide or magnetite, which they are like having uh, the same crystal structure, yeah. you would be able to tell apart whether they have an uh, between the oxidation state of two positive and three positive, something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the oxidation state is, um, it's, kind of easy or more straightforward to see for some elements for, than for others. For instance, for iron, it's possible to see, and there are many studies on the oxidation state of iron. And uh, it's um, the elements that are easier to study, the, the oxidation state are elements that have very uh, sharp white lines. So uh, the, the signal, there are different signals in the ELS spectrum, but if you have a sharp uh, signal, uh, it's, then normally it's, it's quite, uh, it's, it is, it's, possible to study it. And then um, if you, if I can show you the, um, oh, let me, oh, let me, I, no. Well, uh, if you have the, I, I don't know what I did, I oh, know. If you have the, um, what is it? Ah, here. So here uh, you have the L3 and the, and do you see it? The L, uh, let me make this bigger. This is the L3 and the L2 lines of the, of the iron. And the, if you do, if you study the relation, the ratio between these two lines, uh, you will get a number. And this number can be related to a reference. And then you can see if, if, it's, um, if it relates to the iron oxide, the magne, magnemite or, or the magnetite. So you can compare and, and check the oxidation state in, in your sample yet. Thank you. Pues, uh, so thank you, Belen, for your talk, and you. pass to the next one. Thank you very okay. much, Belen. Okay, goodbye. Have a nice goodbye. afternoon. Bye. I will stop this and leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Just there. One is Neus. Is Neus sí. sí. connected? No. I think so. I'm here. Can you hear me? Ah, now. Okay. Okay. The second technical talk is given by Dr. Neus Domingo, research of the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Uh, Dr. Neus Domingo obtained her, her, degree, her degree in physics and her PhD at the University of Barcelona in 2000 and 2005, respectively, respectively. Later on, she joined in the Instituto de Estructura de la Materia in Rome between 2005 and 2007. And in 2008, she began working in the ISEIN-2 as a Juan de la Cierva Research. And in 2011, she joined the Oxide Nanophysics Group with a Ramón y Cajal Research Grant. When you want, you can start. You have around 20, 25 minutes. Thank you, Neus. Okay, thank you, Judith, for this nice presentation. Let me try to share the screen and hopefully everything will run smoothly. So I think you shall already be able to see it. Do you? I guess if I don't receive any, any negative response, I will assume no, you it's see. It's okay, Neus. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. So I will take the opportunity this afternoon to introduce you to the world of atomic force microscopy. Uh, because let me call it a world, because I either think it's not only a technique, uh, it is really a nanolab. 
So I will try to give you some hints of what can be done there and, and the basics behind the, the very basic operation of AFM so that you can realize which is the potential of this tool. And you can think even on, on how you could use it or what kind of things uh, you, could, you could think on trying to measure that, that might be interesting for you. Um, let me first introduce you uh, uh, when the AFM came into the world, right? Uh, if you remember back in, in the 80s, there was the invention of STM, which resulted to be the key tool to the development of AFM, because in order to sense what you will see that is a cantilever that is the, or proof that is the basics behind this, this force microscopy, um, the first time that they tried to sense that was with an STM uh, microscope. So it was indeed an STM microscope mounted on top of an AFM with a lot of development of this atomic force microscopy. So they received um, the Nobel Prize in, in 86 for the invention of STM and then later on uh, also for the invention of uh, AFM. And very soon after that, they already implemented this tool, not to measure topography, not to measure only atoms, but also to start measuring functional properties, straightforward functional properties. And that's what makes STM really, uh, AFM really powerful. In this case, uh, it was the development, the development of magnetic force microscopy. So they realized that one of the forces that are interesting and easy to, to, to catch up at the nanoscale might be magnetic forces. So they did, and magnetic force microscopy was the first, one of the first most to be developed. Um, that was kind of even before the development of the technique itself for topography. Uh, so besides using a cantilever or a proof to send a surface, we can play with how are we moving this proof and we will see that. So uh, there was a development of, of what is called dynamic AFM, dynamic uh, atomic force microscopy in different modes, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation AFM. Uh, it took some, some years and later on tuning fork, which is also a kind of resonance mode of AFM that has uh, a very high sensitivity in frequency. And then uh, by 1995, they already achieved the true atomic resolution in atomic force microscopy. So atomic force microscopy allows to really catch up single atoms. I think I will not go into, let's say, which is the highest resolution of AFM. I will focus on what a uh, wide range of characteristic and functional properties can you catch up with an AFM? No, no, how, how small can you go? Because you can't really go very small. Okay, but we'll focus on the other part. Um, later on, at the end of 90s, for example, there was um, the development of uh, other type of functional um, uh, functional modes of AFM, such as PFM. That, that's, uh, I, I put this one because it, this is my the field I'm working on. And, and it combines two things, which is contact mode with functional properties and resonant properties, so it was kind of interesting. And we can say that by the turn of the, of the century, um, a whole bunch of modes were already going on, and the combination of different type of magnitudes was already into the playground in different research labs in order to, to, to study different functional properties with atomic force microscopy and with high resolution at the nanoscale. And we can say that it coincides also with the development of market tools. So by the turn of the century, we already had a, a technique that was well developed in the research level, in the, develop, in, the, in the innovation level, so in labs, but also became into the market. So it was available for a huge uh, number of labs. And this turned to be one of the essential tools for the development of nanoscience, right? So, so all this happened uh, at, the, at the back of the last century. What has happened from 2000 to here? Of course, it has evolved a lot. So we have really understand in depth what we are doing when we are oscillating a cantilever at the nanoscale, where, when we are using this as a nano resonator and how this interacts with the environment and how to pick up and isolate different type of forces from this movement of this resonator at the nanoscale. And we have, we have done this by playing with multi-frequency by, by understanding that this is indeed a violin. It's a complex thing when it vibrates. So, so you can indeed have many different frequencies playing around. And we have also understood that this can be a nano sensor, nano proof to press on the surface, to even to touch, I mean, to indent the surface, to touch it deeply to, and, and to, to, uh, to work into, into the mechanics of the materials at the nanoscale as well. So many things have happened. We have advanced a lot. And, um, and I will try to give you an overview of everything that can be done. 
But let me put the focus. So we call scanning proof microscopies. Um, that name embraces any microscope, any scanning um, uh, microscope that uses whatever kind of proof to sense things at the nanoscale. And into this big family, we can already find two different families, I would say. One is uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, and the other is atomic force microscopy in all its modes. And uh, I would say that nowadays we are working into or, or um, and the trends are going into an hybridation of, uh, I would say, atomic force microscopy uh, combined with radiation techniques, with light, okay? And this would be kind of third family of them. So the main difference is that in uh, scanning tunneling microscopy, we are using electrons to sense the surface. So we are using current to sense the surface, while in atomic force microscopy, we are playing with all type of forces in order to sense uh, a surface, okay? Um, what kind of forces? The point, that's the advantage, and that's, that's also somehow the disadvantage of atomic force microscopy, is that at the nanoscale, we have all forces available, all types of them. So this is like a, a four by four, right? So uh, probably it's um, atomic force microscopy, it's very good in order to um, play with functional properties, but the point is that you always sense all the forces that are present there. All you can try to do is minimize the ones you are not interested in. And that's the main fight of the development of atomic force microscopy. Uh, kind of trying to simplify, the first and main thing that you can sense with an AFM, with an atomic force microscopy, are mechanical forces. And here, for example, we have friction forces. We can play with the friction between the tip and the surface in order to sense, for example, chemical interactions, in order to sense the adhesion of the surface. We can indent. Um, uh, materials in order to see how hard are they, polymers, uh, uh, also strong materials in order to check their, their uh, hardness, their stiffness, their uh, toughability, whatever. But then there are some modes that are also play with these mechanical forces that uh, take advantage of resonating in the surface, for example, such as contact resonance force microscopy. And this also gives information about uh, mechanical properties at the nanoscale, or for example, uh, um, atomic uh, amplitude modulation force modulation AFM, that it's an amazing tool to get viscoelasticity mapping at the nanoscale without indenting materials. And that's very interesting, for example, for polymers. Uh, but we can also sense or play with mechanical forces. The standard atomic force microscopy mode to do that is MFM. But you can think on more complex ways to, uh, to take advantage and play with these magnetic forces. For example, if at the end of your AFM tip, you are able to nanopattern your tip, we will see the tips later on, but you are able to nanopattern your tip and install a, a whole sensor at the end of uh, the tip, then you can really pick up magnetic fluxes instead of playing with magnetic forces, right? So there's, for example, the scanning hole proof microscopy. You need complex uh, tips in that case, right? Uh, but there is also the scanning squid. If instead of a whole sensor at the end of your tip, you, you manage to build a real uh, squid sensor there. But besides that, you can also play with a magnetic force between a tip and the sample while the system is irradiated with microwaves. And in this case, you can take advantage of, the, of um, microwave resonance, uh, magnetic resonance for microscopy, because at the gigahertz, you may find some resonances of spins. And then you can, by playing with these microwaves, tune the magnetic interaction between tip and sample by making it resonate. And lately, there has been a lot of uh, effort in developing, and this is already in the market, what is called nitrogen vacancy force microscopy, that indeed it takes advantage of a nitrogen vacancy in a diamond tip in order to be able to send magnetic forces with the highest resolution up to now achieved. Uh, but not only magnetic or mechanical forces, we can also think on electric forces and electronic characterization. Uh, for example, you have elect electric um, force microscopy. You also have Kelvin proof force microscopy. This is very amazing uh, mode of operating. But you can also think on measuring directly the capacitance between your tip and the sample. You can use your tip as a top mobile electrode and then do whatever you could do with your micro proof station, but at the nanoscale and just locating the sample, locating the tip exactly in the point you want from the sample. So if you think that your AFM tip can be a top mobile electrode, 
whatever electronic measurement that you can think on can be implemented at a nanoscale. Similar, you can use this nano electrode uh, on the surface for sending microwaves. And then if you implement the right circuit behind your tip, you can pick up uh, microwave resonances at the nanoscale. And of course, you can pick up currents, conductive AFM. And conductive AFM, of course, can be very interesting, for example, to play with light in photo cells and sense how conductivity changes when you put light or when you remove light or simply measuring the dispersion or the, the conductivity point on your surface. Anything that can be done at the macro scale with, with, a, with an electrode can be done at the nanoscale with an AFM tip in contact mode. Uh, and we can do also some more complex thing that, that is to play with electromechanical forces. And here, for example, comes piezo electricity. You know, the piezo electricity combines electric fields with, with deformations. So either you deform the sample and measure an electric field or the other way around. Everything can be done there under your AFM tip. And if you think on even more complex things, you can also think on scanning thermal microscopy, for example, by putting a, a, a bridge stone bridge just next to your AFM tip and being able to measure the change of the temperature of your tip, right? Or you can play with light in scanning near field optical microscopy and take advantage of the dispersion of light that happens at the nanoscale around this AFM tip that, that uh, works as a singularity and that helps to decrease the resolution of optical light down to the nanoscale. And finally, if you make it still more complex and you would try to functionalize your tip with chemical terminations, um, you can play with um, chemical force microscopy by looking how your molecules on your tip interact with the surface and playing with that, right? So I, I really spent a lot of time on this slide because I think that this is what really expresses what, what the world is there behind atomic force microscopy. Among all these techniques still, there are some transversal, let's say hot points, such as the multifrequency. Multifrequency means that your finger, your resonator, this that holds the tip can be operated in, a, in, in very complex modes, right? And this can happen for any of these modes, whatever, try, whatever magnitude you're trying to measure, you can play with this multifrequency. But also you can do spectroscopy, for example, that is see how these properties change as a function of something else. Uh, then lithography, uh, if you apply an electric field and you oxidize selectively the surface, that's nanolithography. You can switch the, the functional properties at the nanoscale, but all, by also using this, this finger, this nanoscale finger. And you can play with dissipation control. You can do all these measurements in different environments. That means vacuum, that means as a function of temperature, that means in control atmosphere, as a function of relative humidity, and also as of, at different scanning speeds. So all these transversal developments can be combined with all these advanced modes. And I think I will have now to run for the rest of the conference, but I thought it was important just to put the focus here. Let's go simple now. Let's go now to the basics of an AFM so that whenever they, call, they told you about SPM, you know that you, you can measure many different things, but the, which is the basics behind this? The basics behind this is that you have a cantilever. This is what, what I call my finger. And at the end of the cantilever, there is a very sharp tip. Uh, this sharp, this finger can be either worked in contact or, or just, you know, having a finger, or you can make this finger become a violin, for example, or an electrical drum, whatever, make it vibrate. That's what we call dynamic. Uh, what do you need? You need to be able to sense this finger and you need to be able to move this finger. So essentially you need some, some uh, scanners that move the sample in X, Y, and Z with enough resolution. You need some feedback because you need to move your finger on the surface in a controlled way, and you need to be able to sense that. That's essentially what we need. How do we measure this cantilever? How do we see how our finger moves? Uh, there are different modes. There are different operations. For example, the first one, I, as I mentioned, was uh, to put an STM right on top of the finger, right, in order to sense how the finger was moving. That was the first development of AFM. Well, nowadays, the most um, widely used is this optical methodology in which we are sending a laser on top of our cantilever, and then we are picking up the reflection of this laser with a photodiode. But you can think on other methods in order to detect the movement of this finger. So uh, in this optical beam 
microscopy or optical beam detection, what we essentially do is we shine this laser onto the cantilever and when our cantilever moves, that makes the reflection onto the photodiode change. And one would think, okay, but will this be enough? Yes, it is kind of enough because uh, just by assuming small displacements um, of the cantilever and by, by having a kind of few numbers on the geometry of a typical AFM, one can see that the displacement of the cantilever uh, of the reflection of the laser on top of the photodiode might be enough with classical parameters, might be enough to pick up changes of the order of Armstrong's and below Armstrong's on the surface. So yes, just by putting a laser, we will be very sensitive to the movement of this cantilever. And then the rest of the thing will be just to detect this and convert this mechanical oscillation signal with a photodiode into some electrical signal and manage it with your or computer. And here probably is with all is where uh, nowadays all the or during the last couple of decades most of the effort has been done on what to do with the signal, right, and and how to play with it. But not not on the development of proofs and sensing. This has been pretty steady during this time. What is the next critical step? Is there a feedback? So if we have to move our finger, now, now we know how our finger moves, but now we need to move it with some reason. And here is where, where the dynamic and, and, and static contact modes comes in. Okay, so the feedback, that is the rules that we will tell by, with our computer to the finger in order to tell it how to move, are based on these uh, feedback loops. Okay, so this would be the... the, the <laughs> let's say generic scheme. I, I wanted to put this scheme for those of you who really like electronics. Uh, if you just care about science, just don't worry too much. Uh, but it, it's good that you see that. So mainly we will have in general for standard AFM, uh, we will have three magnitudes of our interest. One is the deflection of the cantilever. If we are working in a static mode, that means that our finger is just touching the surface and as it touches the surface, it bends. And the other two, or three uh, parameters that uh, might be of our interest is if we are making our finger or cantilever move up and down, resonate, uh, we need to know either the amplitude and phase with which is, it is resonating, it is moving, or measure the frequency at which is it, it is resonating. And then depending on which of these parameters are using, we can use them as different feedback loops and then work in the different modes. So th that's, that's pretty simple in this sense. So either you have amplitude, frequency, amplitude and phase, frequency, or deflection, and that's it. Good. Um, atomic force microscopy. I told you that all forces are involved in any measurement that you are doing. But if we go zoom in and, and we go close to the surface, we can distinguish, let's say, two regimes of forces. So one regime of forces that we call repulsive, that is, when our tip is really very close to the surface and we are entering into the uh, uh, elastic or plastic deformation of the sample that is well, let's say, into the surface. Close to the surface, we still have repulsive interaction by these short range Van der Waals forces. And then in the region close to, uh, just right slightly above to the surface, we may have capillary forces. Th th there is, where it goes crazy, but but luckily it's, it's in a short range, let's say, that is around one millimeter, uh, one nanometer uh, above the surface. Uh, capillary forces can be can be uh, annoying for, for a bit longer. And then uh, long or at a long distance away from the surface, it's where we can still sense electromagnetic uh, forces without, for example, sensing Van der Waals forces. So even if we have a magnetic sample, of course, at the surface, we will also have magnetic forces, magnetic interactions there. But if we go away from the surface, we probably will only have magnetic forces surviving because these are the, the long range ones. So we, we will play with this, let's say, uh, range of um, distances in which the forces are active in order to, set, to be selective and to identify or to look for different functional properties that we might be interested in. So if we... Uh, work with our finger, with our cantilever in what we call static or contact mode, essentially what we are measuring is the deflection, that is the bending of this cantilever, that will be proportional to the stiffness of the cantilever or to the force that we are applying, whatever, right? 
what, what establishes the correlation between the deformation, the force, and, and the bending is the Hughes law. So if we are using very strong cantilevers, then in order to achieve some measurable deformation, we will have to apply strong force and probably we will damage the sample and the other way around. If we have very sensitive samples, then just by decreasing the cantilever stiffness, uh, by applying a very small force, it will already bend the format and we will be able to sense it. And it works essentially as the old plays um, you know, machines to play music, right? Uh, it, it, it's physically <laughs> almost the same. And even, uh, and even the sizes are, uh, you know, we're a bit smaller than that, but they were, they were really <laughs> precise by the time because the, 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 the shape of this tip was about 25 micrometers and now we are down to 50 nanometers, right? But, but you know, it's still interesting. Uh, what, what matters in this case, in contact mode, if we are working in contact mode, is the characteristics of the tip sample contact. So if you are really touching the surface, what you really want to know, for example, is things as how is the mechanical coupling between the tip and the sample. And the most for the classical model is the Earth's model that correlates uh, the deformation of uh, hard samples. But you also have to take into account that if you're working in environmental conditions, your surface is not clean. It has things around. And these things are typically a water neck and, and capillary forces. So essentially what happens uh, when you try to measure in contact mode. So when you run your cantilever around the surface, you are telling your feedback loop, hey, stay at constant force. So whenever it finds something on the surface, then the scanner moves up because the, it senses that the deflection increases, it knows that it has to keep the force constant, then it, it essentially moves the scanner, well, in this case, down, so that the force establishes or stays in the constant uh, value that you set, and so on and so forth. So in this case, you can follow the topography, and uh, as long as you are feeling changes, uh, you are telling the system, hey, keep this parameter constant, these changes are taken as error signals. Um, I will go a little bit fast on this, but um, remember that by measuring with this laser, what we are picking up, it's not really the deformation or the Z displacement of the cantilever, but the change of angle. The point is that uh, if you do the equations, you will see that change of angle, it's really proportional to the change of Z for classical cantilevers, okay? So you can change, this is the profile of how a cantilever bends, and uh, this profile, of course, will change with the stiffness of the cantilever and will change. This will also change the angular deflection. This is kind of basics. How does it look like the interaction between the cantilever and the sample when you approach to the surface? Well, when you approach to the surface, your finger stays constant until the point that it jumps into contact. We call it jumping to contact because, for example, it feels capillary forces. Then you touch the surface and then it starts to bend as much as you press. And when you come back, you may feel here some adhesion forces in the deflection. Uh, how can you take advantage of this? Well, in very hard samples with no surface forces, that's, that's avoiding chemistry, chemical interactions and avoiding capillary forces, for example, um, this, should, uh, the, this slope should be proportional to the stiffness of the cantilever, but in kind of soft materials, then you can measure the elasticity of the material. Uh, if you put, for example, some chemical functionalization at the tip end, then by, by looking at the force curves, you can measure the chemical interaction forces between these molecules and your surface. And you can do force spectroscopy for chemical recognition, for example. And there are other advanced modes, for example, uh, just not playing with mechanical forces, but, but as I told you, uh, uh, just trying to pick up current, just using it as an electrode. We can do current sensing, or you can uh, implement some network analyzer and do scanning microwave microscopy and measure directly capacitance at a nanoscale. Neus, okay. sorry, have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I make it very, very long. Okay, so that, that's the easy part. The complex part is when you are playing uh, your AFM as a, as, a, as a vibrator, as a violin. In that case, what you have is something that moves up and down. And this is, you have to treat this as a damped single harmonic oscillator. So that's the equation of motion of your cantilever. And depending on the interaction forces that this uh, violin, that this resonator is sensing, it will change the frequency and it will change the amplitude of oscillation. So all the physics uh, and, and let's say, <laughs> 
tricks of the microscopy are hidden behind this equation is what terms are you putting here and then how these affect the frequency and the amplitude of oscillation so for example um when you are working uh, in amplitude modulation force microscopy and you are getting to the surface what you see is that the amplitude decreases and this is used to track uh, the surface to know where the surface is and just by setting some amplitude set point and saying hey you have to oscillate at this amplitude you are able to track the surface in what is called tapping mode okay um how can we take advantage as i told you before of this so once we know how to track the surface how can we think, for example, on isolating some forces, as I told you, these long range electromechanical electromagnetic forces. So there is a trick that is also commonly used that is this two or double pass mode that is operating the AFM and then just measuring the topography in the first pass and then just playing the line that you have just recorded, but at a fixed distance above the surface where only electromagnetic forces survive. And then you are only sensing electromagnetic forces. How, what do you need to sense these electromagnetic forces? Well, if you want to sense electrostatic forces, then what you need is to put a charge in your tip. So you need some uh, metallic coating on your tip and then plug a voltage. If you want to sense magnetic forces, I have bad news for you. They never work alone. So you, you, all you will send will, will be electromagnetic forces all the time. But in any case, what you need to put is some magnetic coating on your tip so that you are able to establish some magnetic force between the tip and the sample, right? But remember that you, in all cases, you will also still have electrostatic forces, okay? So maybe they have to be removed. So for example, in MFM or EFM electrostatic force microscopy, what is important, so the way that we are taking the images is by measuring the phase shift. And this is sensing to the attractive and repulsive forces and so we can know whether or magnetic and electric uh, electrostatic forces are attractive or repulsive between the tip and the sample. I will skip that. Um, these are some examples of different applications of magnetic, um, sorry, of atomic force microscopy that can be uh, applied for the for solving different physical questions in complex oxides. This is where our field of expertise is. So uh, you can use this, for example, to measure capillary forces or water uh, layers on the surface by measuring domain walls at the nanoscale, uh, conductivity, magnetic resistance, uh, um, stiffness of domain walls in different type of oxides with different properties. Uh, you can also use it to measure directly nanostructures. That's why you have this sensitivity at the nanoscale. And you can uh, just combine many different type of measurements with one single proof. So here, for example, for, for one structure of cobalt uh, indium, we were able to measure magnetic forces, mechanical forces, conductive forces, everything all at once, okay? And I will leave this slide as the background to thank you for your attention and to keep these warnings about you know what are the dangers of AFM <laughs> because there are uh, also things that you have to keep in mind when when looking at AFM images and trying to to get information out of them thank you okay. thank you Nels. thank you very much very interesting oh. talk I don't know if there are some questions I have time for one or two questions any question uh, I, have I, have, I have one little one okay. little question. My name is Manuel Mas. Uh, one of the one of the slides that you showed first. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, well, I don't remember exactly the number, the slide number. But uh, when you were talking about um, uh, the ways we have to measure uh, the deflection of the cantilever, yeah, and you and you put that you is one. I, I don't remember exactly the number. One of the first. Yeah, this. This is this. Yes, this. Here, the ST, the, the on the left. Yeah. And uh, the STM in blue. What you know, you know, you don't use a laser, but you use a scanning, ten, scanning tunneling. I, yeah. I'm, so, so you you have to keep in mind that AFM was invented right after STM. So they realized. So they were looking for things that they could measure um, at the nanoscale with a with a tunneling current. Right. Okay. And then they realized that that probably with a tunneling current they could sense they could not sense everything, but they could sense something that could sense something else. Okay. So essentially, they they put a 
uh, you know, or finger or SPM cantilever, uh, AFM cantilever with, with some uh, metallic coating. And then they were able to track the movement of this finger by measuring the tunneling current between the surface of this finger and the STM tip. So okay. it, it was a you know, full, full but useful way to, to sense the movement of the cantilever before they realized that probably there were other methods that were much more practical to use, such as optical beam deflection. Okay, perfect. Thank you, and thank you for your talk, too. Last question, Fabio Santos. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for for your talk. I will just go straight to the point. My question is more related about the kind of samples we, we can use with this technique, namely if we can use wet samples, for example, hydrogels. If we think about, uh, well, your last sentence in red was surface sensitive technique. So I'm curious, could we use this kind of technique to have information about the stiffness of a wet sample, for example? Yes. So the, the point is, I didn't go into that because that was too, too short probably. But um, you can work uh, with this um, finger into any type of environment. And that means vacuum, but also means liquid. So you can still make your, uh, where was it? Ah, you, you mean my, my, my last slide, okay, sorry. So you can, you can use your violin or your finger inside a liquid media and then um, measure whatever mechanical property of the surface in this liquid media. For hydrogels, I guess that you are thinking on um, very, uh, so which, which is the, the, the environment in which you would like to work? Or For example, PBS or even in water. My idea is by changing the physical properties of the gel, even though chemically they are the same, in terms of stiffness, they should be different. Could this technique give information about this? Yes, sure. By scratching the surface? Yes, yes. Indeed, um, so probably I would say that most of the mechanical nanoscale measurements uh, are done in soft samples, either biological samples, polymers and salt gels, and, and uh, all type of, of soft materials, because it's where uh, it becomes interesting rather than hard materials. So, so most of the research on uh, force microscopy seeking for mechanical properties is done precisely on this type of sample, so yes. Perfect. So I guess I really need to, to have a look more in deep on this one. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, and there was an, another question, short question. And about the powder sample, is possible to do this kind of measurements with a powder? Um, not really. Uh, what you can try to do, for example, is measure, um, well, if you, if you prepare the sample in a pellet shape, then of course you can, and you will probably be able to measure, for example, uh, to, to, even to, to, to make a difference between grains and, grains and grain boundaries, if you are measuring in a pellet, for example. Mm -hmm. So you can perfectly distinguish properties in, in grain boundaries, and, 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 and most of the times is where interest is. Um, but you can go to a single grain measurement. So you can, you can measure nanoparticles. You can measure functional properties of nanoparticles easily down to 10 nanometers. So sometimes it's kind of even more interesting to measure one single grain of powder <laughs> rather than a macro. So if, you, if you're interested in how this grain is structured in a pellet um, uh, affects the pool properties, then you're fine, you need to prepare a pellet sample. You cannot measure in powder state. Doesn't make sense. What you need is to disperse your powder on the surface and then try to access and approach grains one by one. So you can, you can for example, check the dispersity of grain sizes as well. And, and if functional properties change as a function of grain size, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Thank you, Nels. Okay. I think it's, it's all. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Neos. Uh, now, Xavier will introduce our next speaker. So, Xavier, are you here? You are muted? No. You are, are you speaking? I don't see you, Xavier. <laughs> I cannot hear you, Xavier, and you are not muted. So, I don't know if it's a problem in your computer. I cannot hear you. 
Maybe you can try to disconnect the, your, your headphones and we will use the headphones of the computer. May, may, it's worse the sound, but maybe we solve the problem. Hello, can you speak? A moment. Yes, now we can hear you. We can hear you, Xavier. Yeah, just one moment. I try to put my, okay. Okay, now? Yes, now, yes. Okay, sorry, it was too sophisticated system then. <laughs> okay, thank you very much to Neus. And now we'll switch to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jordi Guilera. Jordi Guilera is a, uh, I think he's around, I see him. Can you okay, I see you, Jordi, okay. Uh, he's a researcher in the Catalonia Institute of uh, Energy, uh, research, uh, IREC, and he's a chemical and, and environmental engineering at the University of uh, Barcelona. And so uh, he obtained there a PhD on advanced technologies. And since some time he has been working on uh, synthetic uh, fuels, let's say. And he will now uh, explain to us what uh, they are doing in this uh, field. Uh, specifically, the, the title of his talk is Pilot Plan. Design, Implementation, and Operation for Synthetic Gas Production. So please, Jordi, go ahead. If you can share. So thank you for the introduction. And yes, I'm going to talk about a practical case, a more technological one. And the, the previous two talks were very interesting from Nels and, and Belen. In my case, I'm going to talk about what we have learned during a pilot plan, in this case for synthetic natural gas. And uh, I am not going to talk a lot about resolves. I'm going to talk about the pressure. So all that we have learned in this process. Um, I am working as an RD project engineer at the Colorado Institute. And first of all, I'm going to do a, a brief introduction about why we need synthetic natural gas in the energy system. So as most of you may know, we have two big infrastructures in the energy. So the gas grid and the power grid. And right now they are connected in just one way. So when there is need for electricity, we take up from methane and we combust them and we produce electricity. So what we propose is to do also the other way around. So when there is some excess in the power grid, we can take some power, do electrolysis and produce hydrogen. What we can do with this hydrogen, we can inject partially to the gas grid, but our proposal is also to combine this hydrogen with CO2 in a methanation reactor and then produce methane. The main advantage of producing methane is that it's exactly the same compound that we have in the gas grid. So then we can inject as much as amount as we want. This is called the pore to gas grid and this methane can be called a synthetic natural gas, synthetic gas, whatever. The more important is that uh, it's a carbon neutral field as soon as CO2 is used as a feedstock, water and green electricity. Why we need this? this new route. Here is, uh, I'm, I would like this typical graph of the electricity demand and pour of, of a, a one day. This is during night. This is the two peaks that we have. And here in green, uh, we have plot the renewable source production. And more or less, it has the same profile. And I was thinking, how can it be possible? Because uh, we have been told that wind power is completely random. So it depends on the weather. And solar, it, it has a very clear profile. So it has a, a decrease and a peak during midday. So how is it possible to match the renewable with the power demand? It's because we have hydro. We are very lucky in Spain that we have a lot of mountains and we can do this hydro pumping. So during night, what we are doing during the low demand, this valley, we are taking water from one reservoir to another one. We also are doing this when there is uh, a lot of sun uh, during midday. So we are pumping the sun to, in the form of water. It's what we call the, the water battery. And as soon as the sun goes down, what we are doing is to use this water to produce electricity. So everything seems working, but it is working for one day. The problem is what we are going to do when we want to store for big, big uh, time. So in, this is the, some graph about the, the national plants that we have uh, here in Spain about the, the, the production. So in the wind power is going to increase, but the big, big increase is going to be with the solar photovoltaics. So we will need to store this solar. Uh, 
we can do it with hydro pumping, this in blue, and we are going to double this installation. But of course, we do not have uh, such a space or it's very difficult to find new installations like this. So after 2025, it is planned that all other kind of storage technologies will be implemented. In the, in the other uh, kind of technology, nuclear waste, gas, and will be decreased, of course. And here, uh, it's interesting also that uh, in the case of hydro, it, it will be constant also in the gas. And the biogas, which I will talk uh, after, is here very, very small, that there is nobody thinking that burning biogas to produce electricity is a good option, or at least if they are not planned to, to increase this. So to store uh, a lot of uh, energy, we have hydrogen, uh, as you may know, and right now we have two big plans. The one is the Europe and the Spanish. The Spanish is very simple. It's, uh, we are going to install one tenth of all the Europe uh, hydrogen. So the interesting period is about 2025 and 2030, uh, which uh, Europe is planning to install 40 gigabytes, so four in Spain. And this will go for the industry that they are already using hydrogen. So it's not new for them, but uh, we will replace the gray hydrogen for the green one. But also uh, some energy storage points will be implemented. So we know that hydrogen will be this, this storage technology, but we have the problem that is limited to 5%. So um, because the, the gas is, is about missing. We can increase this to 20% quite easily, but uh, very difficult to go upper than this. So the way that we see synthetic natural gas the way is just a way to transport, distribute, and to use this, this hydrogen. We take in consideration this, this overall map that uh, we, we are a, an agricultural country, that we have problems in the waste management, and we do not have perspectives for the biogas to power. If we combine this with a, with a hydrogen map that we have an ambitious hydrogen road map, and we have problems with the hydrogen injection, we combine both, we come to the biogas mechanism. That it's all technical proposal. So once we agree that the biogas mechanism could be a good option for the future, uh, we, I, right now, I think that four years ago, we designed the, the coaching project, which is, was a, a consortium between seven, seven partners, uh, four companies, five dynamics that were developing an electrolyzer, and Naturgy and Lavacqua that they were developing the upgrading and methanation. I will be talking more about the, this methanation. And IREC was involved in the, in the two world package and Naturgy was leading all the, all the project. So the, what was the process general overview? So we wanted to use this biogas for gas leak injection. As the, it has only 65% of methane, what we should do is before cleaning, compress it, and we can upgrade it uh, using membrane. And then as soon as we have this 90%, we can inject to the gas field. But we also proposing a more innovative uh, concept, which is the methanation. So using this carbon dioxide that was released, or even directly biogas, we can combine it with hydrogen that was produced inside, and we can obtain the same compound, which is 95% of methane. Different names, but the same, the same quality. Then, uh, when we had the, the process, what we did is to form the site. In this case, was uh, was Edar Rizek Sabadell, quite close to Barcelona and the Autonomous University. It's a wastewater treatment plant that treats 200,000 inhabitants. It's a quite, quite normal wastewater treatment plant that has uh, biogas generation, uh, about 100 normal meters per cubic. Then we went there and we tried to evaluate where was the best place to take the the biogas and to do the all the all the treatment here is an example of the piping so we selected to be uh, between the digesters and the dosimeter and and there we build the, the pilot plant for those who are not that familiar with biogas these big tanks are the anaerobic digesters they had two and the balloon that i have showed before is the dosimeter then we selected the site and we started the process design. First of all, uh, we should know what, which is the strategy that we want to follow. And we wanted to follow in this case, a thermocatalytic process uh, using two steps between uh, using water removal before to 
shift the, the equilibrium. And in this way, we can operate at low pressure. So this is the core of the process, two methanation reactors. The first one was cooled by water and the second one by air. At overall, we had a capacity of 37 kilowatts uh, per hour, producing four normal meters cubic per, per hour of synthetic natural. So the core of the technology, uh, we decided to use uh, micro reactor technology. In this case is a nice picture of uh, one reactor that was uh, is manufactured by Neratech, which is a German spin-off. So as and here comes the problem. Uh, if you want to use a compact reactor, we went to the market and we didn't see a commercial catalyst. So we decided, okay, as we are a research center, research center, we can develop this this micro catalyst, and we tried to do this. The process design, uh, then when we have the strategy, we went to the process design. Uh, the, the more important in this case is to select which are the boundaries and, and every every partner should be very, very clear which are the, the scope of its supply. In this case, this container was built by the by Neratech. And here uh, we can see that, for instance, we should supply air, we should supply CO2, raw biogas, and we should take up the, the synthetic natural gas and et cetera. In this process flow diagram, it's very important to select all the all the main units like this methanation, this this cooling, because as you can see, then you split all the process flow diagram to pi AD, which is the piping and cementation diagram. Here there are a lot of more uh, plans, and uh, everything should be included there. You mean uh, Sometimes when you do it in the lab, you are doing while you are uh, preparing the, the setup, but in this case, you should be a bit more uh, specific. So all the single points that you want to measure, you should be clear and you should design. Once you have everything under control, what you do is to split to the, to the element of specification. Uh, here, uh, it's a simple drawing, but this is important because only with the pi AD, you cannot uh, design the whole plan because the, you do not have the 3D dimensions. And in this case, also you you include everything of each each unit. In this case, for instance, nominal power, 0 0.37 kilowatts. So if you assume everything, you know which is the the power that you should supply and which are the dimensions of everything. To finalize, when when you have everything, you start doing so some bowling list about all the measurement points, oxygen supply. So everything should be under control before the before the the manufacturer and the implementation of the process. And then you discuss with all the partners because, uh, yes, I want another another pipe and whatever. When you agree, you go to phase three, which is the fabrication. Here it's how it looks like this, this mechanical model. It's quite, it seems quite simple, but the good point is that we, we could operate in totally remote mode. So uh, it can work for 1,000 hours without a uh, very, uh pushing my maintenance and then we implement it in a container and we transport it one here some pictures about this is a nice picture of the methanation and then how it looks like in real this is the microspectral reactor which here inside we have the the microfold and the first reactor was both reactors were insulated and they were uh cooled by water in the first case and by air in the second case as I mentioned before, we should implement uh, a catalyst. And when we start it, uh, to select the, the metal, the ductive size, which in this case is nickel, which is much more economic than ruthenium or oral alternative. Here in, in black, uh, we can see the, the commercial reference. And all the catalysts that we were that we were preparing at the lab were more active. So it was a good point. But it was because we, we introduced some some promoters. Then what I found interesting this step is doing a 3D uh, design plan. So when you usually want to optimize some parameter, we fix one and we start modifying and it, this is very time costly. So it's better to, to put everything there. And in this case, for instance, we can see that 25% uh, of nickel and 20% of Syria was the, was the optimal case. This is for this support and I'm very specific. At the end, what we need is a balance between porosity, elasticity, and the metal area. Sometimes if the, if the metal is very expensive, you want to disturb very well this metal in the area, but if it's, if it's very economic, what you want really is to have a high metal area. 
Then we tried with a with a long run, and we we shared that it was stable, so that's okay. And it was even more uh, active than the commercial restaurants. But that's not amazing because we use more expensive materials to produce it. But what we were not expecting at all, at least me, is that uh, this material also had more tolerance to impurities. So when you poison with real impurities from the biogas using green, we can see that the material that we we fabricate it kept some activity compared to the nickel base. Uh, at this point, we didn't understand why, but uh, at the end, we, we could understand why the, this material uh, was more active than the reference with using impurities. Then we, with the composition that we select, uh, what we are trying to do at the lab is shaping off the super, is to prepare this, in my opinion, very nice uh, spheres. So in this case, it's are cerium based, are not the ones that I showed before. And then we do a conventional metal impregnation. And for those who are familiar, the green ones are from nickel, and these are from ruthenium, and a conventional uh, calcination under earth. We had the, the reactor, we had the material, and then was the time for the implementation. Here are the, some pictures about the, the transport, the packing. So we have to think in everything in this kind of of projects, but then the more important is the biogas conditioning that so we cannot inject this dirty biogas to the methanation unit. So we need to pick to clean it. We have to think in the sampling. Uh, first of all, what we did is to dry the biogas and then using a blower, we flew it uh, uh, to a carbon, active carbon filter. After in the upgrading process, uh, we use it a compressor. So as I mentioned before, we should compress this biogas. This is the compressor. The compressor always works with a, against the buffer. And after compressing, you need another water condensation step. And here how it looks like the methane model that it's quite empty, but everything was, was there. And coming to the methanation, we need additional steps. So sulfur is not a good friend of nickel. So we need to do more steps to, to condition this gas. So these are, as you can see, the typical collagen filter from the lab. Also, we use a hydrogen silica gel filter. That's because the mass flows are not a good friends of water, so we should drive everything. For the biogas, we use a biogas carbon filter and a second one using a ring oxide filter. And at the end, when we are using CO2, as it was at atmospheric pressure, we, we also install another another compressor, in this case, uh, a simple air-driven compressor. Of course, we need all the auxiliaries. These are the typical auxiliaries that you have easily in the lab, but if you go outside, you have to think in this. So for instance, uh, the gas is from the micro HC, the, the pressure is there, and the water, as uh, in the lab, we have different types of water. So we, we supplied this uh, conventional tap water, but also other kinds of water there. The piping, this is interesting because uh, we have to see which is the compound that is flowing there, but also to the pressure and the temperature. So you can see here is a insulated uh, piping, but depending on the pressure, you should select one size or another of the piping and everything should, these are very thin piping and here you can see a very big one. So, so the flow and the mechanical calculations on these are very, quite important. Here is the classic uh, the picture of the, all the installation. This is the, the wastewater treatment that I showed before. And we were installed here, uh, implementing four containers, one for the cleaning, another for the grading, and another for the methanation. Here, the, the picking point. The methanation model is uh, the one that I had showed before, but here it has also the, the reactor. And we use it uh, a commercial electrolyzer. So uh, this is an alkaline one, not very efficient. I think that 56% of efficiency, which is right now quite low, but uh, at, at the end it was quite cheap and we were not developing this electrolyzer. Then when there was in the site, we started with a startup of the operation. Here nice pictures, uh, some pictures about the, the implementation of everything. If they were that happy because we started producing producing meat in there and some pictures about some colleagues from the that are working uh, at IREC. 
the control room. Uh, so this was very important because uh, this is related with the uh, PI ID. So we measure almost everything. And why we measure everything? Because after this pilot plan, we should be able to design a, a scale up of the process. So, and to decide what uh, should be measured in the, in the large scale and what is not necessary. So we implemented a lot of measurement devices and, and then Right now, we know which are the the very interesting uh, parameters that should be should be measured and what not necessary. Also, the same in the in the gas quality control, we could use only a gas a gas micrometer, but we also implemented a process analytics and a portable device, and also every month we took uh, external analysis. This is important to select which is the more economic and more reliable one. So. Now the, it, here it comes the, the main results of the of the plan, and we could observe that after first reactor we had 80 85 percent of missing in the in the outlet, but after the second reactor we succeed with this 95 96 percent of missing, which is quite above the what the legislation has asked, and the other way around in the case of hydrogen and, and CO2. So. At the end, we are producing almost methane with some with some hydrogen and some and some CO2. This is an experiment of 1,000 hours, but uh, at, in the whole experimental campaign, we could operate uh, using three uh, about 3,000 hours of operation and producing the gas quality that was interesting. So in this case, we were quite happy. We also observed additional measures that we intensified the the process of reference because we use this micro reactor and micro catalyst. We also said that biogas was more interesting than carbon dioxide as a, as a feedstock because at the same pressure we can operate at, guys at higher gas flow rate. And, and at the end of the process, what we did is we decided to take out samples of each part of the reactor to understand what's happening the inside and here we understood that the, if some hydrogen sulfide, let's say PPVs, enters to the to the catalyst, it did not go directly to the nickel. It, it went to cerium oxide. So, yeah, forming this cerium oxide sulfate, which is acts as a sacrificial phase that um, uh, allows us to operate with the remaining nickel. Uh, besides the technical the technical implementation, what we did also is to evaluate the, the carbon footprint of the process. So it is this process greener than the other one. So we take as a reference of natural gas. And what we can say is that if we use electricity from the grid, it's not greener. So it has a higher carbon input. So, but if we take a renewable sources, what we can see is that we can reduce about 60% of CO2 emissions, including everything. This is this. So the anaerobic digestion, the methanation, and also the electrolysis. And if we can advance in a more advanced electrolysis, we can decrease it from 60 to uh, up to 80, 85%. So what we can say is that right now, I'm using a pilot plan, uh, we reduce 60% of emissions, and this, this can be increased with more advanced ones. So why we did everything is to take some conclusions, at least lessons learned, and in this case, was that biogas more, it was more favorable from the techno-economic point of view that we could operate at five bars, that the strategy of doing this two-step process was, was a success, that we can share some elements and uh, all that we have learned with the catalyst that the, the cerium oxide acting as a sacrificial agent was very nice, and uh, the reactors were performing very well and we have some doubts about the, the investment of doing this micro reactor. Both analytics uh, for future projects, what we are going to do is to use a GC for the injection model and using a very simple analyzer for the for the control of the methanation. So the outlook of this of this project is what we are trying is um, announcing all the partners is to do the scale up to one megawatt. And in this case, using a more advanced electrolyzer and not this alkaline, very cheap, but uh, inefficient uh, electrolyzer. And but using again an aerobic digestion, uh, in this case, 200 normal meters per cubic. 
and uh, doing a two-step process. And in this way, we can avoid in this process 1,000 of CO2 tons. This is not industrial, it's pre-industrial. It's, it's a way to, to, to propose a replicate of industrial plan for the distribution of, green, of this green hydrogen. Meanwhile, what we are doing is uh, at the lab, we are continuous doing some super modification and trying to do this, this sphere uh, and adapting to, to each reactor because uh, during the last year we put implement in, in different reactor approach. This in this case is, was based from, from, this is from Technalia, the, from the past country, and they have a very nice additive technology. We have transported to the, the methanation model to our band, which is in Galicia and another part of Spain, and they will try uh, another thing. And as a success, we, we could uh, uh, scale up of manufacturing process of the catalyst and we could implement in this uh, catalyst uh, energy lab uh, it was, that is based in, in Germany in Karlsruhe. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for all the for all the team. I think that some of, of the team are also listening to this talk. And a special thanks to Natos and Setacuan Lavacua for all the partners that, of course, we did not this journey alone. So if you have some questions, it will be very nice. Okay, thank you very much, Jordi, for the presentation and have an overview of how it does it work to implement a real thing in the real life. Okay, so we have uh, now a possibility to have questions. So please, those of you who would like to make a question to Jordi, if I see any hand around. So maybe you can start with a, a very short question. Uh, can, can you mention what is the typical global efficiency of this uh, process as compared, for instance, to the hydro pumping that you mentioned at the beginning? They are similar, better, or? Uh, are worse. <laughs> uh, hydro pumping right now, it has 90% of efficiency. 90? So, 90, yeah. So maybe the, the very all infrastructure that we have uh, in the PDNS here is uh, it's about 60, 70, but right now, we can achieve this 90%. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's not every, everything is not about electricity. So we need also to produce some synthetic fields like, like hydrogen or in this case, methane. So we need to, to produce some kind of thing. About the efficiency, the electrolyzers, uh, the one that we use, it was about 56, but right now you can easily buy one from 75% using uh, polymer uh, membrane, and I think that solid oxides are giving about 80-85% of, of efficiency. If you do another step, as in this case, you are losing something because if the, this is based on an exothermical reaction, so all the heat that you release is heat that is energy that you are not using. So at the end, uh, the target efficiency of this process should be 75%, okay. the target. It's not what you are. So then you, your vision is that uh, the two kind of uh, storage could uh, have different functions and could be a complementary action. So the, either the electricity for the water or the gas for other uses, let's say. Yes. And also we have to keep in mind if you are producing hydrogen, you can use it in a car in a fuel cell, which are much more efficient than burning gasoline or diesel, whatever. So mm -hmm. when you think in an efficiency, we have to keep in mind that cars are very inefficient. Any question from the audience? Can you comment about the, uh, we heard from time to time that uh, some uh, companies want to like uh, to use the green energy to produce ammonia in order to distribute uh, liquid and so on. Do you have any idea of this is a competitive uh, sector or, or mm -hmm. not, not really, or is it still too, too early to say? Uh, ammonia is very interesting, I think, in my opinion, for uh, transport to the to very far away places. So the point is that if we are producing hydrogen, for instance, in, in, 
in the south of Argentina or in the in in the mm-hmm. desert in then it should be transport. So it could be an interesting uh, technology to transport this this ammonia. Mm-hmm. This is a reaction that is taking place every day. So combining nitrogen and ammonia, I and hydrogen to produce ammonia is, is a well-known technology. So it's a candidate. Uh, in my point, maybe this is interesting. The, the synthetic gas, yeah, it's for the transport uh, with the with the piping that we have. It is mm-hmm. transporting hydrogen using using tanks is very inefficient because the weight of hydrogen is very low. So that's a way to to transport this hydrogen, to combine it with CO2 and then to, to feed it to the, to the gas. Okay. Okay, I don't see any questions. So maybe then my last question. So you mentioned that actually... Uh, Javier, we are a bit late in the program, so it's better... So we if- should we stop? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry then, Jordi. I put the question another day then. Okay. okay so, thank you very much. And so we will continue with the next speaker because we, as uh, the organizer says, we are already too late. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you. Okay. So our next speaker is uh, Carlos, Dr. Carlos Frontera, which is a scientist from the Institute of Material Science of Barcelona. I think he wants to be around, okay. He is uh, uh, a specialist on, uh, let's say, uh, the use of large scale installations like neutrons or synchrotron radiation centers. And he would uh, summarize uh, the kind of uh, use of the synchrotron radiation for materials characterization. So please, Carlos, go ahead. Carlos, are you around? We don't listen to you. Carlos, we don't hear you. Now? Okay, now it's okay. And and muted is better, usually. Yes, you are right. <laughs> so thank you, Xavier, for the for the introduction. Um, my name is Carlos Frontera, and I will try to explain you a little briefly the, the uses of synchrotron radiation for materials characterization. And uh, okay, the first thing that I must say is that uh, this, this talk should be extended for a very long time, but I have just try to choose those um, those techniques and those topics that are more familiar to me. So uh, this this uh, speech will be absolutely biased by my experience at, and by, by my point of view on, uh, on, on this kind of, of techniques. Okay, so I have, sorry, I have uh, organized the, the, the talk this way. First, I will try to, um, to explain you how the, how the synchrotron radiation is produced and uh, how synchrotron works and which are the, the special characteristics of the synchrotron radiations that makes it so special. Then uh, I will go to, to two of the most um, used uh, families of techniques that I think that are important to, to sync to materials characterization that are the, the diffraction that is the, that is a, an, um, an, based on elastic scattering and then absorption or emission spectroscopies that are based on, on inelastic interaction between, between light and matter. So um, the first thing that uh, the, the, the synchrotron radiation is produced uh, by electrons that are traveling at uh, very, high dis- very high speed. In fact, um, um, at the speeds very near the, the, the speed of light. And so to to got this elect to got this electron the uh, accelerated electrons uh, first um, the the first electrons are got from an, an electron gun an electron gun is just a metal put it at very high temperature a thousand of kelvins or something like this and uh, this uh, emits some electrons that are accelerated by a linear accelerator this linear accelerator already puts this the energy of these electrons at uh, around 100 mega electron volts. And this afterwards, these electrons are injected in the booster. The booster just, just drives the, the electrons to the, to the energy of the, of the, to the final energy that are usually about uh, three giga electron volts to five giga electron volts at, uh, at largest uh, synchrotrons like ESRF. 
And this acceleration is, doing, is done by um, synchronizing the path of the electrons with an, an electromagnetic wave that accelerates those electrons. And this is why the uh, synchrotron is called a synchrotron, because of this, this acceleration is, doing, is, do, is done in a synchronized manner. Afterwards, the electrons are, are, uh, are injected in the, in the storage ring and, and this is the place where the synchrotron radiation is produced both in bending magnets of, or on the essential devices. Well, in general, um, an, electromagnetic, um, an electromagnetic wave is produced when a charge is accelerated. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what happens with an, an, an uh, charge that is moving enters in a, in a magnetic field. When it enters in a magnetic field, it's accelerated in the sense that the velocity is changed in, in direction, and then, and then it emits some light. Now, an important point is that um, this light, in, when, when this electron is moving at, at uh, relativistic speeds, then the, the light is not emitted isotropically, but is concentrated in a very a small region in the frontal part in the, in, in the direction of the movement. And this, the angle of, the, of, the, of this, this uh, this light, the, the light emitted is given by this, um, by this uh, term here, that is uh, the, the usual relativistic term. And when the, the, the velocity of the, of the electron is very close to the speed of light, I, I have told you that it's about around 3G electron volts and uh, the, the mass in rest of an electron is about half mega electron volts. So you have a, a very large multiplication um, uh, factor that is more or less the inverse of this one. So the, the light is very concentrated in front of the of the, of the electrons, and this makes that this 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 um, radiation is very intense in this region, and it is the intensity is zero at the at the other at the other parts. Okay, this is exactly uh, what happens in an elect in a bending magnet. The bending magnets are the magnets that um, man maintain the electrons inside the the, the storage ring. And when the electrons arrive to a bending magnet, they are the, 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 um, the trajectory is curved in the bending man in the bending magnet, and then they emit light in this in, in this in this process. And this is the, the first place in which the, the synchrotrons were obtaining the, the light in the in the second generation um, in the second generation synchrotrons a uh, long time ago. Nowadays. All the synchrotrons in the world that are third generation. This means that, in addition to independent magnet, they they have uh, um, some devices that are called insertion devices, in which the, the the overall trajectory of the electrons is not altered, but they have through a, a different magnetic fields they undulate the the trajectory of these of these electrons, and this uh, creates also um, synchrotron radiation in this. In these devices, there are two types of these devices. One is called a Wiggler, that it, it has few poles with a very strong magnetic field, and the other one is called an undulator, in which you have a, a very large number of magnets that are that have a, um, a very uh, a weaker field. That usually this the, the separation between these magnets is just, it's just smaller than here, and this this uh, this separation is variable. And you can see the different uh, the difference in, in in intensity created by the different by the different devices. Bending magnet has a relatively low uh, intensity, a superton, so a wiggler has a, a larger intensity and an undulator has a, a still larger intensity. And this is because the, this, the, this large number of, of poles creates some, uh, some uh, creative and, and destructive um, interferences and, and, and that enhance uh, the intensity very much. Okay. Um, so, which are the properties of the synchrotron radiation that make this um, this uh, this light so so interesting or, or so so useful for um, for the for the study of of of, um, of material science? First, as as we as we have seen, it has a very wide spectral distribution. It can go from uh, uh, from visible light or ultraviolet light to to very hard X rays. And so this is very important for, for all, all kind of um, all kind of spectroscopic techniques in which one needs to, to vary the, the energy of the of the photons. It, it has also uh, it, it's also very highly polarized light in, in the sense that uh, the, the electrons are always accelerated in the plane of the 
of the synchrotron and this makes that uh, the light that is uh, emitted is always also um, polarized in the plane of the of the of the synchrotron in addition it has a, a well this this polar, this polarization is useful for some kind of of spectroscopies um, it has a pulse uh, temporal structure this means that uh, the the electrons in the in the storage ring do not run um, continuously but run in in uh, small bunches of electrons and this can is used this can be used by for um, for uh, time for for time um, for dynamical studies using using a pan -pan probe uh, techniques in which one can uh, study very very quick um, processes in in in, uh, in the system in case of needed um, also it has a very high coherence and this is important for applications as surface characterization or microscopy. And finally, it has a large brilliance. Brilliance is defined in this way, it's the number of photons per unit time, per, per, per solid angle, per unit of surface, and per, for in, in the unit of energy. And it can be as, far, as high as 10 to the 20, uh, seconds milli radians square millimeters square per one percent of bandwidth, and this is a, a very large number of photons with a very specific energy in a very specific region, and um, with with a very small um, divergence in in uh, per unit time. And this is this is uh, this is very useful because of this. This means that we are able to implement. Um, to implement uh, techniques that you are not able to implement with uh, sources with a small number of, of photons. Um, this, before entering the uses of synchrotron in material science, let me mention that uh, it has application. It, it, synchrotron radiation is applied in, in many other branches of science. For instance, in medicine, you can find uh, um, applications in radiotherapy, in, in image di diagnosis, uh, in pharmacy, you find uh, um, applications in the determinations of drug structure in bi biology, protein crystallography, microscopy, tomography. There are really spectacular images of, of tomography in biology, are really very, very impressive. In archaeology and cultural heritage, uh, one can find uh, studies of the composition of paintings of, of uh, I don't know, Rembrandt or many uh, painters that, that are really uh, very famous. Pottery fabrication in, in, in ancient, in ancient uh, uh, cultures like uh, the, 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 the Roman ones or, or even, even older. And industry and engineering, one can find the studies on residual stress in fatigue or fabrication techniques that are implemented in, in using synchrotron radiation. One is, I must say that most of these of these studies are done with techniques that are very similar to those uh, that we use for 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 um, for material science. So the, 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 at the end of the day, they are not they are not so different. So let me start with uh, with one of the most uh, used techniques for the structural studies. That is the the diffraction technique. So um, when a when a wave arrives to a, to an electron, this electron, by the action of this wave, can start to to vibrate uh, around its equilibrium position, and and with this it emits uh, uh, another wave. And it becomes an emitter of of a wave that has an uh, an amplitude that is related to the amplitude of the incoming uh, of the incoming radiation with this relation here where r is the thomson scattering radius and p is um, some uh, polarization correction and if uh, instead of instead of or a single electron we have a, a distribution of charges uh, then the the, um, the the ratio between the amplitude is given by this expression here in which we found uh, the Fourier transform of the uh, density of, of charge, in which this uh, this variable Q here is nothing but the change in the wave number of the of the um, of the radiation. Um, if the the charge distribution is not free, but it is it is bonded to a to an atom, then uh, this expression has two small corrections that are the these these two terms here that are just the, the corrections for. Uh, a charge distribution bonded to an atom. 
if we have a, a different a molecule, this, this means a, a few atoms in, in, in our system. So we uh, the, the, the ratio of amplitude is given by the structure factor. That is just the sum of the of the different form factors of every atom uh, modulated with the position and using also the, the same uh, change in the in the in the vector number. And um, if the if the molecule is in a crystal, that means that uh, it the, the, the it has a um, a periodicity in the space in the three dimension of the space. It means that the the, the, the molecule is is inside the crystal. So we, we have a, an infinite like in either if infinite repetition of the of this of this uh, molecule in the space. What we find is that the, the amplitude, the ratio of amplitude is given by the form factor modulated by this sum here over the, all the positions of the lattice. And this sum is, z is different from zero only at some very special values of Q that are given by the what is called the reciprocal lattice. And it is zero everywhere else. Re reciprocal lattice is, is just a lattice in, the, in this reciprocal space that is given by this, uh, these vectors here, these expressions here. And you can see that they are directly related to the, or by, to the um, lattice parameters of the of the original cell that uh, this ABC here. Okay, um, so uh, the most um, uh, straightforward application of diffraction, both in in, in uh, <clears throat> both in synchrotron or, or in lab, are the diffraction of single crystals. And one must say that um, uh, in general, for inorganic crystals, uh, the use of synchrotron radiation is is not extended because of usually the, the in, in, in inorganic crystals, the laboratory techniques are usually enough to correctly characterize those, those crystals. But in uh, cases of, of uh, in, in the case of, of uh, organic crystals that they are usually very difficult to, to grow and they grow sometimes many times in, in, in very uh, small sizes, uh, the use of, of, of synchrotron diffraction is quite uh, is, is very important in order to determine in these cases the the, the structure of the molecule. And it has been used widely used uh, in a very quite systematic way because of it's a, it's a very easy to apply a technique in the when you are once one got the a crystal that it's of a size enough to be handled. It's very easy to, to measure and it's very automatic to, to, to find the structure and it's quite easy to use it systematically to find the structure of, of, of organic molecules. Uh, one problem that one can have is that um, the, the, okay, when, to measure the sample, one has to rotate and to measure in different directions and so on and so on and so forth. It, and, and it can happen that during this time, as organic uh, materials are very usually very uh, sensible to to X ray to X rays, um, the, the the sample can be destroyed or the crystal can be degraded, and so it, it is not you have no time to to study a, uh, a unique crystal. So this is this is uh, nowadays quite uh, well solved using what is called uh, CDL crystallography, in which a, a different uh, set of samples is used. In, in this example here, the the, the authors place a lot of uh, small crystals inside uh, inside two films. And they just measure um, by 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 doing this, this scan here. They measure and, and rotating just uh, a little around this 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 axis, and you can see here that they just measure every single crystal one along 100 millisecond, and they rotate a very small angle. And with with all the information of the different crystal the, the different crystallites, if everyone is illuminated just the the time enough to less. Than the time enough to 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 uh, degrade the crystal, and they are able to find this this complex uh, this complex structure of this of this uh, of this lysosome. Um, another different thing and a little bit more complicated is the situation when uh, and this is this is much usual in fact in in which we have we are not able to find to to get a, a single crystal of of our material and we just uh, are able to get a, a powder diffraction a powder a powder sample this a powder is a it's a it's a um it's a, a, an accumulation or of small grains that are um, oriented in all in all possible orientations and in this case we uh, lose the three-dimensional information that is that is a uh, 
encoded in the in the single crystal diffraction, and we end with just what a single variable in our in our problem that is the, the modulus of the of the of Q. And this is a problem because of a lot of information is lost in this in this uh, due to this fact. And in addition, at the, uh, when at, at larger angles or at larger Q values, you have a lot of uh, diffraction peaks that are very close one for, from another. So it is very important to have um, a very thin diffraction peak. I mean, uh, the, 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 the width of these lines here depend not only on the, on the sample, I mean, the, they have an influence of the sample if the sample is, is very, the, 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 um, the length of the coherence is very small or they have very uh, crystal defects and so on and so on, uh, they become large. But they also have a, an, uh, and a, con a contribution that, that comes from the from the instrument, and it's very important to reduce this contribution to the minimum to have uh, the thinnest possible peaks, and with the thinnest possible peaks, one can get the the, uh, um, the, the, the largest amount of, of of information possible. So, um, one can even using synchrotron radiation, we can one can uh, solve. Uh, very complex structures like this one presented here. Um, I, I could say that it is not easy to do that, but really I must say that it is very good. It is very, it's very difficult to, be, to do that. In fact, uh, perhaps a handful or being generous, 10 persons in the world are, are able to do this kind of, of, of a study. So it's a very complicated technique too. It's very difficult to, to solve an structure like this one from powder diffraction. So uh, really, the, the solving a structure, comp complex structure using powder diffraction is, is really a, 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 is a very challenging task. Well, in any case, um, the, the take home message is that powder diffraction in synchrotron, although it's not very different from powder diffraction in the lab, uh, it, it can take profit of, um, of, uh, of the, 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 the synchrotron radiation properties in the sense that it is very intense and the sense that it is very well collimated and so on. So uh, you have, first you have a, a very high resolution and with this, this very high resolution, you can see for instance here how uh, in, this, in this, uh, this relatively simple nickel oxide, very simple, simple structure, thanks to this very high resolution of, of synchrotron radiation, in this case, even in, in, a, in an insertion device, the bending magnet was not enough. Um, they, they found this splitting of, of, the, of this diffraction peak and this, diffra this, this splitting of this diffraction peak uh, helped to explain the metal to insulator transition in this very simple, in this very simple um, compound. So uh, the message at the end of the day is that this, this uh, synchrotron radiation helps us to, to really find the, 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 the details of the structures of the, of the systems. And with this, we can really explain the, the, macroscopic, the macroscopic behavior. Another, uh, another, um, another um, application of, of, uh, of synchrotron diffraction in, in, in powder is, for instance, the, the, the Thanks to the high intensity that the, the synchrotron can can deliver, we can you we can measure we can make very quick measurements in in, in to our system. In this in this example here, it, they they measure one pattern every one hundred milliseconds that they were able to to monitor the the, the transition between uh, this this reaction that happening at very high temperature. You can see here that it's just. Uh, Seven uh, ten seconds, uh, seven six set seven seconds. Uh, what what uh, the the time they had to to make this experiment? Uh, also, we can use um, very complex um, sample environments in which we had a lot of uh, a lot of um, let's say layers in between the sample and the beam and the outgoing beam and so on and so like this example here in which. Uh, we used um, uh, just two milligrams of sample in a, put it in a, in, a, in a battery cell. And uh, okay, that, that's the, the, the beam has to cross all these layers be, be, before uh, impinging the, the sample and just with just very small amount of sample that you can see that we 
got nice data in this in this case we had no no rush because of the, the, the electro the electric um the, um, the electrochemical reaction is is uh, is slow so in this in this case i think that that every every pattern that took 15 minutes of time but you can see that you, you can got nice data with just a very few small sample in in, in operando and and so on so uh, this is another another important application of powder diffraction in, in synchrotron. Um, in addition, um, in synchrotron, uh, another, another good application, uh, an important application is, is to study uh, nano objects. Uh, I mean, nano, nano objects are much difficult to study uh, in, in, um, in laboratory because of the, the small size they have, they, have a, a, a problems from several problems in diffraction. It depends on, on, on the characteristic. But okay, this, here I present you one very fancy application in which um, these authors here would make is a measurement of the of the three dimensional reciprocal space map uh, of the um, of these nanoparticles, and afterwards um, they they. Uh, Try to reconstruct the the phase of this of this uh, of, of of this uh, the, of the wave that is diffracted, and with this they could uh, draw some strain maps inside the sample or even some density maps. This size here is 100 nanometers. Um, this is very imp impressive uh, work. Um, not so fancy application in this in this case we studied some iron nanoparticles depo deposited on silicon nitride membrane. Uh, the, the 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 width of the, the the amount of samples the, the amount of nanoparticles was really very small it's few there was few uh, few layers of, of nanoparticles um, we used a, a focused beam uh, uh, with a focus of uh, 20 microns or something like this and you can see that well we, we were very careful to avoid uh, the noise from air and so on and we were able to get okay relatively uh, good data in which we were able to, to determine the amount of, of pure iron in these iron oxide nanoparticles and how, depending on the preparation conditions, we could reduce or not reduce the, the amount of iron. This is, this is a, a, very, a, a relatively easier um, uh, application that can be done on, on, on nanoparticles. Or this example here where we studied uh, epsilon iron 203 nanoparticles, a large bump, uh, bump of, of nanoparticles in which we did um, synchrotron diffraction to study the, the, the structural changes across a, a magnetic transition. It can also be used for, for thin films. Uh, it can be used for thin films in uh, applications very similar to what can be done in a laboratory. In, in, in the, you can use it for, for reflectivity, you can use it for, for determine the strain state always with much larger um, uh, resolution that, than in a, in, a, in a laboratory, but uh, more or less the same applications, but also you can go further and you can use, for instance, one can use, for instance, the, 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 um, the coherence of the beam to, to, to uh, be able to, to uh, refine the structure of, of, of uh, this, this, uh, this strontium, um, you can one can exactly find the, the structural factor of the substrate of the layer. Sorry, um, assuming that one knows that the, stru the structural factor of the of the substrate, and this, we apply this over different substrates, and we could find how the the structure was exactly changing by changing the the, the substrate. Also, one it, it, the the large intensity and the large resolution. Can be done to, to uh, make very precise three-dimensional reciprocal space maps that uh, allows uh, to understand how this, for instance, the strain is, is relaxed in this in this uh, in this system here as a function of the thickness of the of the sample. Okay, um, also you can, one can use uh, the diffraction in thin films to to study the reaction kinetics in this in this example here from from the from the uh, the group in, in of, of superconducting group in here at map it's it was one pattern was taken every 100 milliseconds in in, uh, in evacuo thin films while while uh, the evacuo was um, was sintering at high temperature and so they could monitor how the the different um, the different uh, reactants disappear and the, the products of the reaction appear as a function of time. 
Um, also, diffraction in thin films can be used in a in a microscopy base. In this in this nice example, in which the the by feed on on silicon germanium put on silicon um, at the SRF, they 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 uh, draw the the logo of the SRF on this on on this on this sample and how due to the difference in uh, in the diffraction when you have one measures over the the silicon germanium or over just the silicon, they could uh, they could find the uh, Again, the, the the logo with a lateral resolution of about 200 nanometers. Um, going down in in the in the width or in the in the thickness of the of the sample, one can arrive to make um, a diffraction of the surface at, at at the synchrotron. This can only be done at the synchrotron right, for sure. And uh, what happens is that uh, as, as in a surface, that one loses the 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 periodicity in one of the direction that is in the, in, the, in the direction perpendicular to the surface, instead of having uh, just black points, one has rods. These rods coexist with the with the black points from the from the substrate that is holding this surface. But uh, as as if, if the periodicity of the surface and the, and that substrate is not the same, there are rods that appear at different positions. So uh, analyzing these rods and the density of these rods as a function of, of the of the distance and, and at the different positions, one can model the, the how the the, the, the surface is, is is modulated. In this in this example, we had they have they studied C60 over gold, and they find also the the corrugation of, of the golden layer, the gold layer, and, and the, the position of the of the C60 C60 atom, C60 molecules. This um, surface diffraction can also be done in operando. You can find uh, an example here in which, uh, in operando catalysis, that this of this this catalytic uh, uh, compound, platinum rhodium, some rhodium oxide that is present at the surface uh, um, reduces with oxygen pressure. It's something is strange, but it, 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 what this the these people report, and and uh, you can see here how. Um, you can monitor the, the, the operation of, of different diffraction peaks as a, as a, as a, as a, as a function of the, the position in the reciprocal space and how this means that it's uh, an, another phase of, of rhodium oxide is at in, in, in operando condition. You can see. Okay. It's, it's a very nice, it's a, it's a very interesting work. Okay, with this I will move to the to the absorption spectroscopy. Carlos, you, you should you should already complete. Um, one minute, two minute. Okay. Okay, perfect. No, I so I I, I will skip. Um, okay, I just I what I wanted to to comment you on on, so on different absorption spectroscopies. I will go directly to the to what is interesting for for instance. Uh, and Chanes spectroscopy, that is uh, X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy, in which one, one can one can monitor the the, the valence of of, uh, of the, the different cations inside, in which you, you can see here, for for instance, from calcium manganese O3 to lanthanum manganese O3. Um, in this in this case, one has manganese three plus. In this, manganese four plus. And the, the edge moves. Um, uh, the absorption edge moves as as a function of the energy. Also in in, in exafs in which um, one uh, studies the, the the different oscillation of the absorption of, of the absorption spectra as a function of of, of uh, the energy and this uh, allows to study the, the local structure of the of the of the atom uh, that one is studying and with this for instance I, I will center on this example here in which. Uh, uh, two metal, metal organic frameworks are studied. One uh, with cobalt and with nickel. They are they, these two are form are forming a, a solid solution. But one can distinguish uh, what is uh, the difference between cobalt and, and and nickel in 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 the in the neighborhood of this of these two the, of these two uh, ions in. And, and one can see the difference in the, in the in the, envi in the environment, and you can see that the, the, the site is very similar, but not exactly the same, and and so on. And all the, the, the advantage of, of exaf in in front of 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 diffraction is that one does not need a long range order to study uh, the environment of of the of the of the ions and in addition it is it is um, it is selective in in, uh, in uh, chemical species 
So um, as my chairman says that I must finish, I will move directly to the, um, to the conclusions. So for the for, to conclude, I just was trying to show you that you have a singleton radiations has a series of properties that make it to offer plenty of possibilities for mat for materials characterization. You can uh, characterize the structure, the composition, the balance of the species. You can also study magnetism. You can also study the magnetic, the electronic structure of, of your compounds. You can do it in a mic in in a way um, resolved in space. Or even solved in in time, so you can use my uh, you can use in, in in microscopy mode. You can do in situ or in operando in operando studies that are uh, also very powerful for material characterization. And uh, um, so, when if you have um, a, a problem that you cannot solve using laboratory tools, um, I invite you to explore that. What can you do not only with a synchrotron, but also with other large scale facilities, like can be neutron facilities, muon facilities, X-ray free electron laser, and, and other large scale facilities. And uh, that's all from my side. So um, thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. And sorry about the, no, no. the time it's is short. It's okay, it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's my fault, it's my fault. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, maybe time for uh, one question or short question if somebody is raising his hand. I don't see any. Okay, I'm sure that uh, you have found very interesting to use the synchrotron radiation, but uh, uh, there are so many possibilities that if you have any doubts about what you can do, please contact Carlos Frontera. They will be very happy. Yes, it's, 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 to it will, you. I will be. I will be glad to answer you whatever you can ask. Thank you, Carlos. It was really nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, so Shirley is already here because we were uh, supposed to start now at uh, five forty-five, but I told her that if she could wait five minutes. So if you want to have a little break, two minutes to go to the toilet and take a coffee or anything, we will start in two minutes, okay? Thank you. Good morning. Oh, good evening. Hi. Good morning, Shirley. How are you? <laughs> you took your coffee. <laughs> good morning. Good <laughs> <Early> for you. <laughs> no, 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 I woke up. Uh, I start my day at 7.30. So I was uh, just a little bit late because the Zoom uh, requested the passcode. So I was searching for Laura's email for the passcode. <laughs> And how are you? Yeah, I'm oh, fine. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So for us, it's the end of the day already. We have had an amazing talks today, and we are looking forward to your talk as well. So let's see what you show us today. <laughs> we'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. Since it's the last talk, I think everybody, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, so how long is the session today that you so started? It, uh, you can talk for 45 minutes, and so then we can have 10, 15 minutes for questions. Oh, no, no, I mean how long the event today. Oh, okay, so we started at 11.30 and now it's almost 6 p.m. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, no, but they started in a relaxed way, they were having because everything is online and it's a bit cold. So we try to make a, a kind of interaction activities between them. So they had the opportunity to, be, to chat between them in little groups because we want to have it nice because if not, it's like having only talks and talks and talks, <laughs> but, but it's okay, it's okay. And they had a, a long lunch break, so it's, it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I and I know how hard it is. Yeah. yeah. I taught online for last uh, one and a half years almost. Yeah. Mm, yes, yes. So maybe we can start. I, I guess everyone is ready. If not, I mean, we can just start and they can join us anytime. I will be here admitting the people in the room. So Rosa will introduce you today. Thank you, uh, Laura. It is really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Shirley Meng. She's a professor at the University of California, California, San Diego at the Department of Nanoengineering. And she's also director of the Institute for Material Design and Discovery, editor in chief of the MRS Energy and Sustainability Journal. She serves in some managerial uh, uh, duties at the IBA, the International Battery Association, and also at the Battery Division of the Electrochemical Society. And she's also very actively promoting diversity and women in science. And she has had many awards throughout her career, the Charles Tobias Award of the ECS, the IBA Research Award, and she's a fellow of the MRS of, and of the ECS. So, it's really a, a pleasure for us to, to welcome you, Shirley, and the, the screen is yours. Thank you for, for accepting to, to participate. Thank you, Rosa, for the kind of introduction, and uh, thank you for having me here. So I understand that this is the last lecture of your today's long session. So, uh, you know, as promised, I will try to make the talk, uh, uh, you know, uh, a bit more entertaining, uh, I hope. Uh, but with the content, uh, scientific content, robust scientific content. Uh, so before I start uh, the dive into the details of microscopy and spectroscopy method applicable in the batteries, I want to uh, just uh, give a very short overview of our field. Uh, so actually, uh, I started the battery research in 2000, uh, so I'm really a newcomer to the field. Uh, however, when I look at the history of batteries, uh, it is really interesting to see how the history of batteries actually coincide with industrial revolution of humanity. Uh, actually, uh, 1748, um, Benjamin Franklin is the first one who coined the word battery, right? and 1800, Alexandra Volta uh, actually uh, invented the Volta pile. And what's not in this graph is that uh, actually in 1834, um, Michael Faraday is the one who discovered the first room temperature ionic conductor, silver sulfides, uh, that started the field of solid state ionics. And then you will see uh, the French scientist who invented the lead acid. So lead acid battery is over 150 years. And then American scientist Oshinsky is the inventor for the nickel metal hydride. And both Rosa and I have been had the pleasure meeting the gentlemen who uh, invented or discovered intercalation chemistry for lithium ion batteries. And uh, this is Dr. Whittingham and uh, Dr. John Goodenough. And of course, everybody knows they won the Nobel Prize in 2019. Uh, and of course, I think what we can learn from the history is that every time scientists discovered a better battery chemistry, we don't replace the old ones. We only unlock new emerging applications that make humanity's life better. So I think this is very important for all of you who are young and uh, just uh, coming to the research field. Uh, just think about all these applications where electrification is delayed because we don't have the suitable batteries. Uh, Internet of Things, robotics, flying cars, drones, and the, probably the ultimate crown jewel for energy storage is how can we have abundant, low cost and safe energy storage solutions for everyone. When I mean everyone, I mean the half of the um, 8.5 billion people, like half of them live in the developing countries, they need the sustainable energy storage solutions. So um, the lessons here is that don't worry that Nobel Prize already given to these gentlemen. Okay, we still have a lot of work to do to electrificate uh, things around us to improve energy efficiencies and to allow deep penetration of renewables. So my talk today is circling around the 
uh, two major uh, topics. The first one is what have the scientists done in the last 30 years? So as you see on the map, you know, next year we will celebrate the 30 years um, commercialization of lithium ion batteries. Uh, you know, commercialized by Sony Corporation in 1992, lithium ion battery is the youngest among all the uh, battery chemistry so far. And uh, today we heard about uh, lithium metal batteries, we heard about solid state, we heard about sodium batteries. Uh, but really, what did the scientists do in the last 30 years that made a huge difference in uh, enabling electrical vehicle? I think that's the lesson we want to learn from the past, so then we can think about what we can do for the future. Right? So uh, for many of my colleagues in uh, other departments like electrical engineering, uh, they think of battery as like a black box where you have a positive lead and a negative lead. But for battery scientists, we see the picture entirely different, right? So battery is a very, very complex system. Uh, actually, it's not uh, exaggerating to say that uh, the battery system is uh, is so complex that uh, uh, we really need to look at the system as a whole, if we are designing novel individual materials, either anode or cathode or electrolyte. And more importantly, I think this SEI or CEI, this uh, um, cathode electrolyte interface, these components uh, you know, are actually in the last uh, 12 years, as I became an assistant professor, I think my independent career was mostly focusing on how to understand the interface because in a battery, the voltage will sweep from zero volt against the lithium metal to five volt against the lithium metal. So it's a very wide voltage range where on the anode side, it's extremely reductive on the interface and on the positive electro side, it's very oxidative. So when we are moving the lithium ions, these are two intercalation compounds, okay? These are what used in your current cell phones. So you, when, when we are moving the ions, Remember, ions occupy physical spaces, so we are moving matter. So when we move matters, there will be chemical bond breaking and the formation. So uh, whenever moving matters, very likely you experience vo uh, volume changes. So this is the uh, uh, X-ray peaks that uh, collected at the Argon National Lab to show you we can actually while the battery is being cycled, we shine the X-ray on the operando cells, and you can see the peak moves means the lattice parameter change. If one peak become two, that means the materials went through a phase transition. And it's amazing that many of the phase transition we see in the battery materials, they are completely reversible, at least at low rate, low charging rate or discharging rate, they can be reversible. So. The issues for material scientists is that uh, if you have this type of volume change, even if it's only a few percent, it's still very, very challenging if you want the battery to operate something like a thousand cycles or today for grid storage, you want 10,000 cycles. So here we are dealing with what we call a thermodynamically closed system. Um, what it means is if you look at your cell phone, right? There's no matter goes in and come out when you are operating your batteries. That's fundamentally different from fuel cells because in fuel cells, the fuel is the external source. So the device is an open system. When you have an open system, they can tolerate inefficiencies because you will always replenish whatever coming to the device. But in a lithium ion batteries, in a thermodynamically closed system, the tolerance for any inefficiency is very low. When I say inefficiency, you can just imagine you are these lithium metals, right? Lithium ions. So in the beginning, you have a whole reservoir of lithium metal in the cathode. You shuffle the lithium to the anode. During this process, if any lithium got lost on the way, that's the inefficiency. I'm just giving a simple example what inefficiency means, right? So if you think about the efficiency of our today's lithium ion batteries, we reach Coulombic efficiency. So how much lithium you go put in uh, from cathode to anode and how many you extract back from anode to cathode, that's called Coulombic efficiency. 
voltage efficiency is the second parameter, right? But for intercalation chemistry, we don't worry too much about voltage uh, efficiency because intercalation means you have a host structure. So the charge and discharge voltage is not going to change much if you have a very good control of the impedance of the cells. Now, what it means that if you have low efficiency um, devices, so we have, if we have a, a 99% Coulombic efficiency, the battery is, so the battery cannot even operate more than 200 cycles because you will have very quick decay. So that's some of the um, important issues that where in the academic field, uh, at least when I started the research, uh, I didn't realize how important it is because the amount of lithium we have in a real battery is limited. Okay, In a laboratory scale battery is different because we often make something called half cell where we use a very big block of lithium to do some fundamental studies. But for the real batteries, you use graphite as the negative electrode. So there's no lithium in it. All the lithium source is either in the electrolyte or in the cathode. So there's a fixed amount of lithium available in your batteries. So what does that mean when you have a highly efficient system that has 99.9% .9 efficiency? So for people like me who characterize the diagnose the materials and the cell, it's a huge challenge. Think about it. If you have something a very inefficient, your tool can always capture what causing the inefficiency. It's like if somebody who is sick, right? If somebody breaks the bones, you know where is the problem. So you just do an x-ray to see where the bone is broken. But if you have a very problematic, like you don't know where your body is wrong, you just feel uncomfortable or you feel very bad, right? So then the doctor has to run through a lot of different tests to figure out where is wrong, what is the problem, right? So same thing for the battery uh, characterization folks. Uh, we have many advanced tools based on X-ray, neutron, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, however, when we look at the uh, highly efficient battery system, for example, those who are already being, because for intercalation compounds, a lot of these materials already reached 99.9. I now want to improve it from 99.9 .9 to 99.99. So my first job is to diagnose at which part. Is it the atomic level? Is it particle level? Is it second particle level? Or is it electro level? Where the inefficiency happened. So that's the true challenge of people who work in the diagnostics for the battery research. Because it's such a complex system, and for intercalation, the efficiency or in inefficiency loss is so little, then we really need to know where is the issue so we can actually mitigate or form a very effective mitigation strategies. Right? So for this reason, I think uh, um, in the past 10 years, I think most of my time was spending on how we can develop effective tools to look at the negative electrode interface which we call the SEI, or the positive electrode interface, which we call the CEI. And in my opinion, uh, interface contributing most significantly to the inefficiency loss, even though inefficiency loss is so little because the interface is very thin. So for the total cell inefficiency, it's only 0.1%. But to quantify this 0.1% is perhaps the most uh, uh, challenging but most effective strategy. So um, the negative electrode interface and the positive electrode interface has very, very different uh, characteristic, okay? Because the voltage they're subjected to are very different. On the negative electrode side, you are being subjected to a highly reductive environment. On the positive electrode side, you are being subjected to a highly oxidative environment. So when we think about the uh, electrolyte, you know, in the past, I would say in, for intercalation materials, the last 30 years, we always use carbonate-based electrolyte. And the, due to the 30 years of hard work from the entire field, we have a very clear understanding, or we, have, we think we have a clear understanding of how the interface look like. 
So the um, anode interface usually is a very mosaic picture where the uh, inorganic compounds and organic compounds are meshed together. And this interface uh, for carbon is, I would say, is quite accurate. And I will show you for lithium metal, it's not the case at all. Okay, and for the carbon material, so this picture come from a paper from Dr. Pallet, uh, uh in 1995 or even earlier, actually 1990 something, he wrote a uh, recap of what he discovered in, in the beginning. So this picture is a cartoon picture where scientists use their intuition to study the SEI. But this picture happened to be quite accurate for the graphite. So if you want to have an effective SEI layer, you want it to be ionic conductive and electronically insulating. Okay, think about it because your battery has to be put on the charged states for a long time. If you charge your battery, you know, for instance, if you drive your electric cars, you, you want to go overseas for vacation, you're going to park your car in the airport. You know, sometimes you go away for one month. I mean, it's already I know that uh, holiday is coming up uh, for Europe. So um, when you park your car in the airport, when you come back, you want to make sure all the energy content is still there. Right? So this is such an important aspect that you must understand because if you don't have this insulating nature, electronic insulating nature, the lithium in the carbon will be self-discharged because of the uh, electronic conductivity on the interface was too high, so you're going to experience self-discharge. Um, and this is one of, uh, I think, a major challenge when people start to work on lithium metal anode in the future. Okay, so I just give you an example how complex interface is. And in fact, every cartoon picture I showed you here is not the reality because almost all materials, regardless cathode or carbon anode, they are always particles. So when you make electrodes with particles, you need additives, you need, um, you know, the um, kind of a, a casting method, solvent based casting method to make electrodes. So the practical electrodes looks extremely different from what I show in you the in the cartoon picture, which we call the model electrode. Right. So the spatial resolution limit for the interface is so limited. Sometimes it can be very thin. Sometimes it can be very thick and they are heterogeneous because you can see here, you know, if you are uh, a, using a very nano probe to probe this area, you will get carbonate. If you probe another area, you're going to get lithium oxide. So very heterogeneous. And then the worst nightmare for scientists is that this interface will change with the state of charge. All right, so the SOC dependent. So we really have a, a very big challenge to study the interface. So I just want to show you that uh, uh, it's as possible to um, develop many different tools, but I specialize in electron microscopy. So about uh, more than 12 years ago, we started using uh, atomic resolution scanning transmission electron microscope to study the interface of uh, some of the cathode materials which have been exposed to the high voltage. Again, so uh, the method I show here is only one example we apply. What, why TEM is so attractive? Uh, you know, one of the uh, advantage of TEM is one of the few tools that can give you, uh, you know, imaging, spectroscopic, at the same time, one shot. So today's microscope is so advanced. When you do the one exposure of the sample, you can get this kind of image and the spectroscopy at the same time, right? Because they have multiple detectors in one machine. And this one is uh, one of those, um, you know, cathode materials. If you make it, it's really just like the cartoon picture we showed you. It's layered compounds where the transition metal are arranged in the 2D plane. So when you do a 3D projection, you're just seeing these lines and the atoms are like simply arranged in the perfect manner. Okay. And this will, if you do XRD, you will, you should be able to get a very beautiful refinement that shows very little anti-site defects like there's no transition metal in the lithium layer. However, if you expose the cathode to high voltage, then all these phase transformation occurred 
uh, actually only on the surface. You know, you can see only the surface two two nanometers. Things start change significantly. And if you do spectroscopic study, you can see the uh, oxygen pre peak and the um, the the magnet's L edge. They start to change, right? So. TEM is a very local tool, a very local probe, but it can actually pinpoint where is the problem. So today, for almost all cathode materials that are operating at higher voltage, people always have to think about the protection of the surface. Of course, we exaggerated the cycling to 4.8 volt. Okay, nobody cycle their real batteries to 4.8 volt because the carbonated electrolyte can only sustain 4.5 volt. They will decompose. So in characterization, when you design your experiment, please don't think about I have to make the world's best battery. You want the battery to fail fast and fail catastrophically so you can quickly diagnose where is the problem. Right? Of course, there are need to do proper diagnosis with the real industry based battery cycling you know like some batteries will be cycled a thousand cycles and at 4.2 volt they can do very very long term but i think the academic institutions we have a different tasks our job is to actually uh, have a thorough study of what is the extreme conditions that how battery materials will fail. So this kind of experimental design is purely to enable us to visualize if you induce the very fast degradation where the degradation occurs. Okay, so in the last 30 years, because of, you know, the teamwork for the entire field, it's really like industry, uh, national labs and academic researchers, uh, we were able to triple the energy density of 18650 cylindrical cell three times, more than 300%. Uh, you don't realize it because your phone function 10 times the function compared when I was a student. <laughs> I use the Ericsson phone that is black and white screen and do nothing. Today, of course, people uh, didn't realize how much the energy density have improved. And the cost has come down 10 times. Uh, I put the 2005 here is because that's the year I graduated and I was looking for jobs uh, as a battery researcher. Everybody told me, you're dreaming, you're daydreaming. It's impossible to use battery in the electric vehicles, right? I think uh, they just had a short sight. They didn't know that the battery cost can come down more than 10 times within a span of 15 years. Um, cycle life due to our diagnosis method um, that we were able to extend the cycle life to 3000 cycles. Uh, and I think everybody in Europe now see that the gigawatt factory, actually Europe now have more gigawatt factory than United States, North America. Uh, Asia has close to 100 gigawatt factories. Uh, Europe has about 10 and the United States have less than five. Right. And uh, I think Europe and North America now are seriously playing the catch up game. Um, however, I will show you later, perhaps the best approach is not to go for the lithium iron battery industry, but go for the next stage, what's in the future. So the second, uh, the, you know, the first session, um, I'm just talking about what's in the past. I think I'm more in, excited to tell you what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so um, the Load map here I showed you here is a roadmap established by Aga National Lab that was widely accepted in the uh, US uh, research community to show you the usable energy density by weight and the usable energy by volume. So if we want to enable um, flying drone or flying cars, we have to enable lithium metal with some kind of lithium rich layered oxides or lithium rich uh, materials. Um, and if we want to enable lightweight uh, um, um, uh, batteries, then sulfur cathode is a must. And of course, if someone figure out how to use oxide, oxygen as the uh, cathode, I think scientists are allowed to dream. Uh, it's very, very critical to think about how to use air as the cathode. But I just want to emphasize that sulfur and oxygen are both very large volume molecules. So in terms of volumetric energy density, we believe oxides will still play a major, major role here. 
Okay, so um, the breakthroughs of the battery materials uh, is all enabled by material science and engineering. So today, um, in the later part of the microscopy study, I'll be mostly focused on lithium metal and the solid state. Okay, so uh, why lithium metal again? Um, I think uh, in US, the last four and a half years, uh, our consortium called the Battery 500 has been really, really focusing on enabling thin lithium metal. Um, and I want to remind every student, lithium metal is not a new concept at all. In 1970s, the scientist, the first paper published by Stan Whittingham is lithium metal with titanium disulfide. It's this configuration. And you would ask, why you need so thick lithium metal there? It's because the cathode in the 1970s has no lithium in it, right? So you need a very thick lithium metal there because lithium is the energy carrier. So you need the lithium metal to um, be shuffled between. And when we do lithium metal, also the other important concept is that you are no longer in the intercalation. There's no host for intercalation. Unlike graphite, you have those layers. Right, so when the battery operate in the Gen 1 is what we are using now in your cell phone, when we operate it with the both electrodes intercalation, the cell's dimension change, you, ca you cannot see it with your eyes. Naked eyes, you cannot see it. But actually, if you work on lithium metal anode, you have to worry about the volume change. Okay, um, so <clears throat> today when we look at the lithium metals, the perspective are completely different because we have large amount of lithium in the high nickel NMC. So we don't need a very thick lithium like in the 70s. That's the first difference. The second difference is we're going to change the electrolyte completely. Okay, so you will ask uh, uh, Professor Mo, what can microscopy and spectroscopy play a role here in enabling this kind of uh, batteries? Okay. So that's a very good question. First, I will tell you, in order for you to see lithium metal, to observe lithium metal, none of the tools we used in the past can actually enable us to do that. So I'll give you a simple example. If you have a piece of lithium metal, you want to cut it and observe in the microscope. Okay. So early days, people use the gallium ion beam to cut the interface so that they can look at the interface of the lithium metal. You can't do that if you operate your machine at room temperature because the gallium ion alloys with lithium. Everything alloys with lithium except for inert um, elements. Okay, And the copper, we're very lucky copper does not uh, alloy with lithium. So you need to have a phase diagram, a, a periodic table where to show you, highlight where the materials do not react with lithium at room temperature. At room temperature, nitrogen also react with lithium. Okay, sodium is a difference. Sodium does not react with uh, nitrogen at the room temperature. So when we think about how to observe using microscopy to observe something, the very first thing we need to worry about is during the observation or during the sample preparation, did you change the morphology of the matter, right? So if we, cool down the stage to minus 170 degrees Celsius, we can then see a beautiful metallic interfaces of the lithium metal, right? And with almost no gallium implantations in the uh, interface. And this is very important because then this tool become a very effective screening tool when we try to modify the salt and the solvent in the electrolyte. So in the early days, most of the efficiency improvement is obtained from the change, total change of the electrolyte. Because carbonated electrolyte was optimized for graphite. If you use that to deposit the lithium, this is the microstructure you get. It's extremely porous. Um, and some people call this dendritic, dendrit looking. I guess you can say that because, you know, you know, I think. One cannot imagine a metal will look like that, but in electro deposition, it is really true. You can deposit copper, zinc, silver, lithium, sodium, magnesium, any metals you can find. 
you will, if your electrolyte is not properly designed, you will deposit this type of morphology, highly porous metals, right? So when we have different salt and electrolyte, we can now properly quantify how much improvement that it happens. And that's the beauty of microscopy because you then now can visualize the efficiency improvement is visualized in the microscopy in your um, taking the picture. And everybody says a picture is better than thousand words. And it's definitely true in the case of uh, lithium metal um, uh, anode research. So now if we want to look at the interface, we need to have the TEM transmission electron microscope working. Right? So about more than uh, five years ago, my uh, postdoc Xue, Xue Feng, who's now a professor in uh, Institute of Physics in China, he came and uh, just the, the beginning of cryo EM for biological sciences. But when I look at the cryo EM, I thought this is a fantastic tool for the battery field. Why? So cryo doesn't mean just your sample go to low temperature. Okay, so the first uh, misunderstanding I would like to take the opportunity to clarify is cryo is a whole set of modification of the transmission electron microscope. First of all, your electron beam must be low dose. Okay, so in the past, when we do traditional TEM, you need something like 100 electrons per Armstrong square to form an image. Today, with the low dose TEM, two electrons, I can make a beautiful images from two electrons per Armstrong square. So the whole, you know, 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer image is only using a few thousand electrons. I can actually image the uh, samples. And that's a huge difference because all the SEI components are very beam sensitive, right? The second modification is the detector. Right, so the super fast detectors K3, K4, that cost a million dollars to purchase, they can take a picture more than 2000 frames per second. So just like you, what you learn in the early day of today, right, for synchrotron, there's a large amount of data. And uh, for all the students who are aiming to pursue characterization as your career, you need to learn how to manage large data. You're not going to sit through to go through millions of frames manually one by one. I think it's going to be very, very tiring for my, our graduate students to sit there to sort through all the pictures. Right? So the data here in cryo EM is a very, very large set data. We sometimes get uh, more than a few gigabyte data after one set of experiment. So this is a first picture we showed the interactions of lithium metal, electrochemically deposited lithium metal, and its interaction with the electron beam if you do not control the dosage. So they, we go from zero electron per Armstrong square to 120 electron per Armstrong square. And we take frame by frame. So you can see when you do nothing, the whisker, this first nuclear of lithium is already changing. Why is that so? Because the lithium electrochemically deposited lithium, they are covered by SEI. So they're poor, very poor in electronic conduction. And they actually, is so small in its um, size, its nano size. So when the beam comes down, it really interfere with your nuclear, the first nucleus you have uh, grown. So that actually lead us to really think hard about how we can actually preserve the morphology of the lithium metal and uh, using a biological approach to observe lithium metal. So today, look at the atomic resolution image of lithium next to its SEI components, right? It's amazing the, um, the level of um, uh, resolution you can get, right? So I listed two different types of uh, sample transfer because uh, there's a lot of chaos in the field which is very normal, okay? Because the top panel and the bottom panel, the two different groups use different methods to transfer samples. And each have its pro and the cons, so I don't have time to go through the details. Um, however, I want to every student, when you think about the sample prep, it's perhaps more important than the actual data collection because the different sample prep route will result in different uh, observations that can 
um, you know, cause a lot of uh, chaos in the field. But in a nascent field, in a developing field, this is very common. That's part of our research, right? So please don't be discouraged if the results are not consistent with other team. The, the, the important thing is to figure out why it's different, right? So for example, the Stanford group just used the drop the sample into the liquid nitrogen, right? And UCSD team has always used the inert sample transfer. So that's why we sometimes see different phenomena. And actually, if you do the freeze plunge method, it's very highly likely you lose all the lithium fluoride compounds uh, because the lithium fluoride compounds is very easy to uh, get uh, lost because they are nano sized lithium fluoride. So um, I think, you know, just a quick recap, you know, only if at a cryo temperature, you see how stable the image of the lithium metal uh, dendrite look like, and then you can go and do the imaging. So that's, uh, I think, the uh, cryo EM's first success usage uh, in the battery uh, research field. And uh, uh, moving forward, I think, you know, we just show some unpublished data since this is the school, uh, just to show you how difficult it is. Uh, because, you know, in a, a battery, you don't have just one lithium whiskers, you have thousands or millions, right? And uh, they're extremely inhomogeneous, right? So how can you use large through throughput characterization techniques to quickly analyze the data on the flight so that you know where to zoom in, where to study is a very big challenge. And I think, uh, you know, there will be many uh, uh, people who will facing the same challenge when you use X-ray based techniques uh, versus the uh, electron based techniques. Uh, we, we're definitely facing the similar challenges. Right? But like a uh, TEM is really nice because you get the uh, um, imaging and the spectroscopy same time. And also most of the time the TEM is available on site on the campus uh, if you know if your university uh, was able to um, obtain these um, uh, tools yeah so circle back to the importance of challenges i think uh, hope everyone uh, you know don't take me wrong tem cannot answer all the questions right the way how we do research is that we have to combine all these different tools and you need to understand your the tools you choose what atomic, uh, what spatial resolution, what energy resolution they are good at, and then you make your decision, what can you conclude from the data you observed, right? So we are very um, successful with cryo TEM. So what we did discover is that uh, if you use the new electrolyte, you have very little lithium trapped in the SEI layer because these lithium are, um, you know, very reversible but if you have these kind of uh, you know carbonated electrolyte cce means carbon conventional carbonate electrolyte you see trapped lithium all along the whiskers everywhere right so then we um to supplement the quantitative nature i i think i talked to you about uh, you know how can you be quantitative to do the imaging quantification the field is not there yet okay because we don't have enough high throughput data analysis to show the robust statistics of the samples. We will get there because the biology field made it, right? For materials field, we're still not there yet, right? If I analyzing a thousand photos like this, I can get good statistics, but it takes my students forever because they're doing it manually now, right? And that's not acceptable. So to quickly help us to quantify the dead lithium or inactive lithium in the electrodes, we then develop this uh, titration gas chromatography method, which is concept wise very simple. Just the lithium is the only one when it's intact with, in contact with water that gives hydrogen. All the other SEI elements give no gas, they dissolve, or they give lithium, uh, give a methane gas or CO2 gas. So with this very con simple concept, we build the gas chromatography column and we every time before we do experiment like any chromatography method you have to do titration and you have to do calibration right so this method can enable us very nicely correlates all the capacity loss in the uh, from high efficiency lithium metal battery to low efficiency 
lithium metal batteries, uh, we can see the major mechanisms is those metallic lithium trapped inside of the SEI. Um, actually, this data interpretation uh, shows that the SEI components for all the different electrolytes do not differ that much. But I do want to say, actually, if you just zoom in for the high efficiencies, the trend will look different. Okay, because here I'm plotting from, you know, very wide range. Okay, so I I will come back later to talk about uh, high efficiencies. Um, uh, lithium uh, metal batteries but the bottom line is the first thing we said we you know helped the uh, lithium metal battery consortium battery 500 is that SEI is really not the main reason for the low columbic efficiencies and we think you know this kind of microstructure difference is the main problem so you cannot please do not use carbonate electrolyte at all I mean you can still use it, but you are very likely going to run into this type of microstructure. But if we change the electrolyte to ether-based electrolyte, you will see this kind of microstructure, and you get a better chance to get highly reversible lithium metal cells. Right? So uh, just think about, uh, uh, you know, also, um, you know, a simple comparison, if you have this microstructure versus this microstructure, and in the lithium metal system, now that people find that the stack pressure is a very effective way. So we actually uh, championed for this pressure control back in 2019. And today people are really seeing excellent data with the change of electrolyte and the uh, pressure control. Uh, people can go for this kind of, uh, uh, you know, about 350 to 400 kilopascal pressure control. And you can not only deposit, but you can also strip the lithium with very dense morphology. And that's the data we released last year. Actually, just as yesterday, Battery 500 released the second set of data in Nature Energy uh, that the cycle life is now in the 600 uh, cycle range. Uh, so I want to remind the, all the people in the audience, when we started the, the research, this is where we are, our cell always fail after 50 cycles, right? So this is a, um, kind of a, a good story to say to when we move from graphite to the um, lithium metal anode, uh, you know, the diagnostic characterization uh, tools uh, particularly the microscopy really, really helped the consortium to uh, pin down the problems and to kind of have a very effective strategies to improve the uh, property of the lithium metal cells. Yeah, and uh, I just want to say, yeah, so everybody know that this two gentlemen is uh, the Nobel laureate um, and, uh, you know, the one who published paper in 70s and the 1980s. Uh, they are part of our Battery 500 consortium. Uh, we were very pleased that the Nobel Prize was given to them in 2019. All right, so the um, next 10, 15 minutes, I wanted to challenge, uh, I guess, you know, um, the work is not done. Uh, we still have a lot of problems, right, for batteries. You know, people always complain about batteries, like, okay, you know, there's a fire hazard, there's uh, uh, problems with the recycling ability. And uh, I think maybe not much in Europe. I think people in Europe usually are very patient, right? But in North America, everybody would say, can you charge your battery in five minutes? Uh, actually, I drive electric cars. I will tell you, when I park my electric cars for charging and go to supermarket to get my grocery done, I don't want it to finish charging in five minutes. I think 20 minutes and 30 minutes charging time is perfect because then I can, you know, take my time to shop for the dinner. Uh, however, yeah, this is a requirement in the North America that we need to showcase if it's possible to charge the battery in five minutes. Right. So, of course, today I won't have time to go through each of these different challenges. I think personally, I don't work on the fast charging. My colleague, Dr. Ping Liu, and then recycling is my colleague, Dr. Zhen Chen. They work on these two aspects. Uh, I have been spending quite a bit of time to think about the safety 
and also the longevity of the batteries. Uh, because solar panels all last for 20, 30 years, we have to find ways to make batteries last longer. Right? So um, the green and orange is basically my group's uh, focus in the recent years. Um, so yeah, I would say um, moving forward, uh, you know, this is just a, a small sale we make to play some tricks to, you know, I think the last uh, lecture today, you have to show some good movies. <laughs> so you can see that, uh, you know, solid state batteries is intrinsically quite safe. Uh, this is cut in the air, it's not in the glow box, um, actually. Yeah, so um, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, I have to argue that, uh, you know, the cells did perform at 200 degrees Celsius, whether it introduced degradation, uh, we don't know. But the bottom line is that I think for students who are coming to the field uh, new, uh, we want them to work on things that are beyond NMC and beyond graphite so that they could have a playground or platform where we can explore, uh, you know, very interesting uh, new science. So I want to take this opportunity to say that microscopy and spectroscopy will be very, very important because when we move from liquid to solid, we are playing a completely different game here, right? In the liquid, I mentioned about the importance of SEI. So when I move this, it's the first thing you notice for intercalation compounds, the homo lumo level is stable against the two electrodes. Okay, in the solid, when you put a two dissimilar materials together, for example, if you put the lithium metal next to a sulfide electrolyte, you have to first investigate if the interface is stable or not, because many solid materials uh, especially solid ionic materials, they are unstable. Remember, we want the ions to move very fast in these materials so they can make batteries. But if the ions move fast, they may react at the interface. So the first thing people work on solid state must think about is this interdiffusion or reaction, reactivity between the two solids. Right. And then um, the next thing, of course, you cannot avoid SEI. I think uh, nowadays people stop talking about, but when I was your age, the student's age, I kept hearing the comments, there's no interface in solid state batteries. That's completely not true, right? So today we know the solid state electrolyte, there's a four sets of new interfaces can be caused uh, due to the processing, due to the uh, formation of the voids, you know, sometimes you have imperfect in uh, sintering, you can have, uh, so uh, we found the interface issues more complex compared to the liquid case, right? So um, I think, uh, you know, because of the time limitation, uh, I will just tell you one story about how we resolve the solid state battery challenge. But um, again, this is something my former postdoc, uh, Abhik Banerjee, who's now back in India to lead their solid state research, is that there's such huge uh, scale bars that we have to take care of for the characterization. And there's so many tools. Whatever tools you are choosing, please remember being quantitative is the most important aspect for closed system batteries that we really have to aim for being quantitative, right? So um, I think, uh, of course, you know, my favorite will be imaging technique, okay? So I will only, in my group, we are developing TEM-based techniques to look at the nanoscale effect and also X-ray CT-based, computer tomography-based to look at the uh, lithium metal as uh, solid electrolyte interfaces. Of course, if there's a Raman, you know, other chemical species, chemical speciation, uh, spectroscopy method possible, we should deploy them in in situ manner. So um, I think that uh, it's just to show people when we move from liquid to solid how difficult it is because in the liquid electrolyte, you can evaporate the liquid electrolyte to look at the interface. I can't hear. The interfaces are all buried and they are all solid state. Right? So for people who are developing new spectroscopic or the uh, microscopic method, really need to think about how to do cross-section, how to do lateral imaging. Um, so this really 
lots of lots of work uh, ahead of us. Right. So uh, one of the most successful uh, interface engineering we have done so far for solid state batteries is to chemically stabilize the NMC cathode with the sulfide based electrolyte. So lithium nano base is not the only coatings, it's the first trial we did uh, with the recipe released by Toyota. Works very, very well. And then Professor Xue Bing Ong, my colleague, and I embarked on a journey to look for new coatings. Boris will work, phosphorus will work. Um, they have met, there's a lot of other candidates for potential uh, coatings uh, for interfacial engineering for the cathode. Um, this is the Boris uh, work that we did under the LG's uh, fi funding. Um, the I want to maybe quickly mention a fact that uh, for boron, it's very difficult. Only EOS can see boron. If you use EDX and other X-ray based techniques, you cannot see boron at all because it's too light. Okay. Now, um, in the EOS, um, you can see this uh, very beautiful coatings of the lithium borates. And then more so, like the boric acid has so many different local environments. So you need to actually check the EOS to ensure it is the right phase that you are obtaining. Right? So, I mean, these are all the details about how uh, imaging and spectroscopy can actually really give us confirmative information about whatever engineering strategy you have applied uh, so that we are not working in the dark that just doing trial and errors right okay uh last point before i finish uh, wrapping up i just want to say that uh, for solid state batteries pressure must be considered all right so this is really really important work done by my postdoc Jean-Marie Do, who will return to France next month to join SAFT. Uh, before he was doing uh, this work, everybody was saying lithium metal cannot be cycled in the LG dyed electrolyte. That's not true. We cannot cycle that is because mechanically induced short circuit because solid state batteries was always subjected at a very high stack pressure. So what he first thing he and my student did was to do a systematic studies on how pressure on the cell can alter the longevity of the battery cycling. Right? So right now we have recommended to the entire field, if you use a lithium metal as the anode, uh, the pressure has to be less than five megapascal, which is the yield strength of the lithium metal, because you don't want to induce mechanical shortings uh, due to the extrusion of the lithium uh, um, metals. So yeah, at low critical current density, no problem to cycle uh, a few hundred cycles without any uh, degradations. Yeah, notice I said low critical current density. This is like C over 10, C over 20, very, very slow. Okay. All right. So um, the future for the solid state batteries, I think it's still very bright because even for a solid electrolyte lipon, lithium phosphorus oxy nitride that was discovered in 1997, that all patents regarding this solid electrolyte has completely expired and we still don't have a clear understanding of what's going on with this solid electrolyte. We only know Lipon is so stable that if you go for the spin nail materials, no problem cycling 500, 1000, and I think Oak Ridge has shown you can even cycle 10,000 cycles without any problems. Right. So um, I think the future outlook is that while we are moving towards um, multi-layer solid devices, I, what I really see is the commonalities between all these energy devices, regardless, oops, sorry, I don't know what happened. Regardless of its batteries, its fuel cells, its solar cells, they all have this common fact that put these similar materials next to each other. So um, think about this when you are working on characterization or materials diagnosis, uh, because uh, it's very good if you have a set of tools that can be utilized not just for battery research, but for other type of energy conversion and storage devices. They all have the common facts that you know either electron, ion, or photons are being transported at the interface. And the interface is always the weakest link. 
Right. So I think with that, uh, I will skip this slide for the future of cryo and just say, yeah, I have been very uh, blessed with all the brilliant students and the postdocs who come to San Diego to work with me. And for some of you, you're welcome to apply to San Diego. I know Barcelona is beautiful, uh, but you know, Spain is beautiful, but San Diego is not bad. I think Rosa has been here uh, for the IBA meeting. And we actually have uh, very consistent funding from the Department of Energy. And then recently, we also have more or industrial partners who have joined us to uh, perform collaborative work. So with that, I just want to say I really miss Barcelona. Uh, you know, Gaudi is one of my favorite, favorite engineer and artist uh, in my entire in the entire world. So I hope uh, one day I will visit Spain soon again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shirley, for such a nice talk, illustrating the, the complexity of the battery world and also the relevance of, of having suitable experimental uh, procedures. And I can definitely confirm San Diego is great. <laughs> so we, we hope that we will be able to travel again one, one day and that we will be able to go to the US and we will be able to come to Europe. So. Thanks for, for the talk. And I presume there will be questions from the students. There are some working in battery related aspects. So I don't know, don't be shy. Yeah, Juan is one of them. <laughs> so go ahead, Juan. Uh, hi, Julie. Uh, it, was a, it was a great talk, uh, very illustrative. Um, I have a, a question more like, a, maybe it's a bit provocative. Uh, but I, I was just like, when I was studying, they were saying, yeah, there's no way uh, a lithium metal battery would work. Mm -hmm. Then they were saying, yeah, maybe it works, but only with solid electrolytes. And now they're saying like, no, maybe it works, but only if you apply pressure. But now they're saying like, no, but actually lithium is growing intergranular. So it's like, do you, do you personally believe that it might at certain point be feasible or like what's the pathway towards that? Yeah, that, I think that that's very uh, understandable because most of the, uh, you know, if you test the lithium metal batteries yourself in the lab, um, it's very rare you can, you know, go to a thousand cycles and the battery still looks uh, very much intact. Yeah, so I would say uh, it's, we're still not in the commercialization stage. Um, I mean, that's very clear. It's just uh, the hypes introduced by several startup companies that are uh, misleading the the people. So I, I think, uh, you know, in Battery 500 Consortium, this is the reason why we are still continued to be funded by the Department of Energy, because in our assessment, uh, we need to do still quite a lot of uh, fundamental works uh, before we can, you know, be sure that the, it will take off in the commercialization, because we failed very catastrophically before you were born, actually, uh, because in the 80s, you know, um, it was such a catastrophic failure, right? Also, we uh, had a bad reputation because all the fire hazards that created by lithium metal. So this time, if we want to do it again, uh, I think the next five years, I will be spending a lot of time on the reactivity safety of these lithium metal cells. And uh, I'm not that worried about cycle life. I think. Uh, Combining with electrolyte design and the pressure control, 1,000 cycles will be reached sooner or later in the next couple of years. But I'm not sure how we can handle the reactivity issues with the lithium metal and how to come out with smart engineering designs to ensure the safety uh, aspect. So yeah, I think uh, my answer to your question is that I think the safety is something, you know, the scientists should focus on, um, we don't call it safety, we call it the reactivity. Because as a chemist, you know, we, whatever, how reactive something is, I can find ways to suppress the reactivity. Uh, we just have to find a method to do it. Yeah, so un until that is figured out, lithium metal, you will not see it in the large scale applications. Maybe in the drones, they will first start with uh, pairing with sulfur cathode because the cycle life is only 100 cycles, and that's it. Thank you. 
Any other questions from the audience? I had one shortly. In fact, you said something I had never realized, which is strictly true, is that every time a new battery technology is developed, the, the old technologies are still in use. So we're still using primary batteries, we're still using lead acid batteries. So because the, the new technologies are, are drawn by, by new applications. So, and you mentioned some new applications in science. So in your opinion, which will be the, the, the biggest uh, application in terms of market, which is now coming for, for batteries? So yeah, you... I think, uh, Rosa, it's a very good question because in my opinion, or I guess, you know, when we started, the, when I started the sodium battery research, following your first step, it's 10 years ago, okay? I always thought that will be the biggest market, that it will happen. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, the scientists underestimated the, the um, how do I say, the, the sluggish uh, um, movement of the society because uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, if you develop something, it takes decades before it will become a major uh, mm -hmm. product. So I think that the grid storage, we must persistently working on sodium alternative because there is no enough lithium to cover all the home storage. And I always tell my students in my, uh, at least in California, I would say every household must have solar and battery storage, like a refrigerator for electrons. And during the day, we do uh, generation of electrons, storing them, and then use it at night from our own battery storage. And uh, I think this vision is uh, uh, possible. Uh, however, yeah, I think, uh, you know, since we both work in the area for so long, I think the um, commercial, I think the commercial world really wants to see a um, profit model, like they can generate a profit. But our problem is that our utility is totally controlled. So they, yeah, they are, yeah, I, we need another second Elon Musk to come and disrupt that field completely, and uh, that uh, then something will happen. I'm encouraging my students to do that, but yeah, not very successful yet. <laughs> yeah, so um, I hope that answers your question. Really, the grid storage, you know, um, it, it is so difficult. I think the, the utility industry is even more conservative than the um, car industry. Yeah, and, and uh, I think, at least in California, I think you have a, a wider diversity of companies. In most places in Europe, this is not the case, so the situation is even worse in some, in some cases. So, yeah. Okay, any other question from the students? If not, uh, we just uh, warmly thank you again for, for taking your time this morning to give this lecture, which we truly appreciate. And um, thank you very much. And with this, I, I close the session. So yeah, Laura. thank you. Thank you, Shirley. It was a really nice talk. And thank you to all of you that came today, the second day of the Emerging School. We continue tomorrow uh, at 11.30 that you have again the welcome activities that you ho I hope that you enjoyed today. So see you tomorrow at 11.30. Thank you, Shirley. Bye. Bye.